Hey there, my name's Jacob Strickling and welcome to the High School Chemistry course, a Year 7 Science. Now you might be a homeschool student or parent, you might be a distance educated student, or you might be a student in a traditional school classroom, or you might even be a teacher. Um, and you all want to do some chemistry and hands-on, which is absolutely fantastic. And the Tiny Science Lab will allow you to do that well and enjoy it as well. Now, this course is for Year 7 students, but it's also for um, older students who have not yet done any practical in chemistry. So you might be in Year 10, and if you haven't done any chemistry practical yet, then this is a good course to start with. You could consider it to be the introduction, uh, introductory course to this equipment. Now, what do you need for this course? Well, you'll need a document, um, a work booklet that might look something like this, um, and you'll definitely need some chemistry equipment. Now, you've probably got the tiny science lab equipment, but you can actually do this course with traditional science equipment, but it will be a little bit trickier and not nearly as good. <laughs> so, um, what else do you need for this course? Well, in this booklet that uh, we've produced, it's got a, a table of contents, and it actually goes through uh, the version nine of the Australian curriculum, um, I guess, points that this course covers. And, you know, it's not a theoretical course, it's really a practical chemistry course. And so we go through all the skills and basically all the hands-on experiments uh, with the chemistry component from the um, Australian curriculum. Um, so the first thing, of course, you need is some chemistry equipment, um, but you'll also need some things like uh, some butane gas. Now, it doesn't matter what the brand is and you'll need some matches. Uh, but there's a list here of some extra things that you need to complete the course. And they're, they're all quite readily available. We've put all the hard to get stuff in this set. You know, so you'll need some vinegar and bicarb soda and some gum leaves and that sort of stuff, which you can get later. You don't need it all for the first lesson, of course. All right, speaking about the first lesson, and in fact, every other lesson, science, and particularly hands-on science, um, by its inherent nature, um, is hazardous and risky. And so part of this course is teaching you how to look after your own health and safety, but you also need to use your own common, self, uh, common sense, I should say. Um, so I like to try and keep safety front and center the whole time, um, and you should too. All right, so keep that in mind, but I'll help you along the way with how to stay safe. So without further ado, we can head over to lesson one. So this is lesson one of the high school chemistry course for year seven science. And the lesson is called the chemistry set equipment the chemistry set equipment. And so what I'll do is I'll open this uh, case up and I will remove each piece as we um, go through it. So the 10 mil beakers, these are 10 mil beakers and they're made out of glass and um, they're very good for putting liquids in and sort of powders and chemicals. Um, now, they're actually quite robust. Uh, if, if you drop them a, from a little bit of a distance, um, it's unlikely they break. But if you drop them onto the concrete floor or the tile floor, they'll probably they'll probably bounce once and then crack on the second time around. You think you watch it bounce, you go oh phew, and then it bounces again, it smashes. That would be interesting to investigate in itself. Uh, so very good for uh, mixing liquids, heating liquids, um, putting in different solids, different substances, performing chemical reactions in. Absolutely wonderful. When we do a drawing of it, we actually do two-dimensional uh, representations in science. So we actually don't draw three-dimensional pictures. We draw it as if, 
as if you got a saw and you cut through and then you actually just looked at what like the cross section so you can see um, here a picture uh, or a drawing of the of how you should be drawing the beaker so that's the beaker uh, next piece of glassware or equipment is the five milliliter conical flask now this one's actually got a rubber stopper in it already and the conical flask is for well it's like a conical it's like a cone a cone shape like an ice cream cone um, and the conical flask is well it's very good for uh, putting liquids in and particularly uh, for heating liquids when you need to actually like have maybe a rubber stopper in a tube or something like that um, and so we're going to be doing some distillation experiments with the conical flasks later on and speaking of the rubber stopper um, with the glass rod uh, this is it here it should fit quite neatly into the conical flask now whenever you push it in the glass rod you always grasp the rubber you don't actually grasp the glass rod because the glass rod could snap break it's very brittle and cause injury so always push in via the rubber stopper and don't push in too hard um, because otherwise I don't know sometimes you might your finger might slip or something and then you get that now you do have to be careful of that glass tube that you don't put your eye near it because this will poke poke you in the eye and that is not good I can assure you don't get poked in the eye by a glass rod not very nice the glass funnel the glass funnel beautiful little piece of equipment isn't it <laughs> here's the cross-sectional um, drawing of it and um, quite brittle so be quite careful with them often often we'll be making up some filter paper to put in there because these are very good for filtering uh, which is probably why they're called a filter funnel <laughs> so the filter funnels very good for putting filter paper in it's also good for like helping to transfer liquids so you might need to transfer liquids from a well, let me get this conical flask out uh, you might need to transfer liquids from a beaker to a conical flask you'll put in the, the the filter funnel and you can then pour your liquid in there like so so yeah very very handy uh, filter funnels uh, next one oh measuring cylinder so this is a glass measuring cylinder now I love glass uh, plastic often you can't read things very well and glass is much easier to wash I find than plastic plastics just cheap let's face it uh, <laughs> and so these will measure quite accurately up to five milliliters of liquid now you can put in like some powders or grains like rice and that sort of stuff but obviously um, it's, it's got a narrow um, neck on it there and so that limits what you can actually put into the uh, measuring cylinder and later on we'll learn how to use that accurately uh, to avoid something called parallax error glass stirring rod well the glass stirring rod that's sort of like everybody's favorite oh I know lots of people it's their favorite and the glass stirring rod you know what's really good for stirring <laughs> so, um, very good for stirring not good for banging okay do not go bang 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 with the glass stirring rod because if you go bang 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 with the glass stirring rod you'll poke that stirring rod through your beaker so very good for stirring not so good for banging I mean it's not called a glass banging rod it's called the glass stirring rod so fantastic for stirring again a little bit of a warning if it's sitting here like that that could be a bit of a risk to your eyes and so just be a bit careful with how you uh, leave the glass stirring rod uh, often best to maybe you know if it's clean put it back into your um, chemistry set um, because then it's not going to fall off and break so always keep in mind how can I avoid breakages okay what what are some smart things I can do can you do to avoid breakages now the watch glass 
the watch glass. Now, it's this round um, glass with a concave surface. Now, concave is like a cave and convex. Convex is the other way. And a watch glass, a watch glass, see that? It's about the same size as a watch, uh, is smaller than a clock glass. So you can get quite big clock glasses, but this is a watch glass. And again, you better watch out if you drop it on the concrete because it will break. So just be quite careful. And what's it for? Well, it's it's a you can actually use it to heat uh, chemicals on or liquids on in a very safe manner, which I'll show you again later. It's good for evaporating liquids gently. That's what it's very good for. Test tubes. So here we go. We've got some uh, test tubes. Uh, classic. Classic piece of science equipment. Yet again, it's uh, made out of glass. And ooh, I wonder what the volume of this test tube is. That's a good question. You could work that out or uh, maybe later on work out the volume. How much liquid, how much space it you know it takes up. Um, it's What's it good for? Again, heating liquids. Heating, we do a lot of heating liquids in this chemistry course. Um, <laughs> holding liquids, um, doing some type of chemical reactions in. Um, yeah, not bad uh, for a range of different uh, experiments. The plastic plate. Uh, yours might be plastic, it might be a hard resin. It's good for putting chemicals in temporarily. So you can store chemicals on it. Um, and the fact that it's like solid white is good as well because um, if you put liquids on it, it actually helps you see what the, the liquid is or the colours of the liquid. The problem with the watch glass, if you put the watch glass on your wooden table, you just see like a whole lot of wooden table underneath it because glass is transparent, whereas the plastic plate is opaque. And so you can't actually see anything behind it, which helps you to actually see the substance on it. Mm, very good. Um, oh, everybody's favorite. It's Barbie's soup spoon. No, it's not Barbie's soup spoon. It's, it is a tiny spoon though, okay? Tiny spoon. Now, listen carefully. It's not for stirring liquids. Don't get this spoon wet. It's for dry chemicals, okay? It's used to scoop dry chemicals. Don't get that wrong, okay? It's used to scoop dry chemicals. So the peg, okay, Mr. Peg. Let's see if we can get it out with my my fingers, yes. The peg, well, the peg's got a whole lot of different uses. The peg is just big enough to hold a test tube. It's just big enough to hold the conical flask. Only just though. And if it does spring open and break, you can actually you can actually fix it up. So don't worry too much if it sort of breaks apart because you can actually put it back together. Okay, you don't need an engineering degree to fix a wooden peg. Um, you can, what else could you do with it? Well, you can actually use it to hold the thermometer lead later on as well. You can use it to hold tubing. Very good at holding things are not so good in the flame it will burn so not good for not good for flames okay but good for many many other things and the mortar and the pestle now do you know which one is the mortar and the pestle i had a student help me out once they said ah the water always goes in the mortar so <laughs> that's a little little trick to help you the water goes in the mortar and that means the other thing, the little grindy thing, is the pestle. Now, again, these are good for grinding, not great for banging, okay? Um, not disastrous for banging, like they, they, can take, they can take a bit of force, but again, the, the mortar and the pestle are actually quite brittle, and so they will break without warning if you bang it too hard. They'll like just fall. You know, fall, like they'll crack and fall to pieces, and, and that's because you banged it too hard. So, much better for grinding. Grind, 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 grind. Wonderful. 
That's the first page. Let's go to the second page. Oh, we've got the Bunsen burner. Ah, wonderful. And I'll be showing you how to fill that with gas and light it and use it safely very soon. Heat proof mats. There's two heat proof mats. There's a solid heat proof mat like this. And there's a heat proof mat with a hole in it. And the heat proof mat with the hole in it is actually for the Bunsen burner to go up later on. So good for putting hot things on. Hence the name heat proof mat. <laughs> and so you might have a burnt match and you might put the burnt match on the heat proof mat. Now, if you put the burnt match that's still hot on the wooden table, I'll give you a hint what might happen to the wooden table. It might burn. Okay, so use the heat proof mat. And it's okay if after a while this becomes all quite marked and quite dirty. You can actually give it a wash with water. That will take some of the damage off. But, you know, over time, I expect these to look well used and, you know, chemical colours and burns and that sort of stuff. And that means that you've been doing a lot of chemistry and science. So well done to you. Uh, tripod. Tripod. Now, <clears throat> if this had one leg, it'd be called a monopod. If it had two legs, it'd be called a bipod. It's got three legs, and hence we call it a tripod. You know, triangle, um, tricycle's got three wheels. Really? <laughs> Bicycle's got two wheels, tricycle's three wheels, three legs. And it's actually used for under... Now, if, if, a little bit, if you get a little bit of grey on you, don't worry about that. That's just a little bit of the zinc coating coming off. Um, and the zinc is actually to stop it from rusting um, too badly. Now, a little bit of rust is okay, I assure you. This is the wire gauze. This is the wire gauze. And the wire gauze goes later on on the tripod. And, you know, it might be a little bit crooked or something. You can straighten up the wire gauze or there might be a piece of wire coming off. You can, like, pull it off like a, you know, like a thread on a clothes. It won't totally unravel. And you can even trim it with some good sharp scissors. So you can actually cut this really thin um, metal with some sharp scissors. So it's actually used to disperse the heat. Okay, so, uh, the, and the heat comes from the, the Bunsen burner, of course, produces heat, and the wire gauze helps di diffuse the heat. Something else that's made out of metal and the metal is stainless steel in this case, which is iron with some um, additives to make it uh, non-corrosive, like I think chromium and vadium. And it's for holding um, small objects, but with Tiny Science Lab, you can actually use the, tr the tweezers to hold hot things. Very good for holding hot things. So very good for picking up tripods, very good for picking up glassware. Now, when when I teach in schools, I never let kids use the, the metal tongs to pick up glassware because often they'll drop the glassware and it's not very good. But these tweezers are actually very good for picking up hot things, okay? So, fantastic for picking up hot things. And what you'll notice is that there's this little plastic clear uh, rubbery thing and that actually goes on the tweezers to help keep them closed. So when you're not using um, this little round thing, I always keep it in the tweezer section in the case. That way you won't lose it. And if you do lose it, well, you can cut up a little bit of um, tubing or straw or something. You can, you can find a solution to that little rubber tubing if you lose it. The test tube brush, the test tube brush, Okay, this is not an ear cleaner, by the way. Okay, no, 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 no. Uh, the test tube brush, I've discovered it is very good for cleaning test tubes. <laughs> so with, with water, uh, you pop in the um, test tube brush and you give it a good old twist. So very good for cleaning test tubes. Not so good for ears. Hmm, not that I've ever tried. And the thermometer. Thermo means heat, meter means measure, so in a way it 
it doesn't measure heat, but it measures the average kinetic energy of the heat, which is otherwise known as the temperature. And the units are degrees Celsius. And now the we call it the, the probe. Okay, so I'll just undo the the wire so that I can release the the lead. It's got quite a long lead. And this is the probe. So this will measure, this probe will measure the temperature of whatever it's put in. So you can put it in your between your fingers and up straight away up goes the temperature. Now it says the 306. Now that's not 306 degrees, that's actually 30.6 6 degrees. There's actually a tiny little decimal point right there um, that you need to consider. And so 33.9 degrees Celsius, 34.0 degrees Celsius. In Australia and many other countries around the world, we use degrees Celsius. Um, in the United States of America, they still use Fahrenheit. Uh, one day they might change, who knows. Now this can actually go in liquids, so that the probe can actually go in liquids, and it can go in hot liquids, okay, like boiling water. But don't put this probe into the flame of a Bunsen burner, because you'll cook it. All right, <laughs> and then you'll you'll be ordering another uh, tiny science lab uh, thermometer from us. Um, so don't don't heat it in a uh, open flame or the lead either; it will melt. So just be a little bit careful, but it can definitely go in hot liquids and that sort of stuff. The scales, okay, these are the scales here, which are very good. Uh, and they're accurate to 0 0.01 grams. Now. Always use them on a firm surface, and they are for measuring the weight or the mass of different objects and different substances. So you turn them on, and then you put your an object on, and it will tell you the mass of the object. Now, if you actually press the tear button, T-A-R-E, it will go to zero, and then you could actually measure some chemicals, and it will tell you the mass of the chemicals. So I find the tear button, T-A-R-E, is a very good button, and the on-off button is very good, and I find batteries very helpful as well. So <laughs> that's the scales used for weighing things. Okay, the retort stand. So this is the retort stand. Um, it's got a 3D printed plastic base, some stainless steel rod, and part of the uh, retort stand is this uh, component here, which is designed to hold the peg holders. Now, there's a red peg holder um, and a blue peg holder. So I'll show you the red peg holder first. Let's say that you're holding something that's quite thick. So for example, no, actually quite thin. Let me get this right. Quite thin. Then you can actually then slide one side of the peg in like that, okay? Now, if you're holding something quite uh, thick, like with a large diameter, for example, the uh, test tube, then I'll replace the red component with the blue component, which is called the full peg holder. Pop that back in, and let's see whether that will hold in nicely or not. And pop him in. In you go. Ah, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so we've got the full peg holder and the half peg holder. Um, absolutely wonderful. And these uh, retort stands are perfect for holding things like test tubes, um, uh, filter funnels, um, conical flasks, uh, thermometer leads uh, for distillation, for measuring temperature, Lots of different reasons that you would use a uh, retort stand. And if it's a little bit difficult to slide the um, thing in and out, you could actually pop it here on the table and then sort of push down there like that. So uh, that's one way to slide it in and out. If it's too loose, if it was too loose, this thing would just slide backwards and forwards, which would not be very good at all. So. There's our retort stand. Um, now we've got the plastic pipette, the plastic pipette, and it's 
might say two mil or three mil, something like that. And you use it by squeezing the bulb, putting it into some liquid, releasing the bulb, and the liquid is um, the liquid will go up into it. Now, don't squirt people with this because you don't know what chemical has been in the plastic pipette before, and so you could be squirting a chemical on them, and that's not good at all. The uh, wash bottle. This is the wash bottle here. Now the wash bottle is used for water, okay? I don't think you should ever put anything but just pure water into here, like tap water. And you put, you know, you fill it up and make sure, make sure that this tube, can, cause it can come off. Make sure that this tube is firmly on the end there. Otherwise this won't work properly. And then, when you screw it on, screw it on quite firmly, but not like with all your might, all right? And then the way to actually use it, quite surprisingly, is when you, you hold it upright. A lot of people are holding it upside down. No, 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 no. You hold it upright, <laughs> and then you squeeze, and look, the water comes shooting out. See that? That's how you use a wash bottle. Never squirt anyone with it, though. Because um, <clears throat> because you know what will happen if you squirt someone with it? Well, it's not good. But it's, you might damage their equipment or someone might have put an acid in here later on, before or um, it might squirt onto paper and wreck their work or something. So, yeah, you don't, you don't squirt people or things that don't want to be squirted, basically. And last but not least is um, some... A rubber tube and the rubber tube is actually quite good for putting on the end of this glass tube okay so the rubber tube is there for transferring uh, liquids and for transferring gases so yep wonderful now is there any other equipment in this set well I see I see um, a little ice cube tray, which is underneath the, the pocket scales. This will make 16 tiny ice cubes. Um, I see some, what are called wooden tapers. I see a number of wooden tapers here. Uh, very good for an experiment, uh, not in this course, but in future courses where we relight a glowing splint. And, oh, I also see a little plastic container oh no, it's got a magnet in it and it's got some balloons in it oh and I see some aluminium pans aluminium pans and I see some stainless steel pans as well um, these will be using uh, in some other courses to add substances uh, and so they're quite useful as well so that's it for the equipment. Uh, I hope that you've enjoyed exploring it with me. And I certainly look forward to seeing you uh, in a future or future lessons. Bye for now. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at hazards and risks and use a few examples from the Tiny Science Lab chemistry set to explore um, some hazards and some risks and start our thinking of how to reduce um, the number of hazards and the likelihood of a risk. So a hazard is actually a source of potential harm, something that can injure you. So for example, burning matches, for example, hot steam that spurts out of a tube, um, chemicals that could um, harm your skin. They are all um, hazards. Now, a risk is the likelihood or probability that the um, hazard or the injury will occur. So, what's the likelihood of the glass tube damaging your eye? Well, probably quite low. But having said that, if we were to do a risk assessment, although the, um, 
the risk is low, the probability of it happening is low, the actual extent of the injury is actually very high. And so for a risk assessment, I would say if you've got a glass tube like that, I'd make sure you're wearing safety glasses so that you can't poke that in your eye. Uh, what's the likelihood or the, the risk of you catching your hair on fire when lighting a match? Well, very, very low if you've got short hair and you're lighting the match properly, um, the tiny science lab way. That would make the risk quite low. What's the hazard with boiling some water? Well, the hot water could tip out and go on you. Well, what's the likelihood? Well, if you take a few steps, what's the risk of it occurring? Quite low because you can do a few things like um, get some tweezers to ensure that the, the beaker doesn't fall off. So let's have a look at just some very simple examples. And so <laughs> I'll light the match and then I'll light the Bunsen burner. So first I'll light the match and I'll light it straight down. The, the hazard is of course the burning match. The risk is that, well the risk is quite low because I'm lighting it properly. Now, soon we'll be looking at how to light the Bunsen burner properly. I'll just put that burnt match there and I'll just turn that Bunsen burner up just a little bit. And <clears throat> so the hazard is that the, the hot water will burn you. So what can you do? Well, you can actually move yourself a little bit away from that beaker. You could actually move the table, maybe towards the center of the table to create some distance so that if an injury does occur, it's actually reduced. Because by the time the water, um, you know, hits the table and spills onto you, it actually then has to travel quite a distance and in that time, it's actually cooled down quite a bit. Now, when that water actually starts boiling, it will actually start bumping a little bit. There'll be some bumping and it will start moving. And so, if you actually move that beaker and actively watch it and are engaged with it, uh, the likelihood of it actually falling over is very, very low. So you can reduce the risk. What's another example? <laughs> I've looked at this with the poke in the eye. Um, how can I reduce the risk of a poke in the eye? I can wear safety glasses. I could also like only have this piece of equipment out when you need it, or I can even put it quite close to the edge here or well away from my eye. So that is reducing the risk of that particular hazard. Bunsen burners. Now the Bunsen burners are quite hazardous. And so let's see how we can reduce the risk of getting burnt from the Bunsen burner. I'll just pop that tripod there. So I'm always aware that these flames are quite intense and quite um, dangerous. And so to reduce the risk, I never put my any part of my body over the top of that flame. In fact, I never put any part of my body over a Bunsen burner full stop, flame on or not, because I just want to train myself not to risk um, not to risk burning myself. Um, so if you're not using a Bunsen burner, turn it off. That's, that's one way to reduce the risk. Or make sure, make sure there is a tripod and wire gauze there because with the wire gauze, the wire gauze actually um, dissipates the heat. And so now I wouldn't have any great concern putting my hand over it, although that actually feels quite warm. So that's, a, that's actually hot there. These Bunsen burners are quite powerful. So if you're not using it, turn it off. If it is on, um, make sure your wire gauze is there to help dissipate the heat. Now notice, notice that I've been moving the um, metal around with my tweezers. And that is because although that tripod doesn't look hot, it actually is hot and it could cause a burn. So to reduce the risk of getting burnt, 
I always use these tweezers to move the equipment around, hot or not, because that actually trains your brain to get used to um, just moving things around with the tweezers and staying safe. If you do get burnt, or run your burn under cold water. So there are many different ways to minimize and reduce risk. So what about Tiny Science Lab in general? How does the concept of having things smaller actually reduce hazard and risk? Well, by having smaller volumes of water, the intensity or the severity of the burn can be reduced. So you need smaller amounts of water, you need smaller amounts of, uh, oh look, I might turn off this Bunsen burner since I'm not using it to reduce the risk. <laughs> and uh, you use smaller amounts of chemicals. So you might use smaller amounts of acids, smaller amounts of bases. Um, and so that has the potential to reduce uh, that risk. Now, also, and this is a big thing for, say, the science classroom, if you've got quite individualised equipment where only one or two people are sharing it, uh, that actually reduces the risk as opposed to a traditional classroom where you've got four students standing up around a piece of equipment and then directly next to them is another four students. And often, I think almost... In most, in most cases that I can recall, accidents have usually happened where one student does something that causes an injury to another student, like bumping something or jumping back and uh, splishing, splashing chemicals and that sort of thing. So the fact that you've got like an individualized piece of equipment here actually reduces the, the risk quite substanti substantially. <laughs> So anyway, this, is a, this was a lesson to start really considering uh, what are hazards and I being able to identify them, seeing if you can remove the ha hazard or eliminate the hazard. And if you can't eliminate the hazard, what can you do to reduce the risk or the likelihood of that hazard causing injury? Okay, thanks for um, uh, participating in this lesson and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now. Personal protective equipment. The equipment that uh, you can use to protect yourself. Now, there's lots of different pieces of equipment, but I think the most important ones include safety glasses. Now, safety glasses, of course, uh, are a barrier, a transparent barrier that protect your eyes. And they're particularly great for the unexpected. Two weeks ago, I had to use a little bit of a zinc paint. And I gave this can a really good shake to sort of like mix up this, um, this mixture because the, the zinc settles to the bottom because it's more dense than the liquid. And so I had to actually shake it up. It's actually a suspension uh, of zinc, but the suspension slowly settles. Then when I got a screwdriver and opened it, it literally <laughs> exploded and sprayed me with zinc. And I can tell you, it was actually quite painful. I wasn't wearing safety glasses, but thankfully it didn't enter my eyes. If it had entered my eyes, I probably wouldn't be able to make this video today. I wish I'd been wearing safety glasses when I did it. Um, just then I definitely wouldn't have got an eye injury. Um, safety glasses are very good for when something spurts, like a hot liquid spurts or something. Um, it, it stops the, the hot, you know, the hot temperature liquid from damaging your eyes. So as people say, uh, a pair of safety glasses never wrecked a good experiment. Now the hair. Now my hair is quite short, but some sometimes um, people have got long hair, partic particularly girls. And I have actually seen, I have actually seen girls' hair catch on fire from a Bunsen burner. Not from Tiny Science Lab equipment, 
but when I was a teacher in the science classroom, and usually it's no fault of their own. They haven't been doing anything wrong. It's normally a group next to them mucking around with the gas or the Bunsen burner or the gas tap. Uh, there's a bit of a flame. They open up the gas tap and <laughs> this like flamethrower of um, fire uh, forms this fireball, hits the, the girl who's working in the other group and the hair is actually quite flammable and <laughs> sizzles and screaming and oh, bad smells and thankfully uh, she managed to pat it out and so wasn't you know injured too badly but with long hair you should always tie it back always tie your long hair back so that it can't actually catch on fire lab coats now I personally really don't actually like doing experiments that actually require a lab coat but again the unexpected happens now I'm going to do a little bit of an experiment because I've actually got two lab coats here. I've got a sort of like a, this is a fairly heavy gauge one. And I'm actually going to light the Bunsen burner. Now later on we'll light the Bunsen burners together. Uh, but I just want to demonstrate uh, an issue about lab coats. So... Let me take a part of the lab coat near the bottom and I'm actually going to hold it in the flame and we're, we're just going to see what happens when I hold it near the flame. What, what happens to this one? Look at that, not... Ooh, it's, it's melt, it, it is melting a bit. Okay, it's melting a bit, but in actual fact, and it's just sort of burnt a hole in it, but that's actually quite an energetic flame. And so I'm actually quite impressed with how good this particular lab coat uh, would protect you from flame. So I rate this one quite well. What about this one? Let's have a look if I do the same thing with this cheap lab coat. Are you watching? I'll just get that flame going a little bit the same. And if I go like that, whoa, look, see that? It just melted a hole straight through, super, super quick. Let's go again. Whoa, whoa. And in actual fact, look, if I'm not careful, whoa, <laughs> this is a flammable safety coat. And um, I'd probably call it a disaster coat because if you're wearing this and your arm went near the flame this would actually catch on fire and the molten lab coat would actually like the plastic would stick to you so I'd say this is like a, a made out of nylon or polyester and the good lab coat is actually made from cotton so bear that in mind if you're ever going to have a lab coat, make sure you buy ones that are not flammable. <laughs> now, gloves. Some people wet like to wear gloves. Some people don't like to wear gloves. Um, can gloves, gloves protect your skin? Absolutely, they can protect your skin, particularly, particularly from chemical burns. However, I would be wary with them around um, flames, particularly if they're a, like a plastic or a rubber, and if they're a flammable glove, they might not be very good at protecting you uh, near a flame. In actual fact, they might even make the injury worse. So, once uh, I was making liquid ice cream, or liquid nitrogen ice cream, I should say, and Typically, people like to see lots of protective equipment when you're doing liquid nitrogen. But with this person who had gloves on, the, some liquid nitrogen actually got inside the glove between the glove and the skin. And so it actually uh, froze or gave them some frostbite. Now, if you didn't have the gloves on, um, the liquid nitrogen actually sort of like evaporates when it hits your skin and so and you can sort of tell 
by your sensors if you're sort of getting burnt from the liquid nitrogen. So I've also heard a story where someone was pouring liquid nitrogen and they had, they had rubber gum boots on um, and they poured the liquid nitrogen accidentally inside their gum boots and like, I think that, mm, warning, warning, I think their toes broke off because they were frozen. Whoa. So, <laughs> but having talked about rubber gum boots, I can say that uh, an enclosed shoe, probably with leather on the top, is a fantastic thing to wear when you're doing science, um, because you might be dropping some, you might accidentally drop some glassware, and then the enclosed shoe means that you're, you're, you know, you you don't have like toes exposed that could get cut by glass. And leather is a really good firm substance that uh, will stop uh, impact and reduce the damage due to impact. So there are quite a few things that you can wear, personal protective equipment that will protect you in the um, when you're doing science. Oh well, I hope you uh, have learnt a little bit from this lesson about PPE or personal protective equipment. I'll see you soon. Hey everybody, in this lesson we're going to learn how to light a match the TSL way, the Tiny Science Lab way, which is a safe way that will protect yourself and it will protect the people around you. So for this lesson you're going to need a box of matches. Now, redheads are actually uh, my favourite. Uh, in Australia, you can also get a brand called Samba, but I actually don't like using Samba. I don't actually think they're great matches, I'm afraid. I, you know, if anybody from Samba is watching this, maybe you can um, look at uh, your the quality of the matches and maybe make some improvements to make them uh, light more easily or ignite more easily. Redheads are great. You're also going to need a heat proof mat, a heat proof mat, because the heat proof mat, it helps look after the table surface. And I think it might be good to get out your tweezers and don't forget, take the, the rubber tube off your tweezers and put it back in the tweezer spot there. So the best way I believe to light a match and it says safety matches here. Does that make them safe? Mm, not necessarily, but in the old days, well, well before I was a kid, you know, in the cowboys and western days, uh, you could actually get a match and strike it against like a window or against your boot or against your, you know, the stubble of your cheek. And that friction was enough to ignite the chemicals in the match head and so it was very easy to light the matches and so they weren't considered that safe. Nowadays you can't just light a match anywhere you actually have to light the match on this strike plate because the strike plate actually contains one of the chemicals that will help ignite your match and so it's both the friction which produces heat and the chemical that actually I believe produces a bit of a gas um, which is um, slightly um, flammable, um, which causes the match to light. And so you actually need the matchbox and the match, which together they call um, safety matches. Now, I like to hold my strike plate towards the center of my heat proof mat, and I like to hold the match vertical. So I've got this at a little bit of an angle and I like to hold the match vertical and I strike straight down like that. That time it took me a third go. I fairly quickly go and hold it horizontal um, or vertical because if you hold it, ah, <laughs> I'll just blow it out. <laughs> I have seen kids, I have seen kids who light the match. Let's do this again. They light the match vertical and then they keep holding it like that. And then a short time later they're like, ah, it's burning me. Well, that's because the flame <laughs> heads sort of up 
And so if you've got the flame below your fingers, uh, that flame can burn your fingers and so that can be quite painful. And if you do burn yourself in the science, um, when doing science, quickly go and run it under cold water. Okay, run your burn under cold water. That is excellent first aid for burns. Just running it under cold water from the tap and the quicker you can get there, the faster um, it happens. Now we strike it straight down because if you were to strike it away from you like this, sometimes a little bit of like match flies off. And if there's someone sitting next to you, it could fly into their lap. And people don't like burning bitches, bits, <laughs> burning bits of, people don't like burning bits of matches landing in their laps, I can assure you of that. And so that's why we strike straight down towards the heat proof mat. And that is an extremely safe way because any hot bits will go onto the heat proof mat. Now, it is, you know, if the flame's not very strong, it's sort of good to hold the, the match down at an angle like that. But then when it starts burning, then that's when you can hold it horizontal or even a little bit vertical. Now, <clears throat> I'll blow the smoke away. Now, where do you put the burnt matches? You put them onto the heat proof mat because they could still be a little bit warm or hot. And if you put them down onto the table, then you might burn it a little bit, which is not a disaster in itself. And some people like to have their tables, <laughs> you know, sort of like to have, you know, the evidence of doing all their past experiments. And I'm sure that over time, your table is not going to be looking brand new, but the, the better we can look after it, the longer um, it will look good. So keep that in mind. So here's a, here's a little bit of a question. How much of the match can you burn? All right, how much of the match can you burn? So I'm gonna strike mine down. Oh dear, this one's a little bit hard to light. Ah, got it in the end. How much of this match can I burn? Well, that's about 10%, 15%, 20%, 25%, probably at about 30, 35. Now, if you burn yourself, you've got to run it. Oh, i got to hold it up a bit there like that. Oh! So I probably got to about 70%. 70%. Now, if you had a tool, you could probably burn a, a little bit more. Now, which tool? Well, the tool I'm going to use, of course, is the tweezers. So I might hold the match this time in the tweezers because the tweezers, therefore, will protect me from the burn. Now, if you held those tweezers in the heat long enough, the heat would actually conduct, the heat would travel via conduction to your hand and you'll get burnt, particularly if you held it in the Bunsen burner or something like that. Oh, there's still a little bit of unburnt wood. It probably got to about 90, 90% there. There is actually a way to burn 100% of the match without actually using tweezers. Um, I'm not gonna show you though. Maybe, maybe you can work it out. Can you burn 100% of the match without putting it down, without putting any equipment, just with your hands? But hmm, you've got to be careful that you don't burn yourself. So but there is a way, but I'm not going to tell you. But I want to show you a little bit of a trick. Um, it's called the invisible hair trick. The invisible hair trick. And for the invisible hair trick, you do need to light a match. And what's very important to get this trick right is to really burn the top of it super, super, super well, like burn it as thin and crispy as you possibly can get it. So there we go. I've burnt the match as thin and crispy as I possibly can get it. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pluck one of my hairs. So can you see that hair? It's really quite long, you see, okay. And I'm going to get the hair and I'm going to wrap it around the top of the match. Yeah, it's nicely. Can you see the hair wrapped around the top of the match? 
And then what I'm going to do after three, I'm going to go three, two, one, and I'm going to pull that hair really quickly and you can watch the head get pulled off. Are you ready? Three, two, one, go! Hey, did you see that? Probably not because it was so small. Three, two, one, go! <laughs> I'll do it again though. So let's get the match and light it the tiny science lab away and get it burning. Now, to make this work, as I said, you really have to burn the top of that match really well to weaken the wooden structure. Okay, you need to take away, you need to get rid of all the strength of the wood. There we go. So I burnt the very, very top so that there's a very thin bit of weak carbon holding up that match head. Get a fake hair. It's invisible hair trick, there is no hair. Now, what you do is, and it's hard to see, is you use your third finger, okay? You use your third finger and the, the nail. You put the tip of the nail at the bottom of the match so that you can sort of pull. I'm pulling it with some pressure, right? I'm pulling it with some pressure. And then when I pretend to pull the head, I click it. See, so you're clicking. Click, 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 click. Right, I'm clicking the bottom of the of the match. And what happens is that the, the match is at rest and the head of the match is at rest. And Newton's first law says that an object at rest tends to stay at rest. And so the head is at rest, and when you flick the match, it actually moves the bottom of the match and it leaves the head behind. It also applies a little bit of force, which causes the, the, the top of the match head to flip, um, sort of fly off a little bit. But Newton's first law says that a body at rest tends to stay at rest. And so by that clicking motion, in actual fact, this is actually what's called a simple machine too. A very small movement here actually will produce a large movement near the top. So lots of science with this invisible, what do we call it, invisible match trick. How successful were you at doing it? And we've talked about safety matches as well, and that is that they need to have one of the chemicals in the strike plate and one of the chemicals in the match for it to ignite. Okay, well, I hope you've enjoyed uh, this lesson and that you can now light the matches safely, the tiny science lab way. I'll see you soon, bye for now. Hey everybody, in today's lesson, we're going to be looking at filling and lighting the Bunsen burner. So you'll need your uh, chemistry set and you'll need some matches and you'll need a bottle of butane. Now, the butane is, sometimes they might call it lighter, um, lighter gas. It's to refill um, lighters or portable um, uh, soldering irons. And you can get um, gas from Bunnings. Uh, I think you can even get it from like Coles and Woolworths. And you can definitely get it online from eBay. And, you know, there's quite a few different brands. And so far I've found every single brand to work with our Bunsen burners. So uh, I don't think the brand is that important. So butane is um, a molecule. Now, it's actually the technical name is it's a type of alkane. Now there's methane, um, ethane, propane and butane. And there's a lot more pentane, hexane, octane, or septane, octane, nonane, decane. But methane has got one carbon atom surrounded by four hydrogens. Ethane has got two carbon atoms surrounded by how many? One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, is that right? <laughs> uh, uh, one, two, three. I'm looking in my head here. Four, five, six. That sounds about right. Uh, propane has got three carbon atoms surrounded by hydrogen, and butane has got four carbon atoms surrounded by hydrogen atoms. 
And so we can now get out our Bunsen burners and what you'll see, you'll see a uh, plastic ring here, a 3D plastic ring, and you can see a clear uh, yellow, it's transparent, this is the butane chamber. So a homeschool kid actually um, showed me the best way to fill these. I used to actually hold these in my hand and fill them up like this, but this student said, oh, I put my, my um, uh, Bunsen burner upside down into the table. And then you bring the gas can vertically in upside down, now as vertical as possible. Now just have a look around. Are there any flames in the vicinity? Is someone else lighting a match? If they are, then don't do the gas, okay? Does someone else nearby have a Bunsen burner going? If they do, then you can't fill up your gas here. What you could do is you could actually pick up your table with the and go to another part of the room where there's nobody using any flames. So these tables are quite portable, and so you can actually go, take them somewhere else where there's no naked flames because some gas does emit. Not all, not a hundred percent of the gas goes into here. Some of the gas does spray around a little bit, and so you've got to be very, very careful that that gas can't ignite from what we call naked flames. And that's, naked flames are flames that are not protected by a particular uh, screen or something like that. Now, when you fill it up, you don't actually have to fill it up all the way to the top. In fact, if you do, you'll have gas erupting everywhere. I usually like to bring it to about 80%. Bring it down very, very carefully down the very, very center. And then a firm push, whoop, firm push like that. And whoa, voila. Now, did you notice that there was a little bit of gas around? Well, that quickly dissipates. And mine is now about 80% full. Absolutely perfect. And it's a little bit bubbling and that sort of stuff. Now, if I now pull it out, um, can't hear any gas. What you'll, the way to turn it on is actually if you hold the top and then, so hold this big piece of plastic and then rotate, you can actually hear the gas coming out. Now, if you open up all the way, lots of gas comes out. If I close it, no gas comes out. Now, this is not like a light switch. A light switch, when you turn a light switch off, the light goes off instantaneously. Gas takes a little bit of time. So don't, don't be scared if or don't be worried that if you've turned it off and there's still a little bit of gas coming out because it can take a little bit of time. Now, the best way to light this is not to have it going full ball. It's probably best just to have it going like a little bit, okay? About half, about half the pressure. So, before we light it though, we want to put it into the table. And so, line up the this little knob here, which we'll call the key, with the hole in the table or the keyhole. So that's actually to prevent the whole Bunsen burner turning in the table. So that's what that little key is for. And I always, 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 always use a heat proof mat like that over the one with the hole over the Bunsen burner. And then that is actually ready to light. And I put the other heat proof mat in the middle so that I can light my match down onto that. Now, time to wear my safety glasses. Very, very good. And look, my personal preference is actually to get the gas going first, which is a little bit um, opposite to what's normally done with a traditional Bunsen burner. Normally with a traditional Bunsen burner, you'll light your match and then turn on the gas. Um, but I actually find it a little bit easier to turn it on. And notice that I'm putting my hand, I'm putting my hand under the table here. Hello, everybody. Under the table, and I'm rotating it till I hear some gas coming out. And then without mucking around too much, I light my match straight down, whoop, straight down, get my match burning okay and then bring the match to the side. Aha! Easy. Blow out my match, put it on the um, 
heat proof mat and then I'm actually going to adjust the size of the flame so that's a low flame that's a high flame now if I'm adjusting it and it goes low 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 oh no it went out not a disaster okay not a disaster get the gas going again okay I hear it just coming out I get my match and I strike down and I bring it to the side hey very very easy now if I turn off the Bunsen burner and if I bring it from the top look what happens oh it's still lit so oh well sometimes <laughs> sometimes I've found the gas um, blows out the flame of the match and that's a little bit frustrating now you can blow out your match like this but don't blow out your Bunsen burner okay why do you think you should not blow out the Bunsen burner with your with your with the the air out of your mouth why do you think that is why if I don't want the flame on why should I not just like blow it out it's easy to blow out and the answer is because if you blow it out the gas is still coming out and you can't see it you might be able to hear it but in a noisy room you might not even be able to hear it and it's not great to have gas coming out for a long period of time because the gas is toxic it's, it is poisonous um, but also it's flammable and so you could get a bit of a gas build up someone lights a match and you know there could be a bit of a fireball or something like that so never um, blow out your um, Bunsen burner always put it out by uh, turning off the gas that's a good um, safety hint to reduce the risk okay the likelihood of an accident occurring and also like just to have it a nice stable flame not too high and to reduce any um, injury occurring put the tripod on and put the wide gauze straight on like that and that's actually quite intense so I can turn that down a little bit now I will give you a few little hints when you take that off that's actually still quite hot the wire gauze don't put it back straight away into your chemistry set because it might melt it and the same thing with the um, tripod don't put the tripod back into your chemistry set because it will melt the foam infill you'll need to let it cool down for a few minutes okay so let the tripod cool down for a few minutes and it is important to use the tripod and the wire gauze because that helps dissipate the heat and reduces the, the likelihood of an injury occurring. So that is how we um, fill and light the Bunsen burner. Okay, thanks for joining me today uh, in this lesson and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now. Hey everyone, in today's lesson we're actually going to do an experiment. We're actually going to investigate which is the hottest part of a Bunsen burner flame. So apart from your chemistry set, you'll need your goggles, um, matches and something to record time, like a stopwatch. Um, I'm using my phone and you also need um, a calculator. So without further ado, uh, let's set up the Bunsen burner. So I'll just put my heat proof mat there. I'll get my Bunsen burner out. I've got plenty of gas. Um, pop him in carefully and I'll put that, whoop, that heat proof mat on there like that. And let's have a look at the flame. So I'll whack on my safety goggles, get the gas going, like so, and light it from, whoop, <laughs> light the match the tiny science lab way, like so, very good, and then light my Bunsen burner flame, blow out my match, and I might just increase the size of that Bunsen burner so that we can actually see the zones a little bit better 
And how about I point them out? So at the very, very top, you can see, oh, there is a little bit of fluctuation there, isn't it? it might settle down, we'll find out. Um, but at the very, very top, you can, you can see that there's a, it's not that bright, but you can see that there is flame. There is a, the top of the flame is right there. there we'll call that zone one. Now, zone two is the top of the bright blue inner um, flame. You can quite clearly see that one there. And zone three we'll um, call down here just at the top of the Bunsen burner. So zone one, two, three. So we could call it the zone one is the outer cone. Zone two is the top of the inner cone. And zone three is the bottom of the cones of fire. So, oh, <laughs> I just blew it out by saying fire. Uh, better light the match and relight the Bunsen burner. Oop, there we go. Which part do you think is going to be the hottest part? Zone one, zone two, zone three. What's your hypothesis? What's your best scientific guess that you can test? That's what a hypothesis is. It's um, basically a testable guess. But the guess is based on some of your experience or maybe some of, you know, using a little bit of logic. It's not just, it's not just a random guess. Okay, so I've got my tweezers and I'll need my stopwatch. And um, what we'll do is I'll get my stopwatch ready and we're going to start in zone one. And hey, there we go. And I will get the stopwatch ready, like this, and reset. Okay, so I'm ready to go. And I've got the flame fairly consistent now, how I like it. And I'm going to put the um, wire gauze at the top of zone one. And just as I do that, I'm gonna press start. When it glows orange, I'm gonna press stop. Ready, set, go. And stop. So 2.9 seconds, 2.9 seconds. And so let me get my texter and my little clipboard and I'll write, okay, zone one, time one was 2.9. Then I'll reset that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to wave this around. Why do you think I'm waving this around, the Y gauze around? I'm cooling it down. I need to return it to the original temperature. That is, I need to make sure that I control my variables. And I do not want to change the original temperature of this Y gauze because that would make the experiment <coughs> Invalid, and I want to have a valid experiment by making sure I control the correct variable. There's only one variable we're going to change in this experiment. It's called the independent variable, and it's the zone. Zone one, zone two, zone three. That's the things we're going to change. Okay, I'm sure this is cooled down enough. The flame is the same as it was before, or close enough. And are we ready, set, go. And stop. 2.6 seconds, okay? 2.6 seconds. So, time two. And I don't need to do the average yet. So time two is 2.6 seconds for me. I wonder what time you're getting. I wonder what time you're getting. Are you getting something similar? Something different? Hmm, depends of course on the strength of your Bunsen burner, doesn't it? You know, how high you've got the flame. That can make a big difference. Okay, this time I'm going to go to zone two. So wave it around, that will cool it down. And are we ready? So the top of the inner cone, ready, set, go. And stop. Whoa, 2.4 seconds. Whoa, that was a little bit faster. That was a little bit faster, wasn't it? 2.4 seconds. So that, that's an early indicator to say maybe the top of the blue flame is hotter than the actual top of that, uh, the, the big cone. So, interesting. 
and give it a wave, blow it. <laughs> I don't want to touch it, but I'm pretty sure it's cooled down to the same temperature. I wouldn't be dipping it in water and then drying it, okay? Ready, set, go. And stop. Oh, 2.4 seconds. 2.4. Oh, huh, I got the same value. Ah, oh, there you go. That's quite reliable. I mean, I'd have to do quite a number of more. Like, actually only doing two trials, probably a little bit light on, to be perfectly blunt. Um, anyway, let's go to zone three. Let's wave this around. And reset. And are we ready? Set. Start. Da 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 da, stop! Oh, 2.9. But having said that, I think I started it quite late. So I'm actually going to just redo that one. Okay, actually, I don't think I pressed the... This would actually be a good experiment for two people. Okay, one person can actually do the stopwatch while the other person does this. And then you can actually swap around and that sort of stuff. But some experiments are best done with teamwork. And this is a great experiment for teamwork. So... Ready, set, starting, and stop. Whoa, 3.9 seconds. Well, that took a lot longer, 3.9 seconds. Okay, now I'm not surprised because I actually have done this before and I know that the bottom of the Bunsen burner is not the best place or well, the bottom of the flame is not the best place to um, <laughs> heat things up. And are we ready, set, go. And stop. Oh, four seconds. Now it is a little bit difficult to tell exactly when to press stop. It's sort of, you've got to make a decision about the size of the orange glow and that sort of stuff. Um, I'm now just going to turn off the Bunsen burner. Remember I turn it off by um, rotating the base, not by blowing it out. Now, how do you get an average? Well, you add up the, the numbers and you divide by how many numbers there are. So I would add 2.9 plus 2.6. So I go in my calculator and let's go to the calculator. 2.9 plus 2.6 equals 5.5, divide that by two. Gives me 2.75, 2.75, uh, which is actually in the middle of those two numbers. So my average there is 2.75. 2.4 plus 2.4 is 4.8, divided by 2 is 2.4. No surprises there that the average of two identical numbers is the same as those numbers. And 3.9 and 4, what's the number in between those numbers? Because there's only two, it's 3.95. So, fantastic. Now I can see pretty clearly from the data that the shortest time is 2.4, but sometimes it's great to visualize the data through some type of graph. Now, the best graph to use in this particular case is actually a column graph because there's actually no numerical link between the zones. I'll explain that sort of in other experiments we do. But for now, just take my word for it. So with a graph, uh, we need to have a title. So we can go Bunsen, Burner, Heat. That will do, Bunsen, Burner, Heat. And I'm going to label what we call the x-axis. And so I'm going to call it Zone 1, 2, 3. And then I'm going to put the time in seconds here. I'm going to the bottom line zero and what might you do we might go up by um, twos actually two four six so zone one was 2.75 which is about three there's the three mark so I reckon zone one takes that long Zone two is 2.4, which is three to about there. And I might go the other way with my hashing. 
in the zone 3 is 3.95 which is all the way up here and so there we go that helps us visualize the results clearly zone 2 has got the shortest time and so zone 2 or the top of the um, inner cone is the best place to heat things so actually no surprises there for me I wonder if you can think of why um, why might it be that the hottest part is let's just have one more look at it and one more think about it why might the top of the whoop, oh I need a bit more gas why might the top of that cone there be the best place or the hottest part interesting it's a little bit it's like it's a bit more focused or something like that mm -hmm. now something that school kids love to do with bunsen burners is to actually block the oxygen holes so i'm actually going to block the oxygen hole and let's see what happens whoa look at that careful not to burn yourself so come in low and from the side and look at that okay oh <laughs> That's a classic flare from a Bunsen burner. Oh, you gotta love the classic flare from the Bunsen burner. Yay! So that actually reduces the oxygen going in there. Butane requires oxygen to burn, and a certain amount of butane requires a certain amount of oxygen. And if you can block that oxygen off, then the butane doesn't sort of fully combust, fully react, and so you get something called incomplete combustion and that flame is actually not very hot there's not a lot of heat in that flame um, you could do an experiment to find out to give you a bit of a rough idea you could time how long it takes for the wire gauze to glow orange now look at this it's actually oh yeah it's just glowing orange that probably took about six seconds or something like that Oh, that would be a, a nice extra little experiment to do. So anyway, thanks for joining me this lesson in um, investigating the hottest part of the Bunsen burner flames. Okay, I'll see you, uh, see you later and bye for now. Hey everybody, in this lesson we're going to be looking at solutions and evaporation. So for this lesson you're going to need your chemistry set, you'll need some matches, glasses, food coloring. Now uh, this Queen's food coloring is pretty good I think um, and you're going to need some sodium chloride or table salt. So just a few little things that you'll need for this lesson and I might just put these to the side and the first thing that we're going to do is actually make a dilute solution. Okay, a dilute solution. I might just pop on the goggles and get out a beaker. And the first thing I want to do is fill this beaker with approximately 10 ml of water. Now, I've got my water in here. Note that I'm holding the wash bottle vertically and that I squeeze and the water comes out like so. So that's very, very good. Now I say approximately because we're going to find out later that um, a 10 mil beaker is actually not a great accurate um, piece of equipment uh, and that this 10 mil is actually really just an approximation. So let's not think that that's a really accurate uh, measurement of 10 mil. In fact, I'm going to get out another beaker and I will add approximately 10 mils of water to that. And perfect. So then I'm going to get some food color. Now I might start with green and I'm going to make a dilute solution. Now if you've ever had like a really weak cordial or a really weak cup of tea, then that's what's called a dilute solution. Or for example, um, 
maybe you, I don't know, having some Gatorade and most of the water, most of the Gatorade's finished and then you top it up with water, but there's still a little bit of Gatorade there, then that's a dilute solution. So a dilute solution has got a little bit of what we call the solute and a lot of the solvent. And in this case, the water, the water is the solvent. And so dilute solution, I'm gonna put one little drop, whoop, <laughs> one little drop of food coloring in there. And I'm going to get my stirring rod and just give him a little bit of a stir. So the, the dilute solution, you can, you can see through it fairly easily. The color is not super strong. And if I was to represent that with a, as a model, I'd actually like have a, a drawing of this with the liquid and I'd put a few little dots in it, which would represent the food coloring. And I'd have them spread fairly far apart. But let's make a concentrated solution. Okay, so I'm going to make a concentrated solution. One drop will be a pretty similar solution, concentration. Ah, two drop, three drop, four, five. And sometimes I've seen it where a kid squeezes this too hard and the whole lot goes in. That's a super concentrated solution. But <laughs> I think well, I think this is a concentrated enough solution for now. You can actually see see that the color is hmm, quite quite a bit darker. You know what, I'm gonna add a bit more, okay? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, that is a highly concentrated, a very high concentrated solution here. So dilute, concentrated. And if I was to draw that and represent it as a model, I'd have the same size beaker and the same amount of water. And I'd do lots of dots to show that there's lots of um that there's lots of the solute um in that um solution or that mixture. So let's have a look now at some what we call evaporation. So for evaporation. I'm going to need the Bunsen burner to make it go nice and quickly. And so let me get the heat proof mats out. And there we go. I've got plenty of gas there, so I'm happy with that. And put this heat proof mat over the top. And I'll need the tripod. I might not put the tripod on just yet, the wire goes. I might actually get the Bunsen burner burning first. I actually find it a bit easier to get the Bunsen burner burning before I put the tripod on. Totally up to you though. It's just what I generally prefer. And blow out my match. And I think I need to get that going a little bit better. There we go, quite, quite a powerful flame there. And now I'll put my tripod and wire gauze on. And we're going to be heating this up. And hot water is a hazard. Now, the risk is the, the likelihood. Now, to reduce the, the likelihood of injury, I'm actually going to reduce the amount of water that I'm actually boiling. So by reducing the amount I'm boiling, that actually reduces the risk of injury. So I'm gonna pop that on there like that. And I'm going to need my tweezers. I'm going to need my tweezers. Because I need to like actively watch this now. I can't just like, oh la la la, go and do something else. Um, talk to a friend or, you know, go get my lunch. No, I actually have to keep watching this. And I need to make sure that it stays in the, the middle. Now, if I watch this carefully, I can actually see some little tiny bubbles forming. That's very interesting. Does that mean it's boiling? Hmm, probably not. Probably means that there was some air in that liquid. And as you heat it up, the air actually comes out of solution. But I can tell you that the water, the water temperature is increasing. And I actually, I actually can see a little bit of like mistiness occurring on the inside of that glassware. That's because as the water heats up and starts to evaporate, 
Well, it actually then can condense on those cool, uh, the cool glass walls, and that actually goes back to a liquid. So that looks really good, and I actually can hear it starting to crackle. And just before it's boiling, I might actually get my wooden peg out. Come on, wooden peg. Oh, get my fingernails in there. Come on. There we go, I've got my wooden peg, and I'm going to get my watch glass out. So I've got a watch glass and a wooden peg, like this. Oh, I wish, sometimes you want to be an octopus because you need sort of more hands. But oh, I can actually see that that has moved a little bit. And it is boiling now. Okay, it is boiling. So I might even like push myself back a little bit from it to reduce the risk of injury. Because if it does fall over now, I'm quite far back. And so the likelihood of being injured is less. Now, notice that my watch glass is currently dry, okay? It's dry on the bottom and fully transparent. And I'm going to put, oh, <laughs> I'm going to put my watch glass over the steam and it mists up. Can you see how it's going all misty? Ah, oh, look at that. And I'm going to hold it there for a while longer Okay, I'm being careful that I might need to pop this back into the center and this sort of thing. This might actually be a good activity for two people to be doing at the same time. So it's misting up. The steam is actually condensing on the bottom of the watch glass. The steam is condensing on the bottom of the watch glass. What color is that condensate? It actually doesn't have a color at all. What? It's clear and colourless. But the stuff I'm boiling is dark green. How can that be? And that's because when it evaporates, it's just the water. It's just the water that is actually boiling off, leaving behind the particles of, you know, the food colouring. <gasps> so that means I'm actually separating the water, which we'll call the solvent, from the food colouring particles, which are actually called the solute. Boiling, evaporating, and condensing is a way to bring about a separation of a mixture. Hmm. You've learnt your first, well, you've learnt a very important separation technique, evaporation. And this is actually how you, they get our salt. They pump salt water into a big lake and then they let the, the sunshine um, evaporate the water and they're not after the fresh water, so they let that disappear into the atmosphere. They don't bother condensing it. They want what's left behind. They want the salt that's been left behind. And I guess if you were to keep boiling and boiling and boiling this until all the water was gone, you'd end up with a, a dark solid at the bottom, which would actually be the food colouring particles. Look at that. Separation by evaporation. I'm a poet and didn't know it. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna turn that one off now. Oh, and the best thing to do is now just to let this cool down um, naturally. Uh, Let's make it cool down a little bit safer though by taking off the um, beaker and putting it to the side and perhaps even taking off the wire gauze and putting the wire gauze maybe on the, the heat proof mat over here. Now this, this will now cool down quite quickly and quite safely. And this has already dried out the watch glass so I'm actually going to put the watch glass back in the, um, it's cooled down, so that's good. I'm going to put the peg back. But I am going to need the beaker for the next activity. So I might actually just get a clean beaker out. So I've got a brand new clean beaker here. And I'm going to show you something that's really interesting. Now, I didn't come up with it. I, in fact, I was um, at a school doing an incursion in this kid in year, I think year five, actually, made this discovery and I'm like, whoa, that's very interesting. And so I've been showing people 
that discovery a lot. Now, some of you might be saying, have you ever made a discovery yourself, Mr. Strickling? And, um, well, <clears throat> I refuse to answer that question, thank you. <laughs> so, what are we gonna need? We're gonna need five mil of water. So, approximately half fill the beaker, half fill the beaker with water, just approximately, roughly. And we're going to need some table salt. Now, how much table salt? Well, a reasonable amount. So I'm going to attempt to squirt. Come on. Come on. Oh, it just blows the salt everywhere. Hmm. Okay. What's, an, what's a way that I can get the salt out? What about into the mortar? Ah, that was a better idea. Okay. Sometimes you've got to use your ingenuity and your thinking processes to solve problems and that was a way to solve the problem and I need a tiny little spoon. Now remember the rule for the spoon, don't get the spoon wet. Now I'm going to do five, one, two, three, four, five. Now that wasn't totally accurate because I used sort of different size amounts of lumps on the spoon but that's okay for this um, experiment. And that's just um, salt. So I'm gonna tip that salt into the bin and pop that there. And I need my stirring rod because I'm going to stir the salt into that five mil water. Now, do you think this will produce a dilute or a concentrated solution? Hope you said concentrated because five spoonfuls in five mil of water is actually quite a lot. Now the salt is actually disappearing. That's called dissolving. And I'm forming what's called a solution. It's a mixture. And in this case, the water is the solvent, the salt is the solute, and the mixture is called the solution. So that's the easy part. Now we're going to do the hard part. And the hard part, or the difficult part, is to add another five mil of water, but I need to do it really gently and I don't want the, the water, the fresh water to mix with the salty water. So I'm actually going to like squirt the water very gently on the side of the beaker, okay? I'm gonna gently do it on the side of the beaker and I'm gonna fill it up quite a long way, okay? Almost to the top, almost to the top. Now, you're probably saying, I thought this was gonna be really interesting. So far, it looks a bit boring. Well. Let's see how we go. And I'm going to get some food coloring. And I'll start with the green food coloring because that's what we used before. And remember when I put it into the water, the green food coloring shot down to the bottom? Do you remember that? I'm gonna put a big drop in. Oh, it didn't shoot down to the bottom. Sort of just like went a little bit of the way. How about if I get some blue? I'm gonna add a blue drop. Whoop, oh. And I'm going to add a drop of yellow. Bloop. Oh, let's get a better drop. Oh yeah, oh, three drops of yellow, I like that. It needs to be a little bit more concentrated in order to see the yellow. And what about red? And let's put a red in. disaster oh no this is exactly what oh, 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 no. oh my poor table and my poor heat proof mat now oh, it's gonna oh, no. oh dear oh dear oh dear oh dear oh, I thought that only happened to little kids well it's happened to me now hasn't it oh I don't think this heat proof mat is ever going to recover from that disaster. I'll probably have to soak it in water for overnight. I'll make sure I wipe this table down pretty quickly. <laughs> Are you laughing? You're laughing at me, aren't you? That's not very nice, right? It's not nice to laugh at other people's failures, okay? So anyway, <laughs> but can you see? Can you see how all the, the color is on the top? And it's very concentrated. <laughs> and that it's like colorless liquid down the bottom. That's amazing. The salt water has formed like a, like, a, like a dense layer 
that the food coloring can't penetrate through. Isn't that interesting? It is really interesting, isn't it? And probably quite funny too. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll clean up this mess. Hopefully this hasn't happened to you guys. <laughs> and uh, I'll look forward to seeing you next lesson with hopefully some cleaner equipment. Okay, bye for now. Hey everyone, in today's lesson we're looking at the globally harmonized system of classification and labeling chemicals. Now in the olden days, and I know I keep referring to these olden days, um, every country sort of like um, classified dangerous chemicals in a different way. And that was okay within that country, but when a country sent chemicals from, you know, itself to another country or imported chemicals from a different country into its own company, that became, country, that became a big, big problem because all of a sudden, you know, there was different symbols and different types of dangerous or hazardous chemicals and uh, the whole system was a bit of a mess, especially when it went from country to country to country. So basically, basically, uh, the governing bodies got together and organised like a, a central, uh, a central system that all countries sort of like agreed to, and that's the globally um, harmonised system or the GHS system. And it's, I guess, it's made up of nine um, key, I guess, um, hazards. And I've got the hazards here on a piece of paper and I'm going to refer to them because I don't know these all off by mind. Um, but the GHS system classifies um, the hazards by the type of hazard and it helps us communicate the information about hazardous chemicals on labels and safety data sheets or sometimes known as material safety data sheets. And so let's look at the first one. X number one, exploding bomb. Okay, so um, what do we got? Explosion, fire, blast, or projection hazard. So if you were if you were like um, importing um, fireworks, I would guarantee that these would um, be labelled with this number one exploding bomb. Number two, um, flame. So flammable liquids. Okay, flammable liquids, vapor, solids and gases, including self-heating um, and self-igniting substances. Oh, sounds a little bit dangerous, doesn't it? But there are definitely plenty of flammable liquids along around. And if there was a um, tanker carrying fuel, I can guarantee it would have this flammable symbol on it. Now, what about number three? Flame over circle. Hmm, what's that referring to? Well, oxidizing liquids oxidizing liquid solids and gases uh, may cause our or intensify fire. An example is uh, hydrogen peroxide. Not in itself flammable, but it actually contains an oxygen, oxygen molecules that are released and those oxygen molecules can actually cause um, fire to be more intense. Uh, potassium permanganate, uh, which has got the word or the eight at the end of it indicates oxygen and uh, glycerol. Uh, well, glycerol is a fuel, but potassium permanganate and glycerol, well, the permanganate causes the glycerol to, to self combust. Number four, gas cylinder. So, gas cylinder and uh, gases under pressure. Now, I wonder, I wonder whether our, well, this one here. This one here has got like the flammable, but you'd think it would have the gas under pressure. Uh, what about this one here? No, this is the flammable as well. Maybe they're not classifying, uh, well, this is a liquid under pressure, so they're not classifying this as gas under pressure, but maybe your soda stream, your soda stream might count there. Uh, number five, corrosion. Okay, corrosion. So corrosive chemicals may cause severe skin and eye damage and may be um, corrosive to uh, metals. Well, definitely acids. If you go to the hardware store or the pool store and you need to get an acid for either your pool or for cleaning off like cement off the brickwork, they will have like this um, corrosion symbol. And you can sort of see the test tube releasing the liquid onto the hands and that's going to eat away uh, the flesh and even the bones. 
Uh, vinegar is a slightly corrosive um, liquid, but I don't think it's corrosive enough to warrant this symbol. And then we've got the skull and crossbones. Kind of reminding me of an old pirate ship in the olden days. <laughs> anyway, fatal or toxic if swallowed, inhaled, or in contact with skin. Hmm, so I guess arsenic and cyanide, uh, which is a deadly poison. Um, but there are, I guess, in um, if you're in horticulture growing things, there'd probably be um, some concentrated chemicals in the storeroom that would definitely be skull and crossbone um, or would need that stuck on them. So beware, beware. And then an exclamation mark. So low level of toxicity, and this includes respiratory, so breathe. Uh, ones that you might breathe in and out, the skin and eye. Um, so skin sensitive and chemicals harmful if swallowed um, or inhaled or in contact with skin. So they're not uh, as toxic as the skull and crossbone, but they are hazardous and so can cause danger to human health. Then you've got like this upper torso with like this sort of star well that's sort of like the lungs sort of thing so health hazard and uh, it's referring to chronic health hazards um, this includes the respiratory and respiratory hazards uh, carcinogenicity um, what's this other one uh, mutant muta, mutant mut, mutagenicity so that actually causes changes within the DNA and uh, what else the reproductive toxicity so oh not good at all and uh, as I film this there's a big movement to actually ban um, artificial uh, stone uh, benches for kitchens because when they're cut they release this fine dust that contains um, silicon and when it's breathed in it can lead to a disease called silicosis which can lead to death after a few years and so that's a respiratory um, issue and you know in the olden days again uh, you might have heard of something called asbestos now asbestos was a fiber a mineral fiber that uh, they used to make insulation from and if you breathed it in then it actually the the fibers would lodged in your lungs and they could actually turn into uh, or cause tumors and cancer to form and then our final one is the environment. Paul Dilfishy, ah, <laughs> well, that's not funny. Uh, dead in the water. So these are, what are they? Hazardous for aquatic life and, uh, and the environment. And I know copper sulfate, um, copper sulfate here is definitely hazardous to uh, aquatic situations. And, you know, it can kill cause fish to die, uh, if you, that gets in the waterway. And also like, um, but sometimes, you know, people make use of that, not to kill the fish, but they might have pipes, sewage pipes that have been clogged by tree roots. And so they might actually put down some concentrated copper sulfate to actually kill off the tree roots. Or if they chop a tree down and they don't want it to grow back, they might paint concentrated, there's that word again, copper sulfate, and that could actually stop the tree from growing back. Um, in a future video, we're going to look at more examples of, um, of these. And if I haven't given you enough examples, well, you can actually go and research some yourself. Okay, thanks for joining me today, and I'll see you again soon. Bye for now. Hey all, welcome to this lesson on hazardous chemicals, substances, and objects. Now, it didn't take me long to find a few um, hazardous substances just in the cupboards around the house. Now, gas, butane gas for the um, Bunsen burners. It's got a flammable uh, GHS symbol on it. No surprises there at all. And interestingly, um, I've got some methylated spirits here. Uh, again, it's a flammable liquid. It's clear, it's colourless, 
You can buy it at Coles and Woolworths and it happens to be the chemical that causes the most accidents in science departments. It's actually very, very dangerous um, because it's so flammable. And in the olden days, <laughs> they, science teachers used to set this experiment where, or activity where uh, kids used to boil methylated spirits and put leaves in there to remove the chlorophyll. And what would happen is that the, the methylated spirits would evaporate, boil, evaporate, and then the fumes would um, ignite. The kid would get a shock, bump the equipment, the liquid go, would go flying, hit another kid, they'd catch on fire, trip to the hospital, and um, yeah, another accident. So, look, can I beg, plead, do not play with flammable liquids. It's, it's just not worth it. Burns from flammable liquids are really, really terrible. Um, so hear that and keep that away from young kids. And talking about keeping things away from young kids, this was, this was just, you know, um, under the kitchen sink and it's easy off oven heavy duty. Now, I reckon a kid could probably pretty easy take that off. And if they were to spray that into someone's face, you know, it's, what is it? it, it what are the symbols? Corrosive and flammable. Like, you don't even have to spray it onto someone's face, just onto their hands or their arms. Very dangerous. So something like oven cleaner should be kept in a locked cupboard or definitely off in a cupboard that can't be reached by children. Very hazardous. Another very hazardous one. And, you know, it it's, seems so simple. Eucalyptus oil. It's used good for removing stains, um, texture off things. And the GHS symbol is that of a flammable liquid, but it, in my opinion, it should have the toxicity label as well. Because, you know, just a, I think it's half a spoon of this, half a teaspoon of this is enough to kill a baby. And so, uh, very toxic as well. So, it should be high, and it probably should be in a locked cupboard. So, eucalyptus oil, even though, um, you know, it doesn't, eucalyptus you think oh it's just the gum tree but if you concentrate this the the oil from the leaves down it actually is quite toxic mm. degreaser uh gutsy this is gutsy degreaser by the way this is not just degreaser this is gutsy this is ct14 people um and <laughs> what's the gh corrosive okay corrosive probably toxic as well but it probably tastes so bad that as you drinking it you'd be aware that it's toxic and a uh, multi-purpose insect killer what was it flammable yep so you wouldn't f uh you know like spray this around any open flames but that brings me to um these two these two here which you know mold killer mold mold killers like when we talk about corrosive um it's not corrosive in the way that um, acids are, but it can certainly break down the proteins in your skin. Um, and if, if it's sprayed in your eyes, it's not good at all. So I think it should have a GHS symbol on this. And I was actually surprised that the dishwashing tablets actually don't have anything written on them as well. And in my mind, they probably should be labelled as toxic and corrosive as well. So, a little bit strange that, in my opinion, that some consumer objects or substances don't have the GHS symbols on them when I actually think they probably should. Now, many years ago, I was doing a experiment with Year 10 and... Uh, we were looking at the acidity and basicity of substances around the house and we had some nappy sand and there was some nappy sand in a beaker and there was a plastic pipette sitting in there and that it was very, very um, corrosive and very basic. That went up on the windowsill and the year 10 class went out. Then after lunch, I had a year six class, a primary class in the room. And as the kids walked in, one kid saw this pipette up on the bench. He saw he thought it was sitting in water, 
but it wasn't water. It was um, it was nappy sand, and he picked up the pipette and he squeezed it, and he squeezed it into his friend's eye, who then screamed his head off because uh, it was you know eating away the you know it was corroding his flesh. Sorry to give you a scare like this, and I know it's not nice, but you know you don't play around with chemicals. That's all there is to it. Okay. Chemicals are not something you play around with. And, you know, if you don't know stuff, like, yeah, sure, you can use the water pistol because, you know, only water's been in a water pistol. But don't squirt people with anything of a scientific nature because you don't know what chemicals have been in there before. I know I'm sounding a bit harsh, but I've seen the accidents happen and they're not worth it. So don't play with flammable liquids. Don't play with corrosive substances and don't you know, play, try and play funny tricks on people by squirting them, okay, it's not worth it. But on a happier note, on a happier note, uh, borax, which you can buy by the kilogram, uh, very, very good for slime, and you know, kids, I know kids had spent, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week making slime with bare hands, but apparently in the States, a kid um, got a bit of a bad rash or a reaction, and Anyway, that state happened to ban borax or something like that. And then it's sort of like there was this global fear of borax. And uh, it, I think it became harder to get to make the slime. Um, and so it actually be, it's actually still quite easy to get it as a laundry powder. Um, but I guess with any chemical, even if you think it's, even if you think or know it's safe, sometimes, you know, a lot of exposure to a fairly low toxic um, chemical can actually cause harm. So just keep that in mind. And in terms of dangerous objects, well, I've got one here that's very dangerous to one's toes. <laughs> hey, <laughs> a hammer, boom, <laughs> on your toe. If you drop a hammer on your toes, yeah, that's quite, that's quite hazardous, isn't it? So <laughs> um, that's why we wear protective leather and steel cap boots if we're doing any building. And I've got another dangerous object. It's a, it's a jigsaw. It's got a sharp blade and you know, if you put your finger near it and you could cause, you know, harm to yourself. So anyway, um, that's our lesson on hazardous chemicals, substance and objects. I hope that you um, picked up uh, that, you know, keep in mind safety always keep in mind safety not just for yourself but for others as well so look after those around you particularly your your brothers and your sisters your mums and dads all right i look forward to seeing you again and uh hope, hopefully you know you haven't been too freaked out by this lesson but that you found it useful bye for now Hey everyone, thanks for joining me in this lesson. And this lesson's quite exciting um, because we're going to burn some magnesium. Now, the reason that we're doing it is number one, that's very, very interesting. <laughs> but two, it will allow me to talk about our ways to reduce risk um, and get us thinking of always ways to reduce risk. So without Further ado, um, what we need for this lesson, just your chemistry set, matches, goggles or glasses and a bit of water for later on. Okay, so how about we first set up the Bunsen burner. I'll just grab my heat proof mat. Oh, look, it's a little bit damp. <laughs> yeah, someone, someone got food colouring all over it and I had to soak it in water. But look at that, look, the colour came out. So that's nice. And I need my Bunsen burner. Hmm, still got gas. So that's pretty good. I think the gas lasts about 23 minutes or something like that. So quite significant, really. Pop that down there and put the heat proof mat on top. I don't actually need the wire gauze and I don't need the tripod this time. Um, tweezers. Going to need some tweezers. And I'll put my goggles on now. Um, and let's get some magnesium ribbon out. So there should be a little sample bottle of magnesium ribbon. And 
magnesium ribbon, just need one length. And it's a couple of centimetres long. It's a silvery metal. It's quite malleable. That means I can bend it backwards and forwards, and that means I can hit it with a hammer. Um, it's got a fairly shiny luster, and it's actually quite lightweight for, you know, it's not it's not a particularly dense metal. I guess it reminds me a bit of aluminium, maybe. And now you can actually cut that with a pair of scissors. So you could actually make this half the size. Oh, well, by reducing the quantity, that actually uh, reduces the hazard. So, or the risk, I should say. Now, I don't have a pair of scissors here. So what I'm doing is I'm wiggling this backwards and forwards quite quickly. Ah, and it broke. <laughs> Which is what I expected it to happen. Because I'm going to start with a smaller piece. So one way to reduce um, risk is to actually <laughs> uh, reduce the amount of chemical that you're going to use. So I'll get this Bunsen burner going. And let's light the Bunsen burner. And now I know that there's no curtains around here. But you might be in a space which is not as open as this and there might be some curtains hanging, something like that. You need to make sure that there's nothing flammable in this zone. You don't really want lots of pieces of paper and that sort of stuff. So that's, that's one way that you can minimise the risk. Well, there's two ways now. Smaller piece of magnesium, making sure that there's nothing flammable around. It's going to get that Bunsen burner going a little bit better. Um, I'll put the heat proof mat next to it really quite close and I'm going to hold the magnesium metal in some tweezers that also reduces risk to myself because if I held it in my fingers I can assure you I'd be getting burnt so here we go once it's ignited make sure you move it away from the Bunsen burner okay so it might take you a little bit by surprise um, when it ignites Make sure you move it away because you don't want to drop anything inside that Bunsen burner. It's like a precision little instrument. And if anything gets inside, uh, you'll have to make a bit of effort to get rid of it. So here we go. I'm going to heat it up. Heat it up. Here we go. It's warming up. It's glowing orange. Anything going to happen? I see an orange. Wait. Whoa. Look at. Well, it's hard to look at that when it's so bright. Isn't that right? <laughs> so... Wow, it's white, it's gone white. The silvery metal has somehow gone white. That's because a new substance has been formed. A chemical reaction has occurred. The magnesium has reacted with the oxygen in the air to form a new substance, magnesium oxide. How good's that? Ooh, and it's, uh, it's a white, sort of a soft powder now. Magnesium oxide. How good is that? So, three ways to reduce risk. Um, a small piece of magnesium. Make sure that there's no curtains or flammable things around. Hold it with um, your tweezers. And a fourth way, make sure you're wearing safety glasses. So, let me do that once more. And we'll talk about some... Oh, here we go. Uh, some signs that a chemical reaction has occurred. So here we go. I can I'll tell you the signs. Some of the signs that we're expecting: heat given out, so a lot of energy given out. A substance disappears, so the the magnesium disappears. A new substance forms, which is the white powder and the smoke. So there's actually three three signs that a chemical reaction has taken place. Woo, come on, come on. I can probably boost up the, the Bunsen power and move it away. Oh, hey, look at that. They use these in um, parachute flares. They shoot them up in the air and then as the magnesium burns slowly and drifts down, it lights up the whole area. You can use that, do that in surf, search and rescue. So, there we go. 
Wonderful. Now I'm going to show you something really interesting. And for that, I need a beaker and I need, just a, you don't need too much water, okay? Don't need too much water. Oh, more than that though. Maybe about two mil. And you need some copper sulfate. Now blue copper sulfate. And I'm going to get my small spoon. Just make sure it's clean. Yep, spoon's clean. And I want to make a fairly concentrated um, solution. So two spoons is perfect. Put the lid back on, on the copper sulfate. Now, shall I stir it with the spoon? No, no, you never, spur, you never stir liquid with the spoon. You always use the banging rod. I mean the stirring rod, okay? So yes, stir, 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 stir. Okay, I'm gonna stir with the stirring rod like this. And I've now got a blue solution of copper sulfate. I've got some undissolved copper sulfate down there at the base of the beaker, but as I stir it, I can see that copper sulfate disappearing and dissolving, and I can see the liquid getting darker blue as the liquid becomes more concentrated because it's dissolving more and more copper sulfate. And soon, all that copper sulfate will have dissolved. Now, this much water will only dissolve so much copper sulfate. You can't, it won't just keep dissolving and dissolving, dissolving. It reaches a point called uh, saturation, where the, the water is saturated and it won't actually dissolve more copper sulfate. And different, um, water has different saturation levels for different compounds. So salt and sugar, different amounts of salt and sugar will dissolve compared to the copper sulfate. Then I've only got a tiny little piece of um, magnesium left. So I'm actually going to use, oh, I, don't, I might put the whole length in. I might put the whole length in, but that doesn't mean the whole length will use up. Remember, if you've got a glass jar of these magnesium ribbons, there's about, I don't know, six pieces in there. This is actually, should do for a number of courses. So don't want to use it all up, okay? However, you can get replacements, so I wouldn't worry too much. And what I've just done is I'm going to push that copper or that magnesium under the liquid and straight away, I can hear bubbles. I can hear gas forming. Hear that? There's a, there is a, there is a chemical reaction occurring because there's a new substance being produced. That new substance is a gas. Hmm. I wonder if the gas has a smell. Now, one technique in science to smell things is not to put your big fat nose, sorry, <clears throat> not to put your nose over the liquid and take a big whiff, right? It could be a very strong gas, could be toxic, you know? Uh, and so it's best to take a finger or two fingers and waft, you waft that that gas towards your nose to see if you can pick up any smell. And to be honest, mm, I can't pick up any smell. Now I should have my goggles on. So I'm gonna put my safety goggles on because copper sulfate solution is not good for the eyes. Okay, so it's not, copper sulfate is not good for the eyes. It actually causes the breakdown of proteins. And so you've got to be careful with that. But I'm going to get my tweezers. Okay, really we want to leave this for five, maybe 10 minutes. I'm going to get my tweezers and I'm going to have a look. And I can see that there's been, there's some type of change. Like I see this dark color and I actually see like little blacky bits down in the bottom of the copper sulfate there. I might actually leave that in there for a long time. But I'll give you a bit of a hint of what's going on. Magnesium is more reactive than copper. 
And so the magnesium is actually displacing the copper out of solution and copper metal is forming on the magnesium and the magnesium is actually going into the solution. So very interesting. Maybe you can leave that overnight and see what happens. <laughs> very good. Although I want to do a little bit of an experiment too straight away. I wouldn't mind seeing what happens if I take a little bit of that I'm going to take a little bit of the, the powdery stuff with the tweezers I wonder if I can grab that with the tweezers the black the black stuff hmm okay and I'm going to light my Bunsen burner because I'm interested to see something Hmm. You learn by investigation. And let's have a little look. It's going to put those tweezers in that flame. Now that's a little bit vigorous. Oh, yes. I just saw it. Just. A, can you see that little tiny bit? Yes, you can see that green. See that green there? That green is evidence that we've got copper. Okay? Copper ions. Whoa! Sizzle, sizzle. <laughs> what about if I just grab this magnesium? I don't actually want to ignite it. I don't want to ignite the magnesium. I don't really want to touch it with my fingers either. But I do want to hold it over the flame. Let's just see what happens. What colour does it go? Will it change colours of the... Uh, no, it's not changing colours. This is going to ignite. I don't really want it to ignite. Is it going to ignite? Huh. What about if I blast it? Whee! Oh, and a little bit of sparkles and a little bit of um, sizzles. It went out quite quickly. I think that magnesium ribbon has actually reacted quite quickly already with that copper um, and it sort of disappeared. And I can sort of see a bluey green copper. Oh, yeah, well, bluey green, that means copper ions, but I can also see like a blacky brown. Anyway, <laughs> thanks for joining me today and. Uh, I do love chemistry. Very, very interesting. And I'll see you again soon. Bye for now. Hey everyone, it's great to have you along again. And in this lesson, we're going to be looking at some more science skills and um, particularly uh, looking at how to make accurate measurements, uh, especially in the area of volume. Now, as we proceed through these lessons, you're actually learning plenty of skills, uh, but I guess this, this lesson is quite focused on those volume measurements. So uh, quite an accurate piece of equipment is the 5mm measuring cylinder. Um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And it actually goes up by 0.1mm. There's 10 graduations between each mil. So it goes up between, um, goes up by 0.1. Now, in science, when you're actually taking measurements and you've actually got a scale, you're actually allowed to report the, um, all the known values, all the certain values, and then the first uncertain value. So you're actually allowed to guess a little bit. <laughs> maybe not guess, but maybe use your intuition. So for example, if, the value is between, um, let's say the value is definitely between 1.1 and 1.2, somewhere in between 1.1 and 1.2, you can actually guess and go, hmm, I think that's about a 1.14. So you know for sure it's 1.1, and then you can actually guess, or you know, the, you're allowed to state one uncertain figure. So the limit of reading on this measuring cylinder is 0.1 millilitres. 
Now there's something called parallax error and parallax error has to do where your eyes are compared to the actual scale. And to avoid what's called parallax error, you need to try and get your eyes perpendicular with the actual scale, so at right angles to it. You know, if you're looking at from above, um, you'll probably um, sort of read a higher reading. If you're looking at from below, you might sort of read a, a lower reading. But if you're looking at it from right on, it should be um, as correct as you can possibly make it. So, keep your eyes at right angles. Now, the first thing we're going to do is see if we can measure 5 mil of um, water as accurately as possible. And to do that, I might get out my 10 mil beaker and my plastic pipette, and you'll see why in a moment. I'm going to put some water in the 10 mil beaker, like that. And then I'm going to fill up this measuring cylinder. I'm going to bring it as close, fairly close to the five mil mark, but under, okay, but under. Because I'm actually going to then make up the, um, the full, five mil by just adding drop wise from the measuring cylinder. Now, it's very clear that there's this shape at the top of the water, okay? That shape, it's a concave shape. Water forms a concave shape at the top and that that is called the meniscus. The meniscus. Funny name, isn't it? And it's because the water molecules are actually being um, attracted up the side of the glass. Um, now, where do you measure from, though? Do you measure from where it touches the top of the glass, so at the top of the meniscus? Well, the answer is no. You actually measure at the bottom of the meniscus. So the bottom, if you're measuring 5 mil, should be touching the 5 mil line. So I'm going to add very carefully, drop drop, drop. Ah, that looks very, very good. Um, actually, I'd say perfect, to be perfectly blunt. <laughs> I love it. So, that's five mil, um, as accurately as we can get it with this equipment. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get a dry beaker, so another beaker, just a dry one, and I'm going to pour that liquid in and I'm going to like give it a bit of a shake to try and get most of it out. Shake, 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 shake. All right, and then got a good dose of it out there. And let's now get another five millilitres. Okay, let's get another five millilitres and bringing it up close and get a bit more water and drip. Drip, 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 drip. Okay, there's another five millilitres. And I'm gonna pour this in. And what level, what level do you think it will show on this beaker? Will it be exactly 10 millilitres? You know, like five plus five? Or my guess might be that it might be a little bit lower than 10 millilitres because why might I think it be a little bit lower? Because, well, there's a bit of liquid maybe left in the um, measuring cylinder. But I might have a look at the scale and what? What? It's like, it's, it's above the 10. It's above the 10. How can that be? I can tell you how that can be. What's printed on the side of this beaker is not particularly accurate. Beakers are not very accurate measuring devices. Um, so don't use them as such. Um, that 10 mil that's written on the side of that beaker is just a bit of an approximation. So there you go. I hope, hopefully you've learned something about that <laughs> today. So. Now, what about the plastic pipette? Now, if you have a look at this plastic pipette, um, up, the, up the, um, the body of it, there's actually some numbers. And 
well, let's have a look at my eyesight. <laughs> my eyesight's a little bit, I, I don't actually have a lot of light here. You're sort of getting the light here, but my light here is not actually great. And so I probably need glasses to be perfectly blunt. Um, but is that, is that a two mil measuring cylinder? A uh, two mil pipette or a three mil? I'm pretty sure this is a two mil pipette. So, but what I'm going to do, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to draw up, okay? I'm gonna draw up two mil, what I think as accurately as I possibly can. Okay, two mil. And then I'm going to transfer it to the measuring cylinder. Now you might think, oh, he's going to read the value there, but in actual fact, I'm not. I'm actually going to get another two mil, okay? Well, I'm going to get what this, this says is two mil. Like that, and I'll squeeze that in. And if if this is really accurate, then this should read four mil. So let's have a little look. <gasps> what? You're kidding me, right? That's like three point mm, two mil or something like that. Huh? Hmm. That's because that's because a plastic pipette is not a very accurate piece of um, equipment either. And so these these values here are <laughs> very approximate. Um, and so don't use a plastic pipette as an accurate piece of equipment. However, there is a, another very accurate piece of equipment and that is the scales. Okay, the scales are actually really accurate. Now, they're actually accurate to 0 0.01 grams, which is actually quite phenomenal for a little piece of equipment like this. Now, I did have a, I, a tiny science lab cells into schools, and I had a, 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 a lab manager contact me and say, look, your, your scales are quite, you know, quite cheap compared to the expensive ones we're getting. You say that they are accurate to 0.01, but we just don't believe it. We just can't believe that you can have a, a set of scales that are so cheaply available that are uh, apparently so accurate. Anyway, the school was near me. So I said, well, I'll bring in the scales. You get out your most expensive, accurate scales that you have. And I turned up and it was this big set of equipment. And um, we weighed a few different things. And each time we weighed them, the cheap scales and the expensive scales showed exactly the same weight. So how interesting is that? All right, so what we're going to do is actually find the, the mass of one mil of water. So turn it on, turn it on, and it takes time to settle down. You can't use these things walking around with your hands, okay? It has to be on a firm base. Now it's reading 0 0.00 grams. Now you oh, just went up to 0.03, that's because I'm like breathing on it. You know, the, the force of my air actually causes the pan to go down and it actually reads it. So I might even move it away from, you know, my air. And what I can do, if it's reading, not if it's not zero, so mine's reading 0.04, actually press the tear button, okay? And now it's reading zero again without having to turn it on and off. So it's reading zero. Now, to weigh a mill of water, do you think I just like suck up a mill and then just like squirt a mill of water on there? No, that's a very, very bad idea, okay? Bad idea. I'll show you a good way to measure the mass or the weight of one mill of water. I'm just gonna shake out the measuring cylinder and I'll put the measuring cylinder on here. And my measuring cylinder, just out of interest, is 12.51 grams. Now I can guarantee your measuring cylinder is a little bit different. In fact, um, we buy hundreds of these measuring cylinders and we find that the length actually varies by up to a centimeter, well, half a centimeter to a centimeter. There's actually quite a big variation in the, the lengths of the measuring cylinders that we get. Um, I hope that means that there's not a huge variation in the accuracy. I don't think there is. Um, I'm pretty sure that the diameters are all the same. And so when they print on those scales, 
that's okay. It's just that the, the, the length up here is a little bit different. And so now I can write down 12.51 if I want and then add a mil of water and then find a new way to deduct it. Or I can press tear and again it brings it to zero. Okay. Now you might think that the most accurate way to measure the mass of one mil of water is to actually put one mil of water in here. But believe it or not, to do it more accurately, it's actually more accurate to weigh five mil of water and then divide the mass by five. That's because every single measurement has got error. Okay, every single measurement that you can ever take has got some error. And so you've got an error when you weigh one mil. Now one mil is not a large value and so the error is actually <clears throat> quite large compared to the size of the, the measurement. However, the error is probably about the same regardless of how many mils of water. And so if you actually measure five mil of water, then the error comparatively to the five mil is quite small. But the error to one mil of water is actually quite large. So by measuring five mil of water, the error becomes <coughs> a fairly small percentage. And so I am now going to bring up the very, in fact, I've gone a little bit over. I've gone a bit over. So I'm actually going to draw some of that water out and put a drop in. I think that's about right. And I have got a value of 4.99. 4.99 grams, that is so close to five grams. That's incredible. Like, I didn't expect to get like so close to five. Um, the, the mass of five mil of water um, is five grams, which makes the mass of one mil of water one gram. Now that's if the water's at a particular temperature, which is pretty, probably pretty close to what we call the standard laboratory condition. So I'm not, I, I'm, what I'm surprised about is that it's so accurate to be perfectly blunt. Okay. Very, very interesting. So there we go. What's the mass of one mil of water? One gram. So anyway, well, I hope that you've learned a few um, hints and tricks uh, for uh, measuring accurately, and I look forward to seeing you next lesson. Bye for now. Hey everybody, welcome to this chemistry lesson where we are going to do an absolute classic. Um, we're going to separate a mixture of sand, salt, and iron filings into its constituent components. So you'll need your chemistry set, um, you'll need some water, and you'll need some cling wrap uh, for this. So um, what's the aim? As I said, we're going to take our sample of sand, salt, iron filings. So I'm just going to find it here. So we've got iron powder, sand, and sodium chloride. Um, so that's our iron, sand, and salt. And it's a, a bit of a um, blacky gray sort of mix. And we need to try and split it up or separate it into the, um, the iron, the sand, and the sodium chloride. Now, we're gonna try and do this um, a little bit what, what we call quantitatively. So we're actually going to try and uh, look at some of the quantities, the actual masses of the components and see how we go. So the first thing, grab your scales, grab your scales and turn them on, turn them on, and then put your little white dish, okay, your little white plate on it and tear. Then I'm going to get some, some of the the mixture. Now it's probably best to get your little spoon, your tiny spoon. Um, that will just help control how much you put on. And you, you're definitely not going to be using this whole bottle, that's for sure. I suggest, I suggest if that we can weigh out maybe close to a gram. Okay, now 
I wonder, I wonder, I wonder if we can get exactly 1.00 grams. I wonder if that's possible. I don't think it's going to be easy. 0 0.96. 0.9. Oh, I just went to 1.03, 1.04. I wonder if I can scoop a little bit back up. Scoop a bit back up. So 1.04. Oh, 0.97. Come on. Come on. 0.9. All right. 0 0.99. 0 0.99 grams. Oh, shall I call it one gram? Yeah, I'm going to call it one gram. Okay, 0 0.99 grams. One gram. I'm going to call it one gram. All right. Um, so, what is the initial mass of my mixture? I'm going to put... Oh, okay, I won't cheat. 0.99 grams, that's what I've got, 0.99 grams. Maybe you can get exactly 1.00, maybe you're cleverer than I am, sure you are. Um, so what are we going to get out of here first? What do you think, what's the easiest? Well, I can tell you the iron filings is the easiest and you should have a magnet, okay? There should be a little magnet. Now don't put your magnet don't put your magnet straight into the iron, into this mixture because all the iron filings will get stuck to your magnet and they're very hard to get off. So that's what you need the cling wrap for. So just um, cut a little bit of the cling wrap like this and just sort of like push your magnet into it like that, but you don't have to fully wrap up the magnet. And what I'm going to do is Go around, ooh, look at this. This is actually quite fun. Go around, 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 around. Yay. This is very interesting, like that. I'm gonna give it a little bit of a tap, 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 tap. And what am I going to put it on? How about I put it on the watch glass? And I'm going to pull the magnet out of the cling wrap. So pull the magnet out of the cling wrap. And I'm gonna go for another, another extraction here. I feel like I'm mining here. I feel like I am mining. I'm extracting the iron from the, from the mixture. Probably not best to do that on your scales, okay? You don't want you don't want to like put any like unnecessary force on your scales um, could damage them it might damage them pull the magnet out and I'll go once more around we go have I got out all the iron filings there's always a little bit more isn't there so we're separating by the property of magnetism. Done. Now, if I have a look at this um, in the watch glass, I can see that there's actually little bits of sand. I haven't actually done, actually has the iron filings have actually picked up some sand. And so what I might do is I might do a tap, 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 tap. And I might actually come from the top and do what we call a second extraction. Now I can actually see it's leaving some, it's leaving some of the sand behind. So I've done a sort of a second extraction. And what I'm going to say is that that stuff on the iron on the on the plastic there is my iron filings. So I do want to weigh that, but how do I weigh it? I don't want to put it straight on the pan. And so, what shall I do? What can I use to weigh this accurately? Hmm. All right, I might, might go to this little container here. And I might put 
an aluminium pan. So I'll turn that on and wait for it to go to zero, tear it, and now very carefully transfer. Ta da! Oop, there we go. Ah, so I've got 0 0.2. 26 grams. Oh, that's what I've got. I wonder what you've got. 0 0.26 grams of iron filings. 0 0.26. 0 0.26. Excellent. So, let's pop the iron filings to one side. And you can put this away for now. And I'm going to combine my sand and salt, sort of like brush it all into that little pan. Oh, I'm losing a little bit on the table. A few little grains. Let's pick those up. And I'll just wipe my watch glass down, pop that back. And I can pop my equipment back. Very important to work neatly. Okay? You want to work neatly in when you're doing chemistry and science. Keep your workspace nice and clean. So now I've got sand and salt. And I want to separate the two. Do you know what I need to do now? Get yourself a beaker and put all of the sand and the salt into the beaker. And I spilt a little bit, so I'll put that into the beaker because I don't want to lose any of my sand or salt. How are we going to separate the sand and the salt? What's um, What property... Um, is different about them. Well, I can tell you that sand is not soluble so in water. So how about we squirt in, not too much. This is where people make their a bit of a mistake. I think I'm going to bring it up to the three mil mark. That's what I'm going to do. And then I'm going to get my stirring rod and I'm going to give it a good stir. Now, why do you think I'm stirring it? What have we stirred before? We've stirred copper sulfate and water. We've stirred salt and water. And why did we stir it? To speed up the dissolving. So we're actually dissolving the salt in the water. So this now becomes salty water. Okay, salty water. So the sand will be down the bottom and the salt will be dissolved in the water. So let's leave it like that. And we're now going to filter it. So let's set up some filtering equipment. We haven't used this equipment yet, so I've just got the retort stand. And I'm going to slide the, I guess, uh, what would you call it? <laughs> Well, I'm going to make a bit of a clamp. So let's put the red clamp on. I think that will be the right one to use. And I need the glass funnel and the peg. And let's pop that like that. And then rotate. Oh, yeah. Look at that. That is a thing of beauty. And... Bring that down here like so, yeah. And then we need some filter paper. So, filter paper, it's not like normal paper. It's not like normal photocopying paper. If you feel it, the filter paper feels a bit rough and that's because the, it's got quite large fibers and there's gaps between the fibers. And those gaps between the fibers will let the salty water through but will trap the um, sand, I hope. And so, I will fold in half. So let's, I'm gonna show you how to make what's called fluted filter paper. Start with the, the full filter paper, fold in half, fold in half again, fold in half again, fold in half again, <laughs> and then squeeze, squeeze, foldy, squeezy, and then we open it up. And we've got, what we call filtered, filtered, fluted, 
fluted filter paper. And then I'm going to sort of push that in there, like that. You could actually use scissors to cut the top off. And then I'm going to decant, decant. And decant is where you've got a solid at the bottom and you carefully, you carefully pour off the top. That's decanting is a method of se separation. So this will now sit down in the filter funnel like that. Aha! And you can see a clear colorless liquid dripping through. See that? You can see a clear colorless liquid dripping through and I'm like, so now I've got like mm, wet sand, wet sand in the beaker and I've got water dripping down, clear colorless water. Now what's special about that water? It contains the salt. That's what's special about it. <laughs> so let's pop this over here because this will take a bit of time and while we're waiting we can actually set up the next separation technique. Wow, there's a lot of uh, different techniques we're doing isn't there? So what will we need? We need your Bunsen burner for this one because now we have to get the salt from the salty water. Okay, let me get the salt from the salty water. And how do we do that? Well, we use what's called evaporation. So heat proof mat, tripod, wire gauze. Let's get the other heat proof mat. And okay, your third beaker. Get out your third beaker and half fill it with water. So get your third beaker out because so far in one of the beakers, you've got um, wet sand. In the other beaker, we've got salty water. And now in the third beaker, it's just pure plain water. Let's get this Bunsen burner cracker jacking. Oh, that's cool. Oh, I have to light the match the proper way. Oh dear, dear. It's tiny science lab way. Light it down towards the heat proof mat. And whoop, there we go. Bit of an adjustment. Perfect. Blow that out. Oh, did I just blow out my Bunsen burner flame? <laughs> I think I did, you know. Okay, I'll wave that around a little bit. And then put your, your water on it like that. Just your normal plain water. In fact, I need about, I think I need it to be about half full. That's a bit better. And you can like heat it up fairly quickly. Like, so you can actually use a bit of power on your Bunsen burner and um, it will heat up quite quickly. And just in case, and for the unexpected, of course we should be wearing our safety goggles at this stage. Now, also should have my tweezers at the ready. Have my tweezers at the ready because this might start bumping a little bit. It's, all, or it's already, it's already close to boiling. Um, and then, can you get your watch glass out? Make sure it's nice and clean. Get your watch glass out. And you pop your watch glass on top. Okay. Now, now, because you've got like a heavy mass up on the top, you do want to be like coming back a bit like so. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this, what we call the filtrate, okay, the filtrate, the salty water, the filtrate is what has come out of the filter paper. What's left behind is called the residue. So I've got the residue, which is a bit of um, wet sand. And I'm just going to turn this down now. There we go, I just want that gentle. There we go, that's like boiling, but just nice and gently. Uh, the wet sand is the residue. What comes out is called the filtrate. And now I'm going to tip the filtrate, which is the salty water, on top of the watch glass. See that? On top of the watch glass. And I'll just put that beaker under there just in case another drop falls out. 
And so, can you see what we're doing? This is a very special evaporation technique uh, where we're using what's called a water bath. Okay, we're using a water bath uh, to actually uh, gently heat the bottom of that um, watch glass. The water from the watch glass will slowly evaporate, leaving the crystalline salt behind. Now, this is going to take some time. This is like going to take mm, probably about five minutes, that's my guess. And now you know why. Remember a few steps when we dissolve the salt in the the sand, or the, we dissolve the salt from the mixture of salt and sand by adding water. And I said, don't add too much water, don't add too much water, because I knew the more water you add, the longer it's going to take to evaporate the water. Yeah, so the more water you put in, um, the longer this, this process of evaporation takes. But from my experience, um, that's actually not a huge amount of water. So we could actually like leave that for some time um, and then come back after. So that's what I might do. I'm going to leave this for some time and come back soon. So throughout this process, there are a few things to watch. It's very important that there's always fresh water in the bottom of this, um, in this beaker, the bottom beaker. If that beaker dries out, then the temperature of the beaker will go up, 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 up. And the, the, the glass particles will expand and it's highly likely that they'll expand so much that they'll crack. So if you ever heat a dry beaker without any chemicals in it, without any liquid, liquids in it, I can tell you that your likelihood of, of breaking it is super, super high. So always make sure there's something in a beaker uh, when I'm heating it. Usually it's going to be um, water, usually. Also, make sure that you keep everything centered. Now, it's not actually bumping or anything like that. Um, and so I'm actually pretty happy with how that's going. All is proceeding well. Have any drops dripped into here? Just one or two drops. So I can actually pop that there to get my all my salt. And I've still got water in there. It's still centered. I can actually see a little bit of um, crustiness happening. Just a little bit as the salt crystals are being um, left behind as the water evaporates. Okay, so while that's happening, let's now just have a little look at the, um, look what, this is what some people do, and it's not, a, it's not a bad idea. What they actually do is they actually wash, they actually wash, they use a little bit more water, give it this a little bit of a swirl, and they wash the, They what? Oh. They wash that that sand. They wash the sand into the filter paper. Now, if you are going to do this activity absolutely perfectly and as accurately as you possibly can. You would then go on to actually um, evaporating this water as well because it will have a tiny, tiny little bit of salt left in it. But that would just take forever. So I'm just going to discard this water. I'm far more interested in what's going to be left behind in this filter paper, okay? Far more interested. And so I'm gonna have wet sand. I'm gonna have wet sand left behind in there. So any ideas what we can do with the wet sand in order to turn it into dry sand? Well, we could put it in the sun um, and let the sun evaporate the, the, the fresh water off it. 
and um, have just like um, dry sand behind. So I'll let the um, filtrate go through uh, and the residue will be wet sand and then we can actually put that out in the sun soon. Over here I'm looking and I'm seeing some salt crystals forming like so. Uh, this is actually quite a long activity, isn't it? Um, but a fantastic um, activity because it looks at so many different separation techniques. It looks at uh, what did we use first? Iron separation by iron um, or magnetism, separation by decanting, separation by filtering, and then separating by evaporation. So in the one activity, we're using four different um, separation techniques. How good is that? <laughs> Beautiful. And I can even, I wonder what would happen if I boost up the heat just a little bit more. Okay, that will, that will make it go even faster. Oh, but then it might bump and move around a little bit, which then, <laughs> and I have seen it, where a, a student, ha they've spent so much time, they've got it to this point, but then, oh, tips over, and uh, they've got, they've lost all their salty water, and so they actually can't get any decent results anymore. So, a little bit sad when you get to this point, and then it's like a bit of a failure. Someone might say it's a bit like watching paint dry. Mm. Yeah, possibly. Although I've never watched paint dry, so I wouldn't know. What about grass growing? Mm. Oh, this has made a big difference, actually. This is really speeding up the process. And I can see a really big ring of white salt crystals now. Oh, a little tiny bit. There's a little bit tiny of, like, grey colour, so it actually means that there's probably a tiny little bit of really small sand particles um, that we haven't been able to separate. Um, so our refining process is not 100%, but it is actually pretty good. And very soon, this is almost done. This is almost done. This is almost fully ev evaporated now. I'm talking like, oh, it's, it's finished. The water's, there's no more liquid there. So now I'm going to turn off the Bunsen burner. Turn off the Bunsen burner. And this is quite hot, but it will cool down rapidly. I know that for sure. It's quite hot, but it will cool down rapidly. And so let's pop this to the side. And I'm going to actually pull off the watch glass like this. Pop it there. And to make this a bit safer, I'm just going to pop the beaker there. Now, don't touch any of that with your hand because you'll burn yourself. Okay, it's quite hot. Now, let's have a go at weighing. Let's have a go at weighing the salt. Let's see. I'm going to get my little plate out and make sure it's dry and clean. Turn that on. Well, you know what? You know what I could actually use? I've actually got another aluminium pan. So I'm going to put the other aluminium pan on there. And tear. Okay. Let's turn it on again. Sometimes the button can be a little bit sticky, maybe. There we go, zeroed. Make sure my tweezers are nice and clean because, can you see that white crystalline powder? I need to try and collect that salt, okay? Not that easy, I can tell you. Hmm, I wonder if, you know what I, you know what would have been a better thing to do now that I'm thinking about it? Maybe I should have started thinking about it a bit earlier. 
and that is to actually weigh the watch glass, weigh the watch glass, and then actually re-weigh the watch glass. Now I'm just using the actual arm. No, it's turned off. That's not good. Oh, but I do have some fluffy white salt there, but I've also got some salt on the scales. So I want to collect that salt. Come on. All this is very important product. Aha. Yay. Look. Look at that. Look at that salt. Weighing that salt's the tricky part. Let's make sure I've got it all. Scrape, 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 scrape. Right. Now, definitely not getting it all because I can see that there's salt left behind, but that's actually quite difficult to get. So, hmm, what should I have done? What? Oh, no, 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 I just spilt my salt. Oh, man. And you're thinking to yourself, and this guy's teaching us? Hmm, all right, okay, I'm gonna can be a little bit of a clutch sometimes now. Just remove this lid so that I can tap, 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 tap. I think I've got it all. And now, but now, now I've got to go tear it again. No, I've put the wrong one on, haven't I? Pop that there, tear it again. Come on, put the salt on. Give me a reading. Come on, you can read it. Oh, there's not much salt. I can see it. But, but it's not registering. It's like the weight of it is, it's so light. It's so fluffy and light. That's the problem, it's not registering. Okay, so I'm going to have to put question mark, question mark, question mark for the weight of the salt. But I'm going to say you can definitely see the salt on that um, aluminium pan. And now I come over here and I've got my wet sand. So I've got salt. I mean, I've got iron filings. I've got salt and I've got wet sand. And if I put this in the sun and dry it, then I'll have dry sand and I will have accomplished what I aimed to set out, but I won't have accomplished very well the different masses. Very challenging to actually get those masses quite accurately. You've seen the struggles that I've been having, um, but maybe you're more patient than me. Maybe you've got more time and so uh, see how you go. I'll be very interested. Anyway, I hope hopefully um, you learnt a lot from this lesson. Um, I've enjoyed teaching you uh, this classic separation technique um, and if you're a patient person maybe you've got actually some masses or more patient than me then you've got some masses to um, work with as well. Okay all right well bye for now and I'm sure I'll see you in a future lesson. Bye. Uh, hello, it's uh, great to see you all again and uh, we are doing a chemistry course and in this lesson we're going to be investigating copper sulfate. Now copper sulfate is blue and it's a crystalline solid. So how about we put on our safety glasses straight away um, because copper sulfate is actually quite dangerous to the eyes. Now I'm just going to give mine a little, my glasses a little bit of a wipe with my shirt. So that, ah, beautiful. Now I can see you better. <laughs> anyway, um, what do I do? I want the white plate or the watch glass. I think I'll use the white plate and I'm going to just sprinkle a little bit of copper sulfate powder. Now, Yours, your sample might be more crystalline than mine. I can see mine's actually a fine powder and 
What that means is that the crystal of copper sulfate have actually been crushed because copper sulfate actually does form crystals, which we're going to see later. So, in fact, very difficult. I wouldn't even bother drawing what I see in front of me now. Maybe later on, once we've crystallized some, that's when I'll draw it. So, going to learn a new technique today of um, heating something in a test tube. So let's get our Bunsen burners ready and let's knock him plenty of gas, pop him down. Great. I don't need my tripod. I do need a um, test tube and I need the peg. Now the, the test tube only just fits in that wooden peg. It's a tight fit. If your peg happens to break apart, you can put the metal, um, I guess the metal spring back into place and your peg will be all right again. So hopefully you won't have, hopefully you'll be able to just hold it like that. It's important that you're able to hold the test tube with a wooden peg. And then we're going to get about three, three spoons? No, I think two spoons, two good sized spoons of the copper sulfate. So, one, yeah, I think two should do it. Two, there we go. Yeah, that looks good. Two spoons, looks fantastic. Now put the lid back on to the copper sulfate and put the copper sulfate back. Oh, I'm looking at the formula here. CuSO4, CuSO4, and then it says 5H2O. That's interesting. That's because copper sulfate, the blue copper sulfate, um, each, I won't say molecule, but for every um, ion of copper and every ion of sulfate, there's actually five water molecules blended in. So hydrated copper sulfate this is, hydrated copper sulfate. Okay, I'll put the spoon back and I'll put the, that there and I'm going to light the match and then light my Bunsen burner. Very good, very good. And a gentle flame is best. Okay, gentle flame is best. Now when we heat something in a test tube, there's a few important things to remember. Number one, something could come out quite suddenly and so never point it at yourself or at your friend or your brother or sister or your parent or whatever. You always point it away from people. Always wear your glasses. And remember the, the hottest part of the flame is actually the top of that inner blue cone. And so that's sort of where I'm gonna do my heating. And then very, very importantly, I'm going to keep a constant motion. See this, wiggle, 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 wiggle. wiggle. Sometimes people might say, do little stirring actions. But for this small equipment, a little wiggle wiggle, and I'm actually hearing some type of crackling already, and I can actually observe a bit of um, mistiness on the inside. That mistiness is water that is condensing on the inside of that glass tube. So basically, remember how I mentioned a moment ago that the copper sulfate formula was CuSO4 5H2O, and that for every copper ion and sulfate ion, that it was surrounded by five molecules of water. Well, by heating it, by heating it, we're actually driving off, we're actually driving off that water. So we're, we're dehydrating, we're dehydrating the copper sulfate. Now, before the copper sulfate was actually moving around a little bit, but now it's sort of has stopped moving, like it's sort of gone into a little bit of a lump. Um, and so this is where I'm being quite careful. Trying not, I don't want to crack the test tube, you see. Now I can actually see a change of color, change of color. So, and I can actually see some type of smoke, and but I think it's moisture coming out. I think it's actually moisture coming out as it, as this is actually getting quite hot now. Okay, so because it's not moving around, what that means is it's only, most of the heat is actually acting on the outside of that 
that lump of copper sulfate now but it's changing it's changing to white there's no doubt about it the the blue the blue is definitely changing to white now if it was continuing to move around I'd be happier about that but it's just whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, oh that scared me there was sort of a sudden eruption oh, I know I know exactly what's happened here I think have I cracked the test tube there seems to be some oh no that I oh, oh wow yeah I oh that scared me I know what happened the bottom of the test tube is getting very, very hot. Water droplets actually rolled down the inside and a big water droplet got suddenly heated up by the glass tube and, and sort of, and, and, oh, my Bunsen burner went off. Oh, so that was a little bit nerve wracking, wasn't it? <laughs> That's why we always wear safety glasses. And that's why we don't point the test tube at anybody. So, because the unexpected does happen. Okay, the unexpected does happen, like it just happened then. Oh, this is really getting hot now. Woo, I see a bit of a yellowy glow. Here comes the steam. You can seem a bit nervous, okay? Remember, if you do burn yourself, wash your burn under cold water, okay? You know what? Oh, and the bottom of the test tube is glowing red. I'm going to call it. That's it. I'm just going to call it there. I'm going to say that's as, that's as far as I want to go with this little activity. I wonder if I can... Oh, out comes some water. Now, that's hot. Don't touch it. Oh, come on. Come on, I've got some blue copper sulfate that just came out there, but can I get that? Oh, here it comes. It's coming down now. I'm careful not to. Yep, yep. Oh, it's a lump. I wonder if I can just use my tweezers to get that last little bit out. Let's have a look. There we go. Look, got it. Now, what do I do with this? So this is gonna still be quite hot. And can you see, can you see that the copper sulfate has gone white? That's actually called anhydrous, anhydrous copper sulfate. You've driven off the water molecules. And in actual fact, copper sulfate is not actually blue. Copper sulfate is actually white, but when you add the water, it becomes copper um, pentahydrate, and that is blue. So what would happen if we put the water back in? That's a good question, isn't it? Okay, so I'm going to pop the copper sulfate back in, like that, and there's another lump. Now it's cooled down enough the test tube has cooled down enough, I believe it's cooled down enough, for me to actually add a little bit of water. Oh, there was a sizzle there, so it, there was a bit of heat. But have a look, it's gone back to blue as I rehydrated the copper sulfate. So, lovely. Now, in a beaker, I'm actually going to now collect... I'm actually now going to collect all the copper sulfate that I've sort of got on the table around me, like this. And, oh, we definitely want, we don't want anhydrous copper sulfate around, okay? That's not good. I want a little bit more water in there, just a little bit. I actually want to dissolve all the copper sulfate that I've got around. Okay, so now I'm sort of collecting all the bits of copper sulfate that I've got around on my table. In you go. Are you laughing because half of it's gone onto the table? 
Okay. There we go. And let's pull that into here. And I'm going to show you another technique, actually. All right. Another technique, and that is how to stir. How to stir a liquid or a mixture in a test tube. How do you stir? Because you can't stick a stirring rod down there. So you, f you grasp the test tube firmly between two fingers like that. And then you get your, this finger here, I think it's the in index finger. Some people call it the nose picking finger. Uh, and you sort of like tap, 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 tap. That's actually a very, very good way. That's an excellent way to mix the liquid in a test tube. You don't put your thumb on it and shake it up and down because you'll end up with copper sulfate solution on your thumb, which is not great. Okay, so I'm mixing, 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 mixing. That is fantastic. And what might I do? You know what? I might just put the test tube in the beaker there like for now because I actually want to evaporate. I want to evaporate that. Now I want to evaporate it carefully and gently. And so you know what to do. We need to set up a water bath like we evaporated the um, salt water before. So, beautiful. Light the Bunsen. Need the wire gauze. Need another beaker with fresh water. Like that. Whoop. Okay, well that's really blasting up, isn't it? That will heat up very, very rapidly. And I need the watch glass. Let me just move that back into the center. All good, lovely. Put my watch glass on there. Give my copper sulfate a final little mix. Might as well dissolve it really well because this is going to take a little bit of time to heat up anyway. See that? Wonderful. Mix, 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 mix. And I'm now going to pour that on there like that. And, okay, that's looking pretty good. There's a little bit of a tilt on my watch glass, which probably means, my guess is that one of these tripod legs, that leg there could actually go out a little bit further to lower it. It's not perfectly level. So later on, I might actually try and force the, the leg um, so that, that side of the tripod goes down. You can make little adjustments uh, to your equipment uh, for it to work better. Um, I give you permission. Okay. You can't, don't want to pull the legs apart too far though because if you put the tripod back in, uh, you might have difficulty closing the lid. So, got to be a bit careful with that. The tripods are actually made uh, by a local manufacturer in Australia. Um, he uses a computer numerically controlled plasma cutter to cut triangles out of steel plate. And then he actually um, cuts nails and fits the nails in and then he welds, welds the nails in and then he grinds the top off and then he polishes them. So those, those tripods are made with a lot of care, I can absolutely assure you. But now beautiful is this, eh? Isn't this nice? A beautiful copper sulfate um, solution being heated. Well, it's actually being heated, not gently. Okay, not gently. Uh, because look at look at that boiling. Like that's this is going to be a fairly fast process. This evaporation. Now, someone might say, and it'd be a very very good question. Why don't you just put the copper sulfate solution in the bottom beaker and then just boil that? 
wouldn't that evaporate it a lot quicker? And the answer is yes, it would. But the problem is, as it's more and more concentrated, if you're heating it directly, it actually starts spitting. <laughs> it spits and it spits out all the copper sulfate and you make a big mess. This is real. This is a really nice way of um, evaporating it. You don't actually. It won't actually spit. And in actual fact, it will actually allow the copper sulfate to start forming some crystals. Now, the crystals are actually going to be very, very small doing it this way, because in actual fact, the quicker you evaporate it, the smaller the crystals. Right? The quicker you evaporate it, the smaller the crystals. And so if you can evaporate it very slowly over a long period of time, the crystal growth will actually, um, well, you'll actually grow much larger crystals. And so once you've got a con concentrated solution, it might even be best to put a bit of, turn it off, put a bit of aluminium foil over sometimes. That's what I've heard some people do. And they put it just in a warm place. Although won't the copper sulfur, won't the aluminium foil stop the water from evaporating? Hmm, good question. I think it will. So maybe just put the plate in a warm place and a bit of a lid near it so that dust can't fall in. Oh. Let me bump up the power there. And another way to ensure you get good crystal growth is that you actually seed it. You actually seed the concentrated solution with a small little crystal. Ever had honey on a cold winter's day and you've gone to get the honey and you've found that it's all like um, crystallized out? Often what will happen is a little crystal of honey is formed and it drops into the liquid honey and then from that, that little seed crystal of honey, the, the honey actually crystallizes. So look at that. That is absolutely beautiful. Uh, and I'll come back. I should watch this, but I'm going to come back in a few minutes to watch it. Okay. All right. So it is pretty close. Looks like most of the... Oh, it's very, very close. And see it's almost fully evaporated so the water has been driven off that the water that the copper sulfate was dissolved in has been driven off and it's more definitely more crystalline there's no doubt about it I might actually just turn off the heat now okay turn off the heat now and have a look have a look at that. See? Slightly more crystalline. It's definitely not powdered anymore. Okay, it's definitely not powdered anymore. This is what I'd be attempting to draw. Now, if you've, if you've used like clean glassware, which you should be using, this copper sulfate is still good. And so you could actually collect this. Um, would I put it back into this glass jar? Mm, probably not, but I'd probably, I'd probably store it. Uh, good question. Should you store it in a little plastic bag? As long as you had a good label on it that said, you know, um, you'd have the same safety label, like a, a warning on it, and also the exclamation mark saying toxic um, and bad for the environment, your GHS symbols. Okay, so, well, that's how we investigate copper sulfate. Um, we learn about, what did we learn? Uh, evaporation, um, how to heat safely and properly in a test tube, and also how to stir a mixture in a test tube. So we learned a number of skills, learned about copper sulfate, uh, redid another evaporation process. So, and crystallization, I'll, I'll put it to you that crystallization uh, is also a way that you can use to separate two different salts. 
and that is sometimes well, two, two different, um, uh, we'll call them chemical compounds. That is that if you've got like table salt and copper sulfate mixed together, if you dissolve them both in water and then sort of crystalline them, one of them will actually form crystals before the other and you can actually separate those crystals off and that's actually a form of physical separation as well. So separization, separation <laughs> by crystallization. Okay, thanks for joining me today and uh, hope, hopefully you've stayed safe and had an interesting time and I look forward to seeing you very soon. Bye for now. Hey everyone, in this lesson we're going to be investigating a mystery reaction product. And so you'll need your chemistry set and you'll need some bicarb soda. Now I've probably got about 10,000 times more bicarb soda than I need and probably about a, I don't know, a couple, a hundred times more vinegar than I need. You don't need much at all for this um, lesson. So grab out the 10 mil beaker, maybe put it on your heat proof mat. And we need to put um, five mil of vinegar, or approximately five mil of vinegar into this beaker. Now, if you needed to measure it out accurately, then you'd use your measuring cylinder, but this doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. Basically, uh, half full, okay? Vinegar is a clear, colorless liquid. And you also need to have some bicarb soda and need to put a spoon of bicarb in. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put some of the bicarb in this mortar and pestle as a little bit of a storage. Well, actually, you know what? Oh, it's a little bit lumpy. It's a little bit lumpy, so I could actually do a little bit of um, grinding. Okay, so I could actually go grind. There we go. Turning it from lumpiness into powderiness. That's not a word. There we go. There we go. Beautiful. Okay. Mortar and pestle. And whoop, just sweep that off a bit. And <laughs> grab my tiny spoon. And I'm going to put a spoon of bicarb into the vinegar, which most people know is what's going to happen. This is like the classic um, primary school volcano where, oh, oh, whoops, a daisy. <laughs> That was, <laughs> that was maybe a bit too much. Okay, so we definitely got uh, lots of gas produced. And look, uh, lots of gas produced. In fact, so much gas it sort of erupted over. And I'm going to give this a little bit of a stir. And the chemical reaction is still occurring. How do I know it's a chemical reaction? Because a new substance is being produced. And that substance is a gas. Uh, do you know what gas it is? I do. I'll give you some hints. It's denser than air. It is partly responsible for global warming. It's produced by power stations when you burn fossil fuels. It's carbon dioxide. Now, I'm going to add another spoon. Now, of bicarb soda. Do you think the exact same thing is going to happen? Let's have a look. Oh! Yeah, we had, a, we had gas produced, but it certainly didn't fizz up as much, did it? Let's go again. What about one more, hey? No, oh, it's still fizzy. It's still fizzing. Let's see if we can dissolve it. Okay. Do you think we can just keep adding, adding, adding bicarb soda? Uh, and it will always fizz. Do you think the reaction will... Oh! That's about it. No, there is a limit. There is a limit to this chemical reaction. Okay? And the limiting factor is the acidic vinegar in this case. Now basically, I've used up all the vinegar, all the acidic component of the vinegar. Now... You can see it's a fairly clear liquid up top, and now it's sort of settling. I see a little bit of undissolved substance. But the question is, 
hmm, have we made a new substance? Well, anyway, we'll talk about what this chemical reaction actually is. The chemical reaction is vinegar, or the word equation, is vinegar plus bicarbonate of soda, okay, or sometimes people call it, well, sodium bicarbonate is the better name, sodium bicarbonate, produces carbon dioxide gas, water, and a chemical called sodium acetate. And to see that chemical sodium acetate, how are we going to get it from the liquid? Any ideas? You should know by now. <laughs> you should know how we're going to get it. We're going to evaporate some of it. No, not more evaporation. Yes, more evaporation. Wee, I love evaporation. So what are we gonna need? We need a water bath. Yay, that's right. <laughs> so, a um, couple of mil, and I'm gonna get this, I'm gonna get this blasting. And we're not going to evaporate much, okay? But I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this one blast away. Let's, let's get the goggles on. Let's light the match. Zoop, zoop, okay. Oh, she's blasting away, all right. Let's get this water boiling. Okay, that is not going to take long at all. Whew. Let's get a watch glass. Let's get a watch glass. And I'm gonna use a plastic pipette. And look, this time around, we're not actually going to evaporate much at all. Okay, this is not gonna take a long time. I don't know, maybe about 10 drops or something like that. I think that will do. Okay, 10 drops or something like that. Now, something that you could do, and I'll tell you what you could do. Um, it'd be great if you could taste that, but there's a, there's a few reasons why you can't taste, why you shouldn't taste that. Number one, it's been done in a chemistry beaker. It's been stirred with a stirring rod. Uh, the bicarbs come out of the um, mortar and pestle. We don't know what chemicals it's been in contact with, so you definitely should not be tasting that. However, the vinegar has come from my kitchen cupboard. The bicarb has come from my kitchen cupboard. So why don't you go get a glass? Okay, go get a glass, put a little bit of vinegar in it, taste the vinegar. It's going to taste quite sour. Why don't you put your finger, clean your finger, put a little tiny spoon in, not one of this spoon, but a spoon, a teaspoon, and have a taste of the bicarb soda. A little bit's not going to kill you, uh, and it's gonna taste quite bitter. Then you can react the two in a normal drinking glass. Stir it up, you'll get the same fizziness and all the rest of it, and you'll be able to actually taste the um, product. And I can tell you, I'll tell you now, I'm pretty sure it will actually taste salty. I'm pretty sure it will taste salty. So, <clears throat> In fact, sodium acetate is a type of salt. And look, <laughs> it didn't take long, did it, this time? Look at this blasting away. Woo! Fantastic. That is not going to... It's like a steam train. You know, they, you can really get a lot of heat out of these um, Bunsen burners, can't you? Quite powerful indeed. Choo-choo, choo-choo. Look at that steam coming out. Um... Okay, remember you have to be careful that you don't actually evaporate all of that water in that beaker because it will go dry and then you're going to end up with a cracked beaker and that's not very good at all. So let this boil away while I just talk about the next thing. Um, what is boiling? Boiling! Boiling is when the liquid is heated to a temperature that the particles actually start flying off and so uh, boiling is the, the point where, um, what shall we say, the liquid turns into a gas with heat. Evaporation, okay, evaporation is when the, the particles leave the liquid and they turn into a gas. So that, that, that's really what evaporation is. It's the fact where the, the, the solvent, uh, solvent particles leave the liquid when it's boiling uh, and that's called evaporation. Crystallization is when the solute, okay, the thing that you've dissolved, actually starts turning into a solid, um, coming out of the solution, usually in like 
a crystalline form. And if you want to grow crystals, we actually just um, talked about it in a previous lesson, but you would get a concentrated solution of maybe copper sulfate or sugar or table salt. Um, there's lots of different chemicals that you can actually make a concentrated um, solution out of. And you need to do evaporation and you need to do the evaporation slowly, slowly so that the crystals form. Now our mystery product, product, which is sodium acetate, has now formed, okay, well not formed, but has crystallized, I'll just turn this off now, the sodium acetate has crystallized on this plate. That is sodium acetate. It's a new substance formed from the chemical reaction of the bicarb soda with the vinegar. And we've evaporated it and it's formed a crust of sodium acetate. Well, that's it for this lesson. All the best with uh, making your own crystals. Um, yeah, maybe if you want to post them up on um, the social media, uh, tag Tiny Science Lab in it, and I can see some of your wonderful crystals that you've grown. All right, it's been uh, good to see you, and I look forward to uh, the next science lesson together. Bye for now. Hey everyone, thanks for joining me this lesson. We are going to be looking at a very interesting separation process called distillation. Now, have you ever wondered how, you know, companies that sell bottles of eucalyptus oil, where they get the eucalyptus oil from? Well, they get it from the leaves. And today I'm going to show you the process which they use to actually extract it or separate it from gum leaves. Now, you'll need your chemistry set uh, with your rubber hose. Um, you'll need some scissors, some gum leaves, and if you can, maybe a stainless steel straw. Now, this is not, um, you don't 100% need this, but it might make it helpful, and it would particularly make it helpful if you can get the rubber tube over the straw. Now, I have actually been trying and I'm sort of struggling with it. So even if you do get a um, stainless steel um, straw, that doesn't necessarily mean you'll be able to use it anyway because, although I've had an idea. I've had an idea, people. Wait up, wait up. Ah, I'll tell you my idea. I bought this dish drying rack from Aldi uh, where I grabbed a couple of trumpets as well on my way out. And if I open this up and cut this like that, and oh, look at that, it's a beautiful um, drying rack. But I think if I pull out one of these metal tubes, um, that's actually not a bad metal tube. Now, sometimes people ask me, Mr. Strickling, where do you get all this stuff from? Well, you know, sometimes you've got to be a little bit clever. Now, ah, oh, it's exactly the same diameter. I'm going to have the exact same problem. I was actually hoping that maybe, maybe just maybe, I could actually put this tube inside the steel. So for now, I might actually not use the steel at all and see if I can do this distillation without it. So, okay, what are we going to need to do? The first thing, you need your uh, mortar, get your scissors, and we need to cut the leaves up into as finer pieces as possible. So I'm just going to put them into four layers like that, because we have to crush the cells. Okay, so to start, to start the extraction process of getting the oil out, well, we actually have to crush the cells. And this, what we're actually doing here is using the scissors is actually a bit like if you take food into your mouth and you use your front teeth to cut up. So pretend these scissors are my front teeth and I'm like slicing through my food with my front teeth. Now, once you've, once you've, you know, sort of cut 
the food with your front teeth, what do you do then? Hey, to start extract, to continue the extraction process. Then you start grinding them with your back molars, yeah? Well, how about we do that? Let's get our uh, pestle and start grinding, grinding these leaves. Ooh. And straight away, I can actually smell quite a strong um, smell of sort of like a eucalypt. There we go. Grind, 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 grind. Okay, that's probably not too bad, actually. So that might actually do it. Then we'll get a conical flask and we have to start putting as much of that um, shredded, crushed up leaves, okay, as much as you can, into the conical flask. Beautiful. In we go. I might even use the tweezers to push it down in there. Okay, the, the more you can get it like towards the bottom, the better. Okay, so let's get a bit more. The more the merrier. And we're going to be heating. We're going to be heating up this conical flask because eucalyptus oil is a liquid and it will boil when it reaches a certain temperature. So we're hoping to actually boil off the uh, eucalyptus oil, which is called evaporation. Now, so far, every time we've done an evaporation, the liquid that we've boiled off actually just goes off into the air. Well, we want a process where we can capture that um, evaporated liquid. And when you capture that evaporated liquid, that process is called distillation. Distillation. So that's actually not too bad. Now, remember what I've said a hundred times, a hundred times, when you're heating up that water in the beaker? And what have I kept saying? Don't boil a dry beaker. Well, the same thing goes for the conical flask. Don't boil a dry conical flask. So what do we need to do? I'm just cleaning up my mess here. Uh, I've got a bin down here. Uh, we need to actually put a bit of water. We actually need to put a bit of water into this conical flask. So how much? That's a good question. Mm, I reckon, oh, I think, that's a better word than reckon. I think maybe Mm, two mil. There we go. Two mil. And then, we haven't used this before, but this is our uh, rubber tube, not rubber tube, rubber stopper and glass rod. And we're going to fit that on. Now that has to be pushed on fairly firmly, but always push the rubber stopper. Don't push the glass tube. The rubber stopper needs to be pushed in, squeezed in quite well. That's, that's wonderful. I'm actually going to put my goggles on right now. So should you if you don't have them on already. And then the next step is I'm going to put the tube on there like that. Now I think this might work. I actually think this might work. So I need to get a beaker, make sure it's a dry beaker. And this is going to sit here. Whoa. That tips out. All right, so I might have to hold that like that. Okay, all right. We're on our way, people. We're on our way. What will stop that from tipping over? Maybe. Maybe if I just pop it in. Ooh, will that work? No. Hmm. Any ideas? Well, I can just lock light like that for now. Let's get our con our heating apparatus ready. Here we go. Bunsen burner. Heat proof mat. Yes, you'll need your tripod. Yes, you'll need your white gauze. And yes, you will need a retort stand. And I'm going to put in the blue fitting. 
and I'm going to get my peg and I'm going to see if I can hold the oh, if this all works I'll be very very happy I'll be a very happy inventor will you go in there like that oh ooh. come on please 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 will you clip in Let's slide this back there. <gasps> Ooh. Where is the, I don't know if I bring that down there like that. Ta da! That's very exciting. Oh, look. I love it. Oh. If I bring that down there, I can tell you, science teachers would be very excited to be seeing this. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Oh, so good. Okay, so you know what? I'm actually ready to roll. So let's light the match and then I'll talk you a bit more through it. Okay. So, firstly, once we actually start this boiling, we actually need to take get the temperature right down. So this is the beauty of this retort stand. I, I can actually bring that down. I'm going to get it fairly hot fairly quickly. Alright, I'm going to get the temperature up pretty quickly, but then I'm going to like back off totally. Okay, this is quite crucial and I'll explain why. So I'm getting some heat into here. I'm going to have to take a photo of this. This is absolutely beautiful. Oh, I like this so much. It's actually unique. Uh, using equipment like this is actually quite unique. I can see this boiling now. And so now I'm actually going to like back the heat off. And I can actually raise this up. This is now where patience has to come in. Oh, I need to get the heat well away from it. There we go. I only want a really gentle boil, okay, a really, really gentle boil. And the idea is that the, oh, 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 no, 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 wait, that's way too much heat. Okay, that's all right, I've got it back, going back down into it, that's good. That's a good thing. Problem is, when it boils like that, all you're doing is getting a whole bunch of water going up the tube, okay, which is not what I want at all. So I want that point where it's just really gently boiling, which is about there. I, ooh, I need to go a bit higher probably. Oh, I like it. That is so nice. I'm gonna turn that heat down a little tiny bit. That's, oh, that's probably even still too intense. I'm gonna take the heat away again <laughs> and get that liquid back in. Okay, so but all this process is actually helping to remove the oil from the leaves. Now I just want the oil to boil off, okay, not the water. So see how I'm actively engaged here. Now this would be a good job for two people, that's for sure. This would be good for, great for teamwork. Okay, and now I'm now I'm prepared to condense. Now I'm prepared. Ooh, yeah. Okay. All right. I'm prepared to condense whatever comes out now. I think this is good. Gentle, gentle, gentle. Oh, this will make a magnificent photo. Come on. Now I want my steam to come up, or my, my evaporated oil to come up. And then I want it to condense in this tube. That's what the stainless steel was for, the tube. The tube, that stainless steel tube was to actually help the condensation process. But a nice long tube like this will be probably suffice to cool down the, the oil. 
the gaseous oil. Alright, now it's going a little bit slower than I hope, so I might just bring the heat, bring that down. Again, I don't want it too vigorous. Come on. Come on, send up. Send up some oil. I've got a drop coming through yet. Oh, come on. I can see a drop wanting to come out of this other end. Yeah. Yay! Look! Look at that! Mmm. <gasps> it's like an essential oil, but eucalyptus. Look at that. Mmm. Absolutely delicious. We have just distilled some eucalyptus oil. Hey? Now, how good is that? <laughs> Oh, did you have success? Oh, I hope so. Wonderful. Um, and then not only can you do eucalyptus oil, oops, sorry, you could actually do it with like lemon skin and get some citrus, citric oil. And if you really want to do something that's very, very interesting, well, then you can actually distill some ethanol. Now, you get a plastic cup, which is a third full of warm water. Put in a good teaspoon of sugar, uh, maybe a quarter of a teaspoon of yeast, and the yeast in these satchels I've found the best yeast. The Tandaco dry yeast is very, very good. Stir it up, put it in a warm place overnight, and the yeast cells will actually produce ethanol through a process called fermentation, and then you can actually distill the ethanol and the very small amount of ethanol that you produce may be flammable so you might be able to put a match to it and get it to burn. Well, I hope you enjoyed this separation process by distillation as much as I enjoyed making it for you and uh, I look forward to seeing you uh, very soon. Bye for now. Hey everyone. In this lesson, we're going to be looking at something called fractional distillation. Now, it is a theoretical lesson, it's not hands-on, but fractional distillation is such an important separation technique um, that I thought I'd just have to actually show it to you, bring it to you. Now, what do you think all these things have in common? Um, what's this? Propane gas uh, used for barbecues. The butane gas used for your um, Bunsen burners. Uh, candles. Uh, petrol for your car and lawnmower. Uh, kerosene, which is actually used um, for aeroplane fuel. Uh, lubricating oils. And, hmm. and even bitumen, uh, the black tarry substance that they use to build roads. Well... They're all flammable, they're all flammable, but they all come from this stuff. This is crude oil. Well, it's actually just um, pancake syrup. But anyway, let's pretend it's crude oil and that it's been pumped up out of the ground. Well, basically crude oil contains all of these different substances. And how do you separate it? into all of these substances, well, through fractional distillation. And that is, you actually put it in a, a chamber and actually start heat it up. And when you heat it up, um, at about 25 degrees Celsius, gases come off. And those gases are actually the methane, ethane, and propane. And they rise to the top and then you actually cool and you distill those off. And that's how you get your gases. Then at about ooh, 25 to 60 degrees Celsius, that's where petrol actually comes and boils off. 60 to 180 degrees, 
is uh, naphtha um, and paraffin and kerosene, 180 to 220 degrees Celsius. Uh, diesel, diesel oil starts boiling off at 230. Um, I'm looking at the numbers here, <laughs> 230 to 250 degrees. Uh, like heavier base fuel oils, which are used in like ships, um, comes off at about 280 to 300 degrees Celsius. And then um, lubricating oils uh, will boil off at about 300 to 350 degrees Celsius. And then you're left with this tarry substance, bitumen, which then boils off at 360 degrees Celsius. So absolutely, um, fractional distillation is absolutely crucial to producing um, all these what we call hydrocarbons. And these hydrocarbons um, have been uh, and will continue to be a very important part of our lives. So that's fractional distillation. Hey everyone, in this lesson we're going to be looking at a separation process called chromatography. Now I've got four beakers here and um, first, second, third beaker I've put water in and I'll just put just plain water into this fourth beaker and so you won't have four beakers, um, well it's unlikely you'll have four beakers, but you can, you know, you can repeat this with single beakers or you could even use larger glasses. Uh, you'll need um, filter paper. Now again, you might be running out of filter paper. There's other options. Um, you can probably use like, um, what's it, paper towel? You can't use like photocopy paper because Photocopy paper doesn't really absorb water very well. You've got to use a paper that is good at absorbing water. And you need some food colouring. So I'm going to get this piece of um, filter paper, which I've cut what's called a wick out of, and I'm going to put it into that beaker there. And then I'm going to get some food colouring. This one's green. And I'm going to put a drop one, two drops, two drops of food colouring right there in the centre. And then how about I get that one there. And I'm going to get some blue food colouring and put the blue food colouring there. And then the yellow one, I'll do this. I'll put the wick into the water and I'll get the yellow food coloring. I'll put two drops actually. And finally, let me just show you how I made the, um, the filter paper. Basically, I just got a round filter paper, a pair of scissors, and I cut a line to the middle and then a second line to the middle just next to it. So a little bit of a triangle shape like that, a little bit of a triangle shape, and then I folded that down and I'm calling that the wick because the water will travel up there via capillary action and oh now I've got red food colouring. <laughs> no, that's not going to come out. I'm not going to have another one of those accidents. So take that little nozzle off and get the oh, like this now what's interesting is um, I do incursions with um, primary schools and home school groups where I use quite a lot of food coloring and so I buy in the larger bottles and then dilute it and what's interesting is um, I found a quite difficult to buy the green food coloring lately and I've got a suspicion um, maybe why I've found it difficult to find and the reason is happening before my very eyes right now you see the red um, food coloring it's just traveling outwards okay you can see the red food coloring traveling outwards there 
that as water is being drawn up into the paper and then is spreading out, it's taking the food colouring particles with it. And so in actual fact, the drop of food colouring is now around the outside as it's travelling out and it's being replaced by the clear colourless water here in the centre. And a similar thing is happening with the yellow. The yellow food colouring particles are travelling outwards, um, being replaced by the clear colourless water. The blue, uh, the blue particles are travelling outwards uh, and are being replaced by the clear colourless water. But have a look at this one. This was the green food colouring. And can you see the green food colouring is travelling outwards, but in actual fact there's a blue, there's a blue ring on the outside, then there's a green middle, and then there's a yellow inside. That's giving me a hint that green food colouring is actually, is actually a mixture of blue and yellow. And this is, these two here are indicative of what's going on. Because, yes, I put the blue one on first and so I would expect it to have gone further out. But then I put the yellow one on quite shortly after. And you can see that the blue one has actually travelled out a lot further than the yellow one. This is telling me that the blue particles actually travel faster through that paper than the yellow particles. My guess is that the blue particles are actually smaller. The blue dye particles are actually smaller than the yellow particles. The yellow particles are actually bigger. And so the blue ones travel faster through the paper. That's my guess. And this is one I prepared earlier for the, the green. And as you can see, very, very clearly, the green food colouring is made up of yellow and blue which is maybe why they don't sell the large green ones because maybe they say, well, if you want green, all you need to do is combine the yellow and the blue. So you could turn this into an experiment by actually investigating um, more um, dyes and textures. So you could actually have a whole range of different colored textures and actually try a whole lot of different textures and see maybe what um, different inks make up different colours. Um, I know that this process is used in forensic, forensics, uh, that's the science of solving um, crime, where they might, uh, detectives might find handwritten notes uh, written with pen, and they want to see whether that note written in pen matches a particular pen uh, from, uh, you know, from a, a culprit well, not a culprit, but a, a suspect. And so they use chromatography to compare the two inks to see if they're the, the same two inks. Well, and, you, and you can turn this into an experiment by actually trialling different paper um, and finding out which type of paper actually works best for chromatography. But there you go. There's another um, separation by what's called a physical process, chromatography. And it's to do with the speed that particles travel through um, different substances. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this lesson and I hope that you are doing some chromatography yourself and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now. Hey everyone, in today's lesson we're looking at another separating technique called centrifugation. Now your blood, um, when you bleed, well it looks red, right? Well, it looks red because it's made up of, of a lot of red blood cells. But blood is not just red blood cells. Blood also contains like a, a liquidy component, which is called plasma. And there's also a small amount of white blood cells and there's platelets and there's some other <laughs> bits and pieces in your blood as well. Now, if you put a sample of your blood into a test tube, and then put that test tube into what's called a centrifuge machine. And the centrifuge machine spins really, really, really fast. And what happens is that the heavier components of that mixture actually find themselves traveling towards the bottom of that test tube. 
And after a few minutes in the centrifuge, when you pull out the blood sample, you'll see a, a bottom layer of red blood cells, you'll see a little bit of white blood cells, and then you'll see this, um, it's not quite clear, but it's this yellowy, clearish liquid, which is plasma. So that's one way that you can actually separate blood into its constituent components, centrifugation. Now you can also um, put cream into, uh, well not cream, but uh, whole milk from the cow into a centrifuge and the whole milk will separate into, um, you know, the, I guess you'd call it the low fat milk and then you'd have the, the cream on the top. You might even have a centrifuge in your kitchen. It's a salad bowl, um, looks a bit like a salad bowl. You put a, a lettuce in it and then you pull this string and it's and the, the water gets thrown out. Or even in your washing machine, um, at the end of the, the washing cycle, particularly if you've got a front loader, it spins around super, super quick and it, uh, the water is thrown out and um, it separates the water from the clothes. So centrifugation is all about spinning something and <laughs> allowing the heavier component to sort of like fly off. Now I've actually made um, a, a little centrifuge device here. Doesn't look like much, does it? But it's actually quite exciting. Um, so it's a piece of cardboard, which I've put uh, two holes. Okay, two holes here. I've actually put four holes, but I've only used two of the holes. And I've put some builder's line through it. I've put some builder's line through it. And then I've actually um, got these two just handles. And these are just copper pipe, but you could use like sticks or something like that. And then what I did was I sort of wound it up a little bit. So you can actually see that that string is like twisted together. Because when I pull these apart, something very exciting is going to happen. You look. Are you ready? Come on. Well, that's not exciting. <laughs> wind up oh, okay looks like I actually have to I actually have to like wind it up myself before I can do this so if I go around like this round 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 <laughs> will this work Once I've got to get this going Ooh, here we go pull I'm winding it up okay I think this is going to work now whoa Look at that. And you'll be able to hear how fast it's spinning. Here we go. Wow. Look how fast I can get this spinning machine going. Now this was actually fairly easy for me to make because I've got a giant laser cutter. <laughs> um, it actually be quite complex, to actually, I think quite difficult to cut around a perfectly round piece of cardboard and to put the holes right in the center. Because if it's not perfectly round, if the holes are not quite in the center, you're going to get like all sort of imbalances. Now, how can this be used ah! as a centrifuge machine? Well, let me show you. I've got some like muddy water here and I might just give it a little bit of a stir. Okay, might give it a bit of a stir, get my Stirring right out, just give it a stir like this. And over time, this will actually settle as the larger particles um, uh, sort of like sink quicker due to gravity. Um, and so the larger particles will settle and we'll be left with more of a clear colorless um, solution up the top. Now, I guess centrifugation just speeds up the settling process. Now I've got two test tubes. And I'm going to actually, here's my two test tubes. I'm going to put a sample of this muddy water in each one, like this. Now I need to have it as close as possible because I'm going to put these, attach these with sticky tape to my paper fuse or cardboard fuse. It's my centrifuge, my homemade centrifuge. And so to avoid like, real imbalances I need to make sure that they're weighted quite similar and there we go that feels quite good so I've got two 
I mean, it might be better to have four, but anyway, I'm just gonna go with two. And then, got some sticky tape. And I need to put that facing outwards, like that. And let's stick that on there like that. Will this work? Okay, so the sticky tape is on really quite well now. Holding that test tube in place, yeah. Now I need to have the other one, but I'm actually, I'm going to put it like there, but I'm actually going to put it on the other side. Okay, I'm gonna put it on the other side to attempt, to attempt to sort of make sure that the thing is as balanced as possible. All right. I mean, what could go wrong though? I mean, it's just glass tubing spinning around at a thousand times a second. Or maybe not a thousand times a second, but I think you can actually get these things up to a very high speed. Absolutely perfect. Okay, I just put my safety goggles on, just in case. What do we think? What do we think? Jacob's homemade centrifuge. Oh, can you see I'm a little bit nervous? <laughs> I always get nervous, don't I? Ooh. Oh. It's not going as fast as I would have liked. And like wind it up a bit more. Are you sort of worried about the glass and the um, sticky tape and it all holding together? Because that's exactly what I'm worried about too. <laughs> oh, windy, 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 windy. Oh, am I getting any any type of effect yet? No, not really. In actual fact, I don't think test tubes are actually going to be the best thing for this. And so I've actually ordered, I've actually ordered um, tiny little centrifuge plastic tubey things. Um, this is where someone else to help would be really, really good. Uh, maybe to sort of wind it up for me. Because I don't feel like I'm sort of being able to wind it up properly. Uh, maybe this might do it. Uh, let's try this. It's, it's really not sort of balanced, is it? Ah! Anyway, as you can see, I gave it a red hot go, which is the most important thing. And I can see a lot of room for improvement. Um, I believe if you use two strings in all four holes, you can actually get a lot more speed. It will stop that wobble, wobble, wobble. And if I use these little plastic, um, I guess, oh, they're, they're not test tubes, but they're little plastic things with, which you can put lids on, and a lot, a lot lighter than this, so you're actually able to get the speed. But I think you get the idea, and um, <laughs> you can use spinning to actually separate a liquid mixture um, into its constituent parts. All right, well, thanks for joining me today and I look forward to seeing you soon. Bye for now. Hey everyone, in today's lesson, we're looking at phase change and temperature. Now phase is a fancy way to say the state of matter. So solid, liquid, gas, plasma. And we're going to be um, looking at how the temperature of ice changes as you heat it up uh, it goes to the liquid and then it boils so you're going to need some ice cubes in your um, little tiny ice cubes if you don't have little tiny ice cubes you can just get normal ice cubes and crush them up and you'll need a stop watch so let's set this up fairly quickly before my ice cubes melt so you definitely need a bunsen burner make sure you've got plenty of gas in it and 
We will need a heat proof mat, another heat proof mat, tripod, wire gauze, and I'm going to use my retort stand to hold the peg in place, uh, to hold the, um, the lead in place. So you need your thermometer with your um, probe, and I'll hold that in place with the peg. And I'm pretty sure I'm going to be using the red one like so. Connect that in, that will be good. And I need a beaker, which I need to fill up with my ice cubes. So, in go. Try and get as much ice into this beaker as you possibly can. That's my advice. Now, my ice is starting to melt, so I've got to do, I've got to work quick. Quick, 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 quick. Oh, oh no! Oh, come in. Gotcha. <laughs> Can't get away from me that easily. And in we go. Getting there. Getting there. Okay, oh, and where are you? Down here, there's one more. So I've got a beaker full of ice now. And now I can push this probe in. And that temperature, whoa! <laughs> that temperature will fall rapidly, which is exactly what we want. And you know, someone, if I say, what's the temperature of an ice cube? Some of you might say, oh, it's zero degrees Celsius. Well, unlikely, it's probably colder than that because water freezes at zero degrees Celsius. Um, but in actual fact, uh, freezers can be colder and normally are colder than zero degrees Celsius, which means you can get ice that is colder than zero degrees Celsius, no problems at all. So I am sort of like holding this lead in place, which is sort of going to hold the um, beaker in place a little bit as well. Now you do want to be careful with, you do want to be careful that the the lead doesn't touch like the hot tripod because the lead will melt. So I'm actually quite comfortable with that situation. And so I need my sheet to record my data on. So I've got my sheet, I've got a pen, I've got some matches now. And I'm going to call this basically time zero. Okay, so I'm going to call this time zero now. So I just get my stopwatch and I go to my clock and I get no, uh, my clock. I go to my stopwatch, reset, and it's currently on 1.7 degrees Celsius. And so at time zero, I'll write 1.7, like so. And then I'm going to light my Bunsen burner. And in the moment I've lit my Bunsen burner, that's when I start my stopwatch. Okay. So here we go. Bunsen burner on. Stopwatch start. Okay. So we've started off with the solid phase, which is ice. And... We are now heating it up. And in actual fact, some of the ice had actually melted a little bit. And so the temperature is actually um, going up probably quicker than I thought it would be. Um, maybe my probe is a little bit low. So I might actually just lift the probe up a little bit. And I'm at 30 degrees and I'm at eight. No, I'm at seven degrees Celsius. Okay seven degrees Celsius. And I should note that I lifted the probe up just a little bit. Uh, now this, uh, no, time will go quickly. <laughs> I can tell you that now because we're almost at one minute and the temperature is at 16 degrees Celsius. Okay, 16 degrees Celsius. And one of the beauties of this small equipment is that it actually goes quite quickly. 
if you're if you're using traditional school equipment with a large beak with large chunks of ice and that sort of thing this this can actually take a very very long time and is actually quite can get a bit boring but you're not going to be bored here the, the, it will all be over before we know it so we're at one and a half minutes and it's actually 28 degrees now okay and definitely all it appears that all the ice has melted so i write down in my observations all ice has melted okay and i just need to center this a little bit better now um there was a little bit of movement and i wanted it centered so i'm now at two minutes i'm now at two minutes and it's 51 degrees celsius okay 51 degrees celsius that's important um this this is this is a classic actual experiment um and i think every kid in the world needs to do this experiment to see how the temperature changes in the ice because i think it's actually quite interesting particularly once we reach like 100 degrees Celsius, like we can see that it, the, the temperature is going up, 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 up. Um, and we're at two and a half minutes now and it's 70 degrees Celsius. I can actually see some very small bubbles. So I'll write down very small bubbles. Very small bubbles. And in actual fact, there is actually a tiny bit of boiling occurring down at the bottom, which I'll jot down in the next time. Now, have you noticed that I forgot to put my safety glasses on? You're probably screaming out, glasses on, glasses on. Okay, my glasses are on. And I'm at 88 degrees. And there's actually a little bit of boiling down the bottom. Okay, a bit of boiling down the bottom. Okay, and actually it's well and truly I'd say it's well and truly boiling now. And at three minutes 30, it's almost three minutes 30, the temperature is actually 99.8, which I'm going to call 100 degrees Celsius. So it's now boiling. Now I'm going to keep this going because this is what I think is really quite the interesting part. Okay. Um, time's going up, but... The temperature is still 100 degrees Celsius. The temperature of the water is actually not going past the 100 degrees. It's still 100 degrees. Okay, and it's, it's well and truly boiling. Isn't that strange? I'm putting in heat to the water. I'm heating up the water. But once it's reached 100 degrees Celsius, the temperature is not going up anymore. That's very, very interesting, isn't it? In actual fact, I can tell you the energy of the Bunsen burner is now actually, the energy is not going into increasing the kinetic energy of those water particles anymore, still 100 degrees. It's actually going into breaking the bonds between the water molecules. So now the energy is being used to break the bonds between the water molecules, causing them to go from the liquid phase to the gaseous stage. So absolutely fascinating. And look, I'll just go to the five minutes and that's all I need to do. Now, you might have had better or, yeah, more solid ice than me. And so it might have taken longer. But I'm going to stick to 100 degrees Celsius. And I'm actually going to call this practical side over. Now, once you do have your data, my, your results data, and that's my results data for this experiment, to sort of make sense of it, it's best if we can now graph it, okay? And so, going to do a line graph, all right? Now, I'm going to put this finished line graph on the video next to me, and so you can see how I build, build it up. And so the title will be um, uh, Heating Ice, Heating Ice Through to Boiling, all right, so always have a title with your graphs. And on the bottom, um, in this case, we're actually going to be putting the time. Okay, so we're gonna put the time and in minutes. Now, what's very, very important is that I actually um, label the, 
the vertical lines and not the spaces. Now I'm going to five minutes myself. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm actually going to go up by half a minute or 0.5 of a minute for each vertical line. So 0.5, 1, 1.5, 2, 2.5, 3, 3.5, 4, 4.5, 5. So I've now done the horizontal. I've now done the horizontal. Now I'm going to do the vertical, which is of course the temperature, okay? And I'm writing that down vertically so that it fits. And I put my units, which are degrees Celsius, and I went up to 100 degrees, so I'm pretty sure if I go up by tens, that will be good. So again, I'm labeling the horizontal lines. Okay, so I'm labeling the lines, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. And now I can start um, plotting my graph. So at time zero, the temperature is 1.7. So I actually put a cross at 1.7, at zero, 1.7. Now I uh, crawl across, okay? I crawl across to 0.5 minutes and I, I climb up to seven, okay? So I'm now climbing up to seven and I'll put a cross. Now I crawl across to 16, no, I crawl across to one minute and I go up to 16, crawl across to one minute, go up to 16 and I plot it with a cross, okay? Plot it with a cross. Crawl across to 1.5 minutes and go up to 28 and put a cross. Crawl across to two minutes, go up to 51, put a cross, go, um, crawl across to uh, two and a half minutes and go up to 70, beautiful. Crawl across to three and go up to 88. Crawl across to three and a half and I'm now at 100 and I'm at 100 for every time after that. So I have now plotted all my points with crosses. I've plotted all my points with crosses. And now I'm going to do my line of best fit. Now, a line of best fit can actually be a curve. And so I'm actually going to start at the top here, this horizontal, and then it curves down. Now I don't actually have to touch any of the points with my line of best fit. I just sort of need to use them as a guide. I need need to use them to get as close as possible to each one because every single one of them is actually just an approximation, okay? So if I go down like this, oh, beautiful, oh yeah, that is a, that is a, not a bad curve, not a bad curve. Um, What's my the discuss the the general trends and that is that um, well once the ice has melted the the temperature goes up at a, at a constant rate that's quite important to notice that once you've got the liquid just the liquid water the temperature goes up at a constant rate once it boils it stays at 100 degrees Celsius now down here in actual fact we don't really have what's called what theoretically happens. Theoretically, what happens is, let me show you, that is that the temperature, the temperature should actually stay at zero, okay, the temperature stays at zero until all the ice has melted. So theoretically, and I'm going to use a thicker texture here so that, and you'll see this on the screen next to me, theoretically, the temperature will stay at zero until all the ice has melted. Once all the ice is melted, then it will go up at a constant rate as the water heats up. And then once it starts boiling, it will stay at that constant temperature. So that is the actual theoretical um, phase change graph. The reason that we don't get this horizontal here is because um, it's to do with the size of the probe, the fact that the ice cubes have got gaps and there's bits of air and all that. Uh, that sort of thing. So we don't quite get the theoretical one. But anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed this phase change and temperature um, practical, uh, that you've enjoyed doing an absolute classic experiment or activity, and that you've nailed some key points when you're doing graphs. Um, graphs are very important um, because they help us visualize the data. Thanks for joining me today, and I'll see you again very soon. Bye for now. 
Hey all, uh, welcome to this lesson on the kinetic particle theory, solids, liquids and gases. Now we'll start with a little bit of theory and then we're going to do a very interesting demonstration which will um, uh, help us understand um, some of this kinetic particle theory even better. Now the word kinetic means movement, that's what uh, kinetic means movement. In the old days you used to go to the cinema and the word cinema meant moving pictures and the word cinema and kinetic are actually quite similar to each other. Particles are little tiny lumps. Okay, so particles are little tiny lumps and a theory is basically some big ideas. So the kinetic particle theory means is that every um, object, substance, or matter is made up in, in the universe is made up of little particles. So an ice cube, which is a solid, okay, it has a fixed shape and a fixed volume, um, an ice cube is made up of little particles and those particles are sort of like in a regular position in the, in the solid, but more importantly, they're like moving. There's a bit of vibrational energy in each of those particles. It's a little bit like if you're sitting, you know, with a group of people in a bunch of chairs. It's not like you're all sitting there not moving at all. Everybody's sort of moving a bit in their chair. Um, not too much. However, however, if you start heating them up, that movement becomes more and more, which is the second part of the kinetic particle theory, and that is that all the particles which are making up matter are actually in constant motion. And as you heat them up, they actually, you know, start vibrating more and more, you know, moving about more and more about their, their same location if they're, if they're a solid about this same fixed position. And if you cool them down, they'll stop you know, they'll, their, their movement will reduce, reduce, reduce. And in fact, as you cool them down further and further and further, eventually you get to a point where they don't move at all. And that point is called absolute zero. And it's minus 273 degrees Celsius. It's, it's a place where, you know, basically there is no more heat. The heat is a, basically this movement of the particles. Now, as you heat up a solid and the particles start moving more and more and more and there's more vibrational energy, eventually that, that energy sort of breaks the attractive bonds between them and the particles start moving about. That's when you actually then have what's called a liquid. So the particles are actually now moving about. They take up about the same amount of space. They have about the same volume. But instead of being in a fixed position, they now actually just, you know, fill up the, the bottom of the vessel that they're sitting in, okay, and they're sort of moving about. And if you keep heating them up, not only do they vibrate more and more, and they actually start moving around it or translate more and more around each other, then eventually when they reach a certain point called the boiling point, they actually start to shoot off into, into the air or the space around them, and they turn into a gas. So that is the kinetic particle theory. And now we're going to do a very interesting demonstration. Um, you're, you can do it as well. The first thing I'm going to reach for is my glasses. Okay, make sure you've got your glasses on for this. Now this is called the water pump up demonstration. And I need a little bit of food color as well. So I'm just going to grab some food color. All right, I've got some blue and yellow food coloring and I'll need my Bunsen burner for this. Now, this is a demonstration that in a school, um, it's because the equipment's quite large, it's actually quite dangerous and it's only ever a teacher demonstration, if that. Most teachers would not do this as a demonstration. They'd consider it too, too dangerous, basically. Um, and yet, and yet, uh, I'm going to show you how to do it. We actually did this at a, a festival once down in Tasmania, the Festival of Bright Ideas. And if you're ever around Tasmania, it's a fantastic festival. Uh, and we had 10 uh, setups of these equipment. And we had kids sitting down and we did this exact demonstration with the kids over and over and over and over throughout the day. 
And halfway through the day, I looked down, there was this little girl, and she's like, ooh. I'm like, how old are you? She said, I'm four. I'm like, you're four, and you're lighting a Bunsen burner, and you're doing this. That's amazing. And I turned to my son, Matthew. I said, Matt, she's four, and she's doing it. And he goes, that's nothing. I've just had a two and a half year old lighting a Bunsen burner and doing the water pump up demonstration. So amazing. This equipment's amazing. Okay, you'll need a beaker and you'll need your conical flask. Take out that rubber stopper and you'll need the rubber stopper with the glass tube and you will need the peg. So this is what you'll need. Oh, and you'll need a bit of water. Okay, so I've got some water here. So. I need to fill up this beaker with water and I'm going to put some blue. Okay, I'm going to put some blue. One, two, two drops of blue. That's nice. And the water sort of the color spreads throughout the water. I need to put a little bit a little bit of water into this conical flask. Not much. Um, less than a mil. Less than a mil. Just so there's enough covering the bottom of the glass, basically. And I'm going to put in two, three, four drops of my yellow. Uh, perfect. So that's, that's, that's ample. Then I'm going to push... In the rubber stopper. Now remember you always push the rubber stopper and glass tube in by the rubber stopper not by the glass tube because you'll end up breaking it and that will damage your you might you know hurt yourself. Um, that feels all quite firm that feels good and then you need to have a bit of a practice while everything's cold. So what you're going to be doing what we're going to do is we're going to get this boiling we're going to get this boiling, and then once, once it's been boiling for a time, we pick this up and we rotate it, and we tip it upside down, and we hold it there like that. Now, when we rotate it, I can tell you, it will squirt. It will squirt a little bit of really hot water and a bit of steam. So you don't, don't point it towards yourself like this, okay? So you might, yeah, don't point it towards yourself. You need to actually practice doing it like this. Now, what you could consider doing for this particular practical, if you're right-handed, okay, this might actually make it a little bit easier. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm actually going to rotate my, I'm going to put the Bunsen burner on the right in this case. So there we go. Nothing wrong with doing that. And now I've done some practices and I'm confident that I'm not going to point this towards myself or towards a person nearby, I will actually get the Bunsen burner going. And let's see what happens. So kinetic particle theory, the, the water in the um, conical flask is moving around each other a little bit and it's got vibrational energy, all these actually trillions of particles. And as I heat them up, they're moving around a bit more. Now, above that liquid, it's not actually empty. It's not a vacuum. It's not empty space. There's actually air in there. And air is made up of um, nitrogen gas and oxygen gas and actually some carbon dioxide and water molecules. Um, there's actually a fair bit of air there. And that air is actually from our environment. And that... The movement of the air is actually pushing and is actually pushing on the water. Okay, it's actually pushing down on the water. It's pushing on the side of the glass. Uh, the air around us is pushing onto us. Oh, <laughs> it's pushing onto the table. It's pushing onto the surface water here. But this is now boiling. And the, the water is, pshoo, the water molecules are shooting off and they're actually filling up this conical flask. So the water molecules are filling up this conical flask, which actually causes the air to get pushed out. And so you can actually see steam coming up. See this steam coming up? And then the steam condenses, and so that's why you can actually see it. So don't put your hand over there because you'll actually get burnt. And if you do get burnt, make sure you run it under cold water. 
So this has actually been steaming long enough now for the air to have all been pushed out and that's full of um, water molecules. Now when we turn it upside down, those water molecules will cool down and condense, go back to a liquid form, and you'll actually form a vacuum in there. Are we ready? Set. Whoa, that went so quick. <laughs> wow, mine went quicker than I thought. It looks like the water got sucked up, but in actual fact, the water got pushed up. Okay, the water got pushed up. Now I can do that once more. Okay, so I'll put that water back. And I like how the blue and the yellow made green, <laughs> which is why I chose the blue and the yellow, to be honest. And I'll pop that back. And there we go. This will I'll be able to do this again. When I turn it upside down, the water molecules cooled. And <clears throat> why the water doesn't go up straight like straight away is because the water, air pressure is pushing down on that surface of that liquid it's pushing it up but the steam is pushing the water down but when the steam condenses and there becomes a vacuum there's nothing to push the water down anymore and so the water is actually pushed up so here we go we'll i'll do it a little bit um i won't wait so long this time i'll just wait for the steam to come out okay we'll wait for the steam to come out i call this the water pump up and air pressure is actually strong enough, it's got enough force to push water up to a height of 10 metres. So I could actually have a tube that's 10 metres long and this effect will still work. In fact, they used to use this principle to get the water out of coal mines. And if the coal mine was deeper than 10 metres, you actually had a series of these water pump ups. You pump it up 10 metres, then another 10 metres, then another 10 metres. They didn't use little five mil conical flasks, they big, used big steel uh, vessels. That's been boiling probably for long enough. And so I'm going to turn it upside down and wait for it. Hey, that was better. <laughs> wait for it. Hey, that was better. Ah, <laughs> uh, look. Have some practice at this and then show show some people because they would love to see it. Anyway, that's the kinetic particle theory and the water pump up demonstration. Thanks for joining me today and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye for now. Hey everyone, welcome to this lesson where we are looking at the Leiden frost effect. Now this is a very interesting um, scientific phenomena and um, it does help us understand kinetic particle theory a little bit better. It helps us to understand uh, liquids and gases a little bit better. But boy, it's just interesting. So uh, you'll need your goggles on for this one. 100% you need your goggles um, because we can be dealing with some superheated water. I need some matches and you might want to have some food colouring, uh, but that's not essential. So I am going to um, put my Bunsen burner in. I've got some gas there, which is fantastic. And I need a heat proof mat. And I need my tripod. So let's put my tripod on. And my wire gauze. And let's get the other heat proof mat. And then I need my plastic pipette, plastic pipette, and a beaker with a bit of water in it. So now I'm going to have a little bit of coloured water, but you don't need to have a colour in the water for this at all. And then in this plastic container, there's some aluminium pans and some steel pans. Now, if you can't tell the difference between them, you can use your magnet, alum uh, magnet, yeah. Uh, Aluminium is not magnetic, but the steel pan is magnetic. Um, you, you, it is actually possible to blast a hole in this with the Bunsen burner into the aluminium one. So I'm actually going to try using the steel one. Okay, so I'm going to use the steel pan. But if you've only got an aluminium one, then that's not a problem at all. And I need my tweezers. So... What we're going to do is get the Bunsen burner going. Okay, so 
So I'll get the Bunsen burner going. And I don't want it super, super, super hot, but we definitely want it maybe on medium. Okay, so that looks about right. And remember, I said that you can't heat, remember, I've said in previous lessons you can't heat an empty beaker. Well, you can heat an empty metal dish, and that's what I'm going to do. I actually need to heat the metal dish up. So I don't have to like get it like red hot or anything, but I do need to have it quite hot for this effect to occur. And so the light and frost effect. Now if I draw up a little bit of water into the pipette, I can put one drop on and just see whether it's hot enough. Woo, very, very close. Very, very close. Uh, it evaporated quite quickly. It wasn't quite hot enough. Let's try again. Oh, no, not quite enough. It sort of sizzled and evaporated. So, boiled away. I'm going to maybe get a little bit hotter. Okay, a little bit hotter. And now let's put the drop on. Aha! Got it. Got it. Now, I'm just going to rotate my tripod around so that you can maybe see this a bit better. This is very interesting. How is this even possible? I've got a drop of water just sitting on top of this boil, oh, this super hot surface. I'm going to put, I'm going to make it a bit, oh, I'm going to make this drop a bit bigger. And I can, Oh, 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 I've just blown out. I've just blown out the, the Bunsen burner and that will cause it to cool, the pan to cool down, which will affect that drop. So I've got this drop, which is like, just sort of like, it's not evaporating. It's like, just, it's like rolling around. That's due to the light and frost effect. It's almost like there's no friction whatsoever. In fact, the closest thing I can think of, the effect is it's a little bit like a hovercraft. That water drop is actually boiling on the bottom. It's boiling on the bottom and it's turning into steam. And then that steam is actually lifting the water drop off the hot pan, which causes it to move around so easily. And that steam is then actually insulating it from the heat. Very, very interesting. <laughs> I'm going to try and put an even bigger drop on, see what happens. Sizzles. How big? Whoa! Oh no! I've just destroyed my drop. I've just destroyed my drop because... It wasn't actually hot enough. The surface wasn't hot enough to produce the steam. And so it didn't lift the drop off the surface. There we go. Perfect. And have you ever wondered why the water actually falls, forms a drop? It's because the particles of water actually attract each other. Okay? And that actually draws it into this shape. Now, I might actually just film this um, up close because it is so super interesting. There we go. So... Giving it a bit of a film, nice and close. I'm going to add a bit of water. Woo. Sizzle, sizzle, sizzle. Wow. Uh oh, oh! It, did, it wasn't hot enough, and so it, and so the light and frost, frost effect broke down. Now I can sort of see that this pan is going to be ruined. There's no doubt about it. Um, yeah, this pan, I don't, I can see a, quite a significant colour change. There's something going on with this pan. Let's film it once more. Woo, perfect. Oh, see how the... <laughs> there we go. Whoa, whoa! How good is that? <laughs> 
Now, do have to be careful because that water drop actually can reach higher than 100 degrees Celsius, believe it or not. There is, there is a way to superheat substances, and if you heat them up gently and carefully, um, it will actually cause them to overheat, and then if you sort of jar it, they can actually all of a sudden like psh, boil and boil away instantly, which can happen in a microwave with a, a glass of water. You can actually, don't, don't try this, but if, it's, if it heats up gently enough, that water will get past 100 degrees Celsius, and then if you bring it out and put a spoon or drop something in, all of a sudden it can now psh, like boil up in one instant. Anyway, that's the light and frost effect. Um, I'll sure, I'm sure you'll be spending plenty of time investigating that for yourself. You can try different colours, you can see what happens when those drops mix and the colour changes, how big can you get your drop, um, lots of things to investigate. Okay, I'll see you soon, thanks for joining me today and um, bye for now. Hey all. It's a great to see you guys again, and in today's chemistry lesson, um, it's about making careful observations. Now, humans have got five senses. We've got touch, taste, sight, smell, and hearing. And uh, a very, they're all very important uh, senses, but probably one of the most important in the science laboratory is actually sight. And um, <laughs> you can see things uh, happening and it makes you wonder why, what's causing those things to happen. And have you ever like cooked, boiled some eggs or something like that? You've got a, a pan, a saucepan, you put some water in, you turn on the heat and fairly shortly, sometimes you go, oh, is it boiling? Hmm, a bit early for it to boil. Well, it's probably not boiling it, but something else is happening. And so let's just have a little look at that something else. So let's set up the Bunsen burner uh, with a beaker of water. Okay, so let's get the Bunsen burner going with a beaker of water so that we can make some very careful observations and I'll do a little bit of an explanation uh, for them as well. Sometimes you can see something a hundred times and it doesn't actually register as something that's actually interesting or noteworthy, but if someone points it out to you, then you go, oh, wow, yeah, I never actually noticed that. Um, well, I'm going to point something out to you. In fact, I pointed this out before and I've, I've sort of spoken a little into it. I'm going to speak a bit more into it now. So, Get the Bunsen burner going medium sized flame. I will put on my safety goggles. And, oh, a little bit blurry. Where have you gone? Um, clean the goggles. Hey, there you are. And I want it going a bit better than that, to be honest. That's a nice, consistent flame. Pop that on. And the temperature will rise. Okay, without any doubt. I don't even have to measure that to know that the temperature will rise. And oh no, there's a little bit of um, mistiness on this beaker. Maybe it's, the, maybe it's the goggles. So I'm looking very, very carefully. Okay, In fact, I might actually just have to raise my goggles so that I can see even more careful. And there we go. I've really, I've really got the heat going quite well. And I'm looking, looking, looking. Nothing seems to be happening yet. Oh, I just saw a bubble. I just saw a bubble rise. There we go. So that's an observation. A bubble rise. And now I actually see some bubbles forming on the bottom of the beaker. And then they rise. Now, that's an observation. Now, what's the explanation? Is the water boiling down at the bottom of the beaker? You know, does the water boil down at the bottom of the beaker and then the bubbles of steam rise up through that water? Well, the answer is no, not yet. Okay, no, not yet. What's actually happening is what's in the beaker is not actually just pure water, okay? It's actually got air dissolved in the water, like oxygen and nitrogen and carbon dioxide. 
I mean, if there wasn't oxygen dissolved in the water, then poor little fish wouldn't be able to breathe through their gills. And the air is dissolved. Now, interestingly, the hotter the water, the less gas it will dissolve. And what that means is that as the temperature of the gas, as the, as the temperature of the water rises, it can hold less gas. And so the gas comes out of solution, which is what those bubbles are. And so these are actually bubbles of air, oxygen and nitrogen coming up. That's what you actually see to start with. And there's quite a few little bubbles. Okay, there's quite a few little bubbles. And that's the story of those bubbles. Now that's actually got some big implications for the health of fish in large lakes. You see, if it gets too hot, the, the water in the lakes can actually cause the, uh, as it heats up, it causes the oxygen to, to bubble out and the poor fish can often, you know, um, die of oxygen starvation. And you can get what's called a fish kill where all the fish in the lake actually go belly up and sometimes you might see them at the top of the lake sort of trying to gulp the air from the surface of the, of the lake. Um, the poor little fish. So there we go. That's our first observation. But then, oh, I just, I just put my, my flame out. So let's put it back on. That's my first observation. And now, now I see bubbles forming, but then they disappear. The bubble forms, it doesn't go up to the top. It like forms and then disappears, forms then disappears, forms then disappears. What's happening there? Is that like oxygen bubbles like collapsing? And the answer is no. That is actually the water at the bottom has reached 100 degrees Celsius and has actually started to boil. And you actually get some steam, a bubble of steam forming, but as it rises, it cools down because the rest of the water is cooler than 100 degrees. And so it collapses, it collapses. And sometimes when it collapses, it can produce a bit of a pressure wave. And that pressure wave can cause what's called a bump. Now I haven't had many bumps with my equipment, um, but you might have had a few bumps with your equipment. It depends on it depends on how clean the beakers are and it depends on your water and that sort of thing. I might try and get it bumping by actually like blasting the temperature up. So I'm gonna blast it up and see if I can make this bump. Cause I want you to be able to see it. Uh, you might be seeing it by yourself. And let's see if I can, oh, there was a little bump. Oh, that's really boiling and blasting away there. But it's not what you would call bumping. I only saw one little bump happen. Maybe if I turn the heat down a bit, will I get a better bump? Hmm. Maybe, maybe not. Now, bumping can be quite a bit of a problem and sometimes schools and chemistry labs actually have containers of little tiny glass beads or even tiny little bits of broken ceramic. And if you put the broken ceramic or the tiny beads in the bottom of the beaker, it actually stops the bumping from happening. And so there are things that you can do, but look, I can't, I can't, I've only saw it bump once. Maybe I'm hoping that yours is bumping a bit more. I mean, it can be a bit of a pain in the neck because it's sort of like a bump, bump, and then the thing falls off and you sort of got to put it back in. So in a way, it's great that mine's not bumping. Um, but um, anyway, you can do a little bit more research into bumping if you wish and sort of like maybe be uh, have some greater detail into it. Now, uh, once I was teaching a year 10 class, I think it was year 10, and a boy called Lucas, I remember this, because his dad actually helped me photograph uh, my first book, which was very nice of him. Um, he came up to me in science class and said, oh, sir, I've made a bit of a discovery. I'm like, oh, really? He said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
And so I'm going to get a bit of food colouring because this will help. Sorry about that. So if I get some food colouring and just put some green food colouring in there. His discovery was to do with this pipette. And I'd been teaching for at least 15 years and I'd never, never come across this discovery before. So you have to have hot water. It doesn't have to be boiling. In fact, I might even just turn that off. And you draw up a fair bit of water into the pipette. And then you take it out and you rotate the pipette. Whoa! And it squirts out all by itself. Now that one didn't actually squirt as much as I've seen before. Drag up the water. Right. Whoa! Did you see that? How? How is that happening? Where? Where does this mysterious, mysterious pressure come from? I might just draw up a little bit. Woo! <laughs> like, that literally shot halfway across the table. Drag some up. Woo! I'm not squeezing it, and when you do it yourself, make sure you're not pointing it towards yourself when you bring it out. Okay, so I should have, that's a very important warning. Um, I never point anything at myself because you never know what could happen. So don't point at anybody else. But if you get some water out like that and then turn it, it shoots out. Now don't forget, if you ever do burn yourself, straight to the cold water tap. Okay, and I can tell you if you squirt, if this squirts on you, that, that will actually hurt. So do not point the pipette at anybody or anything. Now the big question is, how, how does the water get shot out? And I think the big part of the answer is to do with heat expansion. And that is that as the water goes down into this base here, it causes the air to expand, kinetic particle theory, that as particles get hotter, they move more, they move apart, and then that expansion pushes some of the water that's still in the tube. I think, I think that's the explanation. Okay, well, I hopefully you've enjoyed this lesson and you've found that phenomena uh, very interesting. I certainly did when I first saw it, and to have a good think about how it works is uh, very important. Okay, thanks for joining me today uh, in this lesson and I look forward to seeing you soon. Bye for now. Okay, hello everybody. In this chemistry uh, lesson, we're going to be making a thermometer. And by making a thermometer, that will help us better understand kinetic particle theory. So, You'll need, um, well, a Sharpie, a permanent marker, uh, some ice, some food coloring, and some salt would be helpful, and your chemistry set, of course. So, without further ado, please get your conical flask and take off the lid. I'll just put that on a heatproof mat. And you'll need your rubber stopper and glass rod. What we'll do is, this is a little tiny bit tricky. I'm going to fill this conical flask up and I want the liquid to be fairly concentrated. I'm using green, you can use whatever color you like. You do need to have a color in there though, otherwise you won't be able to see the liquid. now. Up it goes, almost all the way to the top. Now this is the little bit of a tricky part. We're going to push in that rubber stopper. Oh, I need it even stronger. I need, I need a darker, I need it really dark. So a blue is probably best. Blue or red, don't do yellow. Okay, don't do yellow. You really need a dark color because you need to be able to see the color of the water on the liquid. Now, can you see that that liquid is about half the way up? But in actual fact, I haven't pushed the rubber stopper down. So I'm just gonna draw out some of that water. 
Oh yeah, this is this is a little bit of a tricky little little bit tricky here. Oh, I want to push the rubber stopper in, but I don't want like air bubbles and stuff like that. So hmm, tricky, tricky, tricky. Tr I think I think I'm happy with that. I think I'm happy with that. There's no air bubbles. There's no air bubbles. And the liquid, I can see the green level about right there. So, and the rubber stopper is in. So I'm quite happy with that. Now I am drying it. Okay, I'm drying it. And I'll tell you why I'm drying it. It's so that I can put a mark with the permanent texture. Permanent textures don't like, don't like, um, any water. So now, see that mark there? You can clearly see the mark is marking the level of that. Okay, now I'm going to, I'm just going to see whether that fits in there. Yes, it does. I'm going to get some cold water. So let's get some water in there. And of course, I'm going to use some ice. Woo! <laughs> And I'm going to get some cold water, like that. And I need, I want, I want good contact. There we go, that's got fairly good contact. And I'm going to fill that up a bit more. And now, the liquid in the conical flask is cooling down. The liquid in the conical flask is cooling down. So I'm just going to put that to the side. Now we're waiting. While we're waiting for any sort of change to happen, and I sort of you sort of need it sitting as much in the the liquid as possible so that there's some good surface contact. While that's happening, now I'm going to get some hot water. Okay, so let's make up a bit of hot water, and we'll need the Bunsen burner for that. I will pop on my goggles, and let's make some hot water. You can see that I like, you love, not like, I love using the Bunsen burner. <laughs> Any excuse to light matches and have a Bunsen burner. I don't think you grow out of this, honestly. Oh, I've been lighting matches and candles and since I was five years old. And then from high school onwards, I lit... I love lighting Bunsen burners. In fact, I loved lighting them so much I became a science teacher and where I could keep lighting Bunsen burners. And then after being a science teacher, I became a... whatever I am now. Some type of... I don't know. Online teacher. Whatever. Um, and so, I need some hot water. And... Let's get some hot water happening there. And there we go. Blast him up. Perfect. And I'm going to come and look. And have I... Can I see any change at all? Ooh, not a lot. Not a lot. I'm going to do something a little bit different. I think I've got a better idea how to cool this down a bit more rapidly. And that is... I'm going to put the conical flask into... There and then, aha! Pour the. That's a. That's better. That's better. Can you see now how I'm like totally immersed? I'm giving it an ice bath. See that? I've totally emerged the conical flask in the cold water. So we've got much greater surface uh, contact. Much greater surface contact. And look, look. I can clearly see that the the liquid level, the green liquid level, is now lower than it was to start with. The, the water particles, which had been moving around, okay, the water particles which had been moving around, are slowly cooling down. And as they cool down, they sort of get closer and closer together. That's called contraction, right? <laughs> and look, yes! Definitely contracting. Definitely contracting. How interesting is that? Now, 
I can actually make it. I oh, know I'm gonna. We're gonna do it in hot water. We're going to do it in hot water and see what happens. So, have I got some hot water happening? Absolutely. And I could put a mark here and say cold. So how about I? Well, I can't write down cold because because my pen's not that small and the tube is really really skinny. But I'm going to put a mark where it's cold. There we go. There now you can see two marks. The the top mark is the original um, height of the liquid, and the bottom mark is that of cold. Now this is almost boiling away, and actually I can hear a little bit of bumping happening finally. Yay! I've got bumping. So, but let's pop that more in the centre. And now I want to put this into some hot water. So I'm going to tip out that cold water, and now I've got, I don't sort of, I don't need it like super, 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 super hot because that might even melt my plastic container which I definitely don't want to happen. So maybe I'll pop him in there first and then, whoop, there we go. There he goes, the hot water. And let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Is there a change? Yes, there is. It's actually already back to the original mark. Because the water, the green water, it's getting the, the, the heat energy from the, the surrounding water. So it's moving a lot faster. And as it moves faster, it sort of moves apart. It expands. And as it expands, it causes the water to go higher up the tube. And that is how a, a traditional glass thermometer works. Uh, a traditional glass thermometer, they originally used to contain mercury, which is a liquid element, liquid metal, and when it heats up, it expands, and when it cools down, it contracts. But mercury is quite toxic, and so in schools, they use um, a red, red spirit thermometers, and the red spirit is like an alcohol. It's a liquid, and it's inside the thermometer, and when it heats up, it expands, and when it cools, it contracts. And so... This is quite dramatic. Yay, I love it when experiments work. So let's pop a mark there. Look at that. That has really shot up high, hasn't it? Hmm. Absolutely wonderful. And so let's take that one out. Now remember what the bottom mark was? That was for the um that was for the, the ice. But I'm going to do something a little bit different now. I'm going to pop him in there. And I'm going to get the... I'm going to put some ice cubes in. Okay. And in actual fact, I might actually get my mortar and pestle. I wonder if I can crush the ice with the mortar and pestle. Hmm. Let's see. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. If they do crush up a little bit, it's not that easy. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put salt. Salt in the ice. Lots of salt. Okay. And I'll just get my stirring rod. And I'm going to give it a bit of a stir. Oh, okay, so now I've got some salty ice. Okay, I've got some salty ice. And I'm going to pour that salty ice around my... Um, conical flask like this. Really sort of trying to load it up there. Let's add that. Beautiful. And I might even try and squirt a, a bit more ice in. A bit strange, isn't it, to be adding ice? Adding ice, I mean, adding salt. 
adding salt to the ice. But I've done it. And if I can get a bit more, another little cube. Oh, I can see the I can see the water level level dropping. Okay, I see the water level dropping. And if I have a beaker just with like normal ice, just out of interest. I'm just going to get a beak with some normal ice. So ice without salt. And I'll scrape. This is messy. This is very messy. But it's sort of fun. And if I pop that there. And if I get my thermometer. And pop that in. What do you think the temperature of that molten. Not molten. Molten. But the melted ice and water is. Okay, so this is just the regular ice. This is just the regular ice. Pop him in there like that. I'll even get... I'll even get another cube in. Boop! Boop! Can you see that temperature? I don't know, I'm guessing it will not be. Five, four... Should be dropping. Should be dropping. One point three, one point two. Is it going to go down any lower? Is it going to go down to zero? That's the question. Because water freezes at zero degrees Celsius, so I should expect it to be at least zero. At least zero. Woo! Will it be at least zero? Um 1.1 okay that's quite close to zero but what about this salty ice what about this salty ice if i pop that into the salty ice what will be the temperature of that uh, hang on hang on hang on don't go up don't go up you're supposed to be going down you're supposed to be going down don't do this to me <laughs> oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. What is going on here? <laughs> Sometimes I confuse myself. Go down. Down. Should be going into negative territory. Why isn't it? I don't know. I don't know. How, maybe I need to put in some more ice. Ah, oh, science. <laughs> Frustrating sometimes. Oh, probably why I love it so much. Mm. Sometimes you think, oh. This is going to be boring. It's going to be the same thing each time. And then all of a sudden, something a little bit different happens, something that you're not really in, and boom. Very, very interesting. Okay, there we go. Give it a bit of a jiggle. I go, oh, yeah, yay! Look, 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 it's negative. It's going into the negative. Yay! Yes! It went down negative 0 0.5. Negative 1. Negative 1.1. Yay! By adding salt to ice, you can act. Whoa, negative 2. Okay, you can actually cause it to um, really get cold and in actual fact what you can do if you get a test tube and add some a little bit of water and this is what they do in Thailand to make their ice blocks so if you've ever been to Thailand and you've walked along the street and they've got like these stainless steel tubes with ice blocks in it this is actually how they actually freeze their like ice blocks they actually use salty ice now that doesn't mean the ice block tastes like salty ice no the the salty ice is on the outside <laughs> and the and the cordial is on the inside of the stainless tube but it is possible it is possible to freeze this liquid in this test tube okay by using salty ice you have a go for at it it will take a little bit of time 
Um, but there we go. What a great lesson. I love doing science with um, you guys. I love. I just love doing science experiments. So <laughs> I'll, I'll see you all soon and uh, bye for now. Hey everyone, it's good to be with you today. Uh, in today's chemistry lesson, we're going to be doing an experiment, a proper scientific experiment on diffusion. Now, if you spray a little bit of deodorant in your room and you leave the door open, after some time, people in another room, like the living room, will be able to smell that deodorant. And that's because those particles of deodorant are like moving around, moving around and bumping into the air particles and bumping into each other and then traveling and moving and spreading out. And that spreading out of one substance throughout another substance due to their kinetic um, <laughs> particle nature, is that process is called diffusion. And if you put a drop of food coloring into water, then over time that um, color spreads out. That's diffusion. And in today's experiment, we're going to see whether the temperature of, a, of the water affects the rate or the speed of the diffusion. So, um, what we're going to be using is food coloring. I'm going to use blue because blue is um, easy to see. And we'll need some water and we can get into it straight away. So, Let's start with just some um, room temperature water. Okay, room temperature water. Oh, well, we'll need a phone as well, okay? You'll need an iPad as well. 10 mil of water, 10 mil of water. I'm just gonna go get my phone. Okay, I've got my stopwatch. So, I've got a glass beaker, I've got 10 mil of water, I've got my stopwatch, and I'm going to drop in a drop of food coloring and then press start so boom and start and here's the question how long do we when do we decide that this has diffused that's a good question that's a very big question uh, good question to think about and probably the hardest thing about this particular practical um, how do we determine when the color has spread sufficiently that we can say it's diffused throughout hmm. not a hundred percent sure yet <laughs> so I might just like leave it there and keep going and while I actually get the next part of the experiment going and oh no there's actually something I forgot to do does anyone know what I forgot to do? I actually forgot to measure the temperature of that water. But that's okay because what we can do is if I get this beaker, which is essentially the same, and I use the same water from the same wash bottle, then I can make an assumption, and I think it's a good assumption, that this water will be the same temperature as that water. Okay? So let's pop that in there, there like that. That takes a moment for it to properly register and let's get our results sheet and down here the temperature it says results I'm looking at the temperature here it's 24.2 it's quite warm actually isn't it really 24.2 and we don't know the time for diffusion yet because it's still happening but while we wait for that how about we get the the next temperature? So I'm going to warm warm this beaker up. So let's get out our uh, heat proof mat, our Bunsen burner. I don't want to like bump too much of the table. I want this quite still. Um, and let's pop this one here. Definitely don't touch or move that that one that's undergoing diffusion at the moment. Hmm. And turn that there. Turn this on. And set a good example by putting on my safety goggles. Well, that wasn't 
such a good idea, was it? And let's warm up that beaker of water. Okay. What temperature do I want to bring it to? Hmm, that's a good question. Well, if this one's at like um, 24 degrees, then <clears throat> probably, probably around 40 degrees, something like that. It's at 30 to, at the moment. It's not going to take long to go up. 31 and a half, 32 and a half. That's probably enough. So I'm going to turn the heat off and I'm going to give this a little bit of a stir like that. And now I just need it to sit there for a little bit because I certainly do not want um, any stirring movement to be in that beaker. Okay, so need it to have be absolute the water needs to be absolutely still okay that's crucial that the water is absolutely still because you've got to have the same starting conditions okay for every single experiment well not not exactly the same starting conditions there's one thing that's going to be different we're trying to find out how the temperature affects the rate of diffusion and so the one thing that's going to be different, it's always going to be the temperature. Okay, it's 37.3. So I'm just going to bring this out here very gently. And this is actually cooling down now, but it's also the movement of the water is stopping. So 37.3, but I'm going to record it as 37 because... By the time I put this drop in, and it's now five minutes for diffusion for this one, so I'm going to put this drop in here. Boom. All right. So now I've got two. Two going. And if I'm looking at this one, I can see that the there's a few streams of colours. The colour is definitely spreading throughout. There's no doubt about it. Okay, the colour is definitely spreading throughout. And I can actually see quite a, a significant difference with this, this hotter one already. Because I can actually see that the, the colour, even though I put the drop in exactly the same, is actually higher up and this middle section is actually wider. So I can see straight away that there is a significant difference with the with the bottle one, without a doubt. So, in our experimental design, we have what we call the independent variable, the dependent variable, and then controlled variables. So, the independent variable is what you choose, or we choose to change. Now, what are we changing each time? We're changing the temperature, and so the independent variable goes in the middle of this, I call it the lotus flower approach. Um, it goes in the middle of the, what we call or lotus flower. It's a good part of, I think it's a great way to design an experiment. So the temperature, okay? The temperature of the water. Now, what, what will depend on the temperature? Well, the time of diffusion. Okay, so the dependent variable is the time of diffusion, or time for diffusion. And then around the, the petals of the lotus flower, we have to decide what we're going to keep exactly the same. Well, we need to make sure that we use water in each case, yeah? Or actually the amount of food colouring added is the first one I've written down, which is one drop, okay? The amount of liquid used, it was 10 mil. Um, the type of liquid used, we use water each time. Uh, the type of container holding the water, we're using the same each time, a 10 mil beaker. Um, what other variables? Uh, the amount of stirring. Okay, well, we're not going to stir, so no stirring. 
the ongoing temperature of the room. Oh yeah, we need to do it in the same room. And I know this, this room has got a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. The color of the food coloring. That's an important one. You can't use like blue, yellow, green, red, because remember from our chromatography experiment, um, the I think the blue one uh, travels further than the yellow. So it means that the blue particles are probably smaller. So yes, the color is very important to keep consistent. And can you think of any other variables? That's, that's, that's important as well. Can you think of anything else that I haven't thought of? So, what else we got here? Okay. Oh, it sort of looks like this one here is actually overtaking that one there. So, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep the times going. And in the meantime, I'm going to get a, oh, I'm going to get a third one going, okay? So, that way I don't have to waste time. We've got 10 mil there. And what would be a good temperature to get the third one up to, do you think? We've got 24, 37, oh, I think around 50 degrees or something like that. Should do it. Oh! Oh, I didn't light it the tiny science lab way. And did you see what happened? Broke off and it landed on my leg. <laughs> ah! Light the match exactly how you showed everybody. That's a better idea. And let's get this to about 50 degrees Celsius. Six, forty, this experiment has got one major major flaw one major major flaw in fact the flaw is so big that um, I'd probably call it an invalid experiment I wonder if you can work out what that major major flaw is can you think scientifically enough to work out what the big, big problem with this experiment is? Okay. That's 50. Let's pop that there. And I'll just stir the temperature, stir the water so that the temperature is the same throughout. And pop that in. 46, going up, 47, 48, 49, 49.9, 50, 50.3, 50 50.5. Okay, if I bring that out slowly, like that, I'm going to look at these just again. Okay, they, this is almost, the blue is almost consistent throughout it. It's almost consistent, so I'm going to look at how my time's going. About 12 minutes, and I'm fairly confident. I'm going to call this one. I'm going to call it at 12 minutes 20. No, 12 minutes 30. 12 minutes 30. 12.5 minutes and I'm going to put this drop in there so my first result I'm going to call it at time for diffusion it says in seconds but I'm actually going to change that to minutes 12.5 minutes this one's still going without a doubt okay this one's still going without a doubt um, although the color is almost consistent throughout. And well, the one that, that was at 50 degrees Celsius, um, 
Yeah, it's colour. It's clearly got a significant advantage. I can see that now. And what was that temperature again? 50 degrees Celsius. I better write that down. And the next one, the next one I might get like, well, I, I can do the next one now because I can actually tip this beaker out. I've only got three beakers. And so let's get the fourth one, the fourth one happening. <laughs> Have you worked out what the big, big problem with this experiment is? Oh, I didn't light it properly, did I? You've got to get into good habits. Good habits are important, people. And I've got to make sure I light the match towards that heatproof mat. The tiny signs that way! Got to do it. Okay, I'm going to get this up. What temperature do you think this one is now? Do you think it's still 50 degrees Celsius? Absolutely not. It's probably cooled down to about 30 by now. And that's the big problem with this experiment. I'm not actually keeping the temperature the same. All right? That's the big problem. Okay, this is blue consistent throughout, so I'm actually going to um, call it now. I'm going to call this... I'm going to call it at 15 minutes, but we started at 5 minutes, didn't we? So it's actually 10 minutes. There we go. So this one here is now done. And I'm going to say it took 10 minutes. And this color here, it's the, for the third one, which was 50 degrees Celsius, it's pretty close. It's pretty close to being complete. I can see the colour is fairly consistent throughout. It's almost the same as that one. And the moment I see it the same, I'm going to say that's it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be calling it. Mm, very, very close. Okay. I'm going to say... I'm going to say it at 15 and a half. Which actually, 15 and a half minus 12 and a half is actually only three minutes. So, <laughs> literally, I'm going to call it three minutes. So, I can now stop that, reset it, and get ready for the third one. And it's going to be quite hot indeed, so I'll probably get my tweezers. And I'm not going to put it on my table because it's hot and I don't want to damage my table. There we go. I'll get my stirring rod. Just give it a little bit of a stir. There were some bubbles forming. It was on for a while. I'm going to, I bet the temperature will be around about <sighs> close to 90, I think. That's what I think. Up goes the temperature. In the 70, 72, 74, 75. What did I say? 90? 76. No, it's at 76 degrees. I'll call it 75 degrees. Here we go. And put my drop in, start, and whoa, what a difference, wow, wow, the colour's spreading so quickly, <gasps> wow, that's the kinetic particle theory for you, <laughs> didn't look like the water was moving, I, I literally have to call it now, like, 30 seconds, half a minute. I'm going to call it half a minute. That's it. Wow. Amazing. Okay. Amazing. So, 
what was it? I think seven. Oh, what was it? Was it seventy-five degrees Celsius? <laughs> I forget. <laughs> I didn't write it down. <laughs> oh no. I'll put seventy-five, and I'll put zero point five minutes. Okay, so I'll have the the finished uh, graph there, and I'll build the graph up now, and you can see. Um, on the finished one, what we're looking like. So uh, every graph needs to have a title. So let's write a title down, uh, diffusion and temperature, okay? Diffusion and temperature. On the horizontal, that's what you where you put your independent. So the horizontal, the x-axis is your independent. It's what you changed in the experiment. It's not always time. Okay, it's not always time. Time doesn't always go on the horizontal. In actual fact, we change the temperature, so the temperature goes on the horizontal. Yeah. And what was my temperatures? I went from zero, well, not zero, but it's always great to try and start at zero. Went from 24 to 75, so I'm going to start at zero. And then I count the number of lines. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So that means I'm going to go up by ten degrees. And so I'm going to label each little line. 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. And then the time goes on the vertical. Okay, the dependent variable goes on the vertical. I've got to go up to 12 and a half. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So I might go up by uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. I'm going to go up by 2s. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. You want to try and use up as much of the graph as you can. So at a time, at a temperature of 24.2, at a temperature of 24.2, the time was 12 and a half, so I go and put a cross there. At a time at a temperature of 37, the time was 10. And so I put a cross there. At a temperature of 50, the time was 3. And at a time at a temperature of 75, it was half. And so now, I've got four points there, and I have to do a line of best fit. And it's going to be a curve. And it's going to be like an exponential curve. That will look something like that. Okay? A curve that looks something like that. Now... The reason I don't do it like just a straight line is because if I do a straight line, it will end up going through the temperature <coughs> axis, which will give it a time of zero, which means that if I went a straight line, I'm actually saying that like at a temperature of like 90 degrees seconds, it would be instantaneously diffused through, and that's just not possible. It will get very, very close to a zero time, but it won't be a zero time. So very, very clearly with this conclusion, <laughs> temperature has a significant effect on the rate of diffusion. The higher the temperature, the faster the rate of diffusion. E what, a, what a great experiment. Hopefully you enjoyed that, and I look forward to seeing you again next lesson. Bye for now. Hello everybody, welcome to the lesson on the boiling points of saline solutions. Now another word for saline is salty solutions. And this is an experiment. Um, and so we'll have an aim and the aim of the experiment will be how does the amount of salt in water affect its boiling point? What do you think? What, what's your hypothesis? Do you think uh, the amount of salt in water will affect its boiling point. Do you think it might cause the boiling point to go higher, uh, stay the same, or go lower? Um, if it's, some, if it's a, a guess that can be tested, then it's a great hypothesis. So I guess what we'll do is we'll start with just finding the boiling point of like plain water, pure water. 
that we that that is what we'd probably call our control you know sort of our standard what we can compare um uh, other things too so i guess we can call that our control and so what will we need to do we'll need to boil some sort of plain water and see the boiling point so without further ado um let's get some water boiling um and so that we can measure its boiling point yeah is that a good idea oh yes that's a very good idea i'm going to use the tripod not the tripod the retort stand as well and let's go our beakers and let's go 10 mil of water fantastic so and i'll just get that going safety glasses set a good example okay light the match properly this time yes yes great job light the bunsen burner and let's get that cooking great let's get our retort stand happening to hold our thermometer in place so the peg into the half peg holder holding the that is wonderful and doop. 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 okay i think that is very very good let's get that going down a little bit further straighten that up a little bit and well, let's get this a bit closer one of the beauties of this equipment is that everything does happen a lot faster um, and and it's of course safer let's bring that closer now i don't want the probe to touch the bottom of the glass i think that's good enough to be i think that's pretty good i'm happy with that and i've got 10 mil of water and so what's our aim to see how the amount of salt in water affects its boiling point so what's the independent variable what's the variable that we're going to change each time is it the temperature is it the time or is it the amount of salt it's the amount of salt. We're going to be changing the amount of salt each time. And so that's the independent variable. What's the dependent variable? Um, well, how does the amount of salt affect the boiling point, the temperature of boiling? Ah, the dependent variable is the temperature of boiling. Time is actually not part of this. We're not actually interested in the time in this experiment. We're simply interested in the temperatures. And so this is at 85 degrees Celsius. I'm expecting this to go to close to 100 degrees Celsius. Should be around about nine, should be around about 100. And while I'm still waiting for that, I'm going to get out my scales because I need to actually weigh out half a gram of salt. Now, how am I going to do that? What's the easiest way? I think the easiest way will be to put some salt, transfer some salt, into this oh, maybe if I can take this lid off that would be better yeah I think that will be a lot better oh she's boiling away that's for sure bubble 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 got plenty of salt here there you go looks a little bit like snow okay that's boiling away and it's oh says 100.5 degrees celsius 100.5 degrees celsius so a little bit higher than i would have thought so i've got my results table here the amount of salt salt is zero and the boiling point is 100.5 degrees celsius great and now let's get out half a gram of salt so let's put my little white plate down I will, my plate weighs 2.17 grams. How heavy does your plate, plate weigh? But I'm going to tear it so now it reads zero. And I will get half a gram of salt. That's 0.27. Oh, 
0 0.53, 0.5 grams. Perfect. And let me put that now into the beaker. And I think it's fairly important that we actually dissolve that and stir it in to make a solution, a, a uniform solution. And a better word is actually a homogeneous, a, a homogeneous solution. So there we go. What will be the new boiling point? Interesting. This is what we're going to find out. And what? Wave that around. Pop that in. I can actually get it going fast, can't I? I can really blast that up. Woohoo! <laughs> Doesn't take long, does it? Okay. When it once it is boiling, oh, 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 she's bumping. Whoa. Bumpy, bumpy, bumpy. Oi! Whoa. Wow. Okay. And that salt really changed how it sort of... Oh! Hang on. 99.8, 100 100.2, 100 100.5, 100 100.7, 100 100.8. We're going to turn the heat down a bit. 100.9. Interesting. Will it go to 101? Yes, it did. Okay, I, I'm going to call it. I'm going to say that the boiling point went... Well, I'm just going to say that the boiling point is 101 degrees. Okay, I'm not going to draw any conclusions yet. Way too early. Way too early. Let's get another half... A gram, shall we? Tear it with my spoon. Half a gram was about two spoons of salt. There's one spoon and slightly less of a spoon. Oh, 0.65. Mm. That was too much. 0.55. I'm going to take off just this smidgeny. There we go. 0.54. That's close enough. <gasps> close enough. That's not very scientific or accurate, is it? Now, why do I turn it off each time? Well, I don't want to evaporate the water. And because I did evaporate some water, I need to keep it at 10 mil. Okay, so that's important. That's a variable that we need to control each time. We need to make sure it's always at 10 mil because evaporation does occur when it's boiling and so we want to, we want to keep that variable, the amount of water, the same each time. Excellent. There. There. Let's go. Hey. Oh, it's bumping already. Bump, 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 bump. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. If this bumps off and falls out, I'm not going to keep going with this experiment. I can tell you that now. If I, <laughs> if this bumps off, that's it. <laughs> I'm going to just let it bump off. Get my tweezers out. Uh oh, uh oh, 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 get back, get back. Okay, so I'm warning you that if you bump off, I'm going to actually just do the graph with the results that I've got. All right, so we're at 96 degrees, 97, 98.9. I mean, it's boiling. Oh, but the temperature is going up. So I'll wait for the temperature to stabilize. Oh, I'm at 101.5. 
If it goes to 102, I'll just call it at that. Come on. Go up. 1.1 1. 1 degree. Come on, you can do it. Come on. Hey, 102. I'm going. I'm going to call it at 102 degrees Celsius. Ooh, I think I can start drawing a conclusion. What do you think? One gram. It's at 102. Okay. I'm going to make a prediction. A prediction. I predict that if I add another half a gram, the boiling point will become 103 degrees Celsius. What do you think? Is it too early to make such a prediction? Hmm. We will find out. Tear it. Get my half a gram of salt. Uh oh, that was way too much. I'm at 0.7. Take that off. 0.66. Come on. Got a little bit too. 0.57. Okay, I'm going to take the smallest amount off and call it, call it that. There we go. 0.5 grams. Close enough. In you go. And stirring it. I love an experiment like this. Getting some good quantitative data. Okay, we're actually, we're getting some numbers, some values. And we're using data logging with the temperature. We're carrying out a valid experiment. Uh, it's interesting. Well, I think it's interesting at least. You probably like but just boiling salty water. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm finding it interesting. That's all there is to it. You, you know, you might not be, but I'm finding this interesting. I, 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 I didn't know. Well, I couldn't remember that adding salt increases the boiling point. Does that make sense to me now? Now that I think about it, it does make sense to me. Woo! Boom! Oh! Come on. Get back. Get back. It does make sense to me because I'll tell you why it sort of makes sense to me. Because if the the boiling point of actually salt, salt actually has a boiling point all by itself. Like if you actually heat up salt, eventually it will melt. And if you heat up that molten salt, eventually it will boil. And molten salt's probably got a boiling point of like, I'm just guessing here, you can look it up, but I don't know. 2,000 degrees Celsius, really, really high. And so by adding more and more salt to this water, I'm actually getting closer and I'm getting some distance towards the boiling point of salt, which is much, much higher than 100 degrees Celsius. There we go, we're at 10 mil now. Do you think that's a fair and reasonable assumption? Sounds pretty good to me. Okay. If your hand's under here, just be careful that the thing doesn't fall off and... Okay, what are we at? 108? Ah, oh, it's not 108. 100.8, 101, 1.6. Now I'm just going to turn down the heat so that I'm not, like, measuring the heat of the actual flame. We're at 102.8. We're at 102.9. 103. Hey! 103.1. <laughs> oh no! It's gone back down to 103.0! I'm gonna back up to 103.3. Oh, there's some fluctuations. Woo! I'm going to call it 103. 103. Yay! Oh, I've almost had enough, you know. I'm, I'm gonna do one more. One more measurement, and then I think oh, I'm gonna call it. That's enough. That will be enough data. For it to be quite conclusive okay so i'm pretty sure you can keep going i don't mind you 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 keep going i'm just going to do one more 
one more um, what's one more trial okay I'm gonna do one more trial because I think I've got enough data to show a clear result or a clear to amp I, we can draw a conclusion to our aim based on the the data that we've got so far sometimes scientists finish their experiments early because the data is just so clear that they're like we don't actually need to do any more trials the results are in they might say hey the results are in there are well i think the results are in let's close that zip zip in you go stir have to dissolve that salt that's important but I can tell you that as, as it actually boils if I didn't dissolve it beforehand it would actually that salt would actually dissolve I'm convinced and sure about that okay Are we at 10 mil of water? No, I need a little bit more water. We've lost a bit. There we go. Back to 10 mil. Boom. Boy, she's really bumping. an unusual boiling there's just so much bumping it's not funny okay right 102 point5 103 103 point3 103.6 103.8 come on go to 104 103.9 come on 104.1 <laughs> okay that's it finished finito fantastic okay let's put this final Final result in, 104. So let's do this uh, graph together. What's the first thing that we need to do with a graph? And again, the result, the graph will be here as I uh, produce the graph, okay? So there we go. You can see the finished product, but watch how I build it up. Tr uh, the, um, what's it called? The title. Um, boiling point of saline solutions. Boiling point saline solutions. Okay, down the horizontal, that is the independent variable, the amount of salt, mass, salt, grams. And I went up to two grams, so I'm going to go up by 0.5. Start at zero and always label the lines not the spaces and then the boiling point that's the dependent var variable that goes on the y-axis boiling point degrees celsius now i'm not actually 99 percent of the time i start i start at zero in this case though i'm not actually going to start at ah uh, yes i am yes uh, i'm Am I? <laughs> 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Uh, I'm going <clears throat> Should I? Should I? Should I not? Um, I'm going to go up by 20s. 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, Okay, so no sugar, uh, no salt, it was 100.5, which is just there. 0.5, it was 101. 102. It's a very small increase. Now, that's actually going to be quite linear. That's actually going to be a linear increase, and so I should put a ruler on it, okay? So I'm looking around to see what I can use for a ruler because I don't have one here. I might use, I might use the edge of this, um, 
<laughs> heat proof mat okay so there we go it's nice and straight and whoop, there we go who, who knew you could use and so as you can see as you can see as the a mass of the salt or the concentration of the saline solution goes up the boiling point goes up and we can actually draw our line past that and actually extrapolate from those results and that means to actually um, sort of predict uh, what boiling points will be with different uh, masses that we haven't actually done the experiment for but I'm quite confident about that anyway you could actually now go on and repeat this experiment using sugar and actually see whether um, sugar has a similar effect or no effect or different effect. Who knows? Well, you will know if you do the experiment. So anyway, thanks for joining me today. Um, it's been a pleasure doing science with you once again. And I look forward to seeing you in the next lesson. Bye for now. Hey everyone, uh, welcome to our chemistry lesson on pure substances and mixtures. Now we're in a great place to be talking about um, pure substances and mixtures now because over you know all these lessons that we've just had, we've actually come across so many of them that we've actually got some good experience um, <laughs> to be able to talk about them. So a pure substance is a substance that can't be like broken down physically into simpler substances. Okay, so a pure substance can't be broken down by physical means. And the physical means that sort of I'm talking about are things like the evaporation, decanting, um, whatever, filtration, chromatography, centrifugation, distillation, yeah? So what are some pure substances? Well, elements. Elements which are combined of the, are combined, elements are made up of the one type of atom. So in our sets, what could be an element? Well, I'll give you a hint. The tripod is actually made up of two different elements. All right. Uh, the main element that it's made up of is iron. And the nails are iron and the triangle is made out of iron. And iron is a metal. Now, these have also then been coated with zinc. And zinc is a metal and zinc is made up of the one type of atom. Um, any other elements in here that are metals? Yes. <laughs> so we've also got aluminium. Aluminium is a metal. Now it's a very lightweight um, metal and it's actually fairly soft, but it's actually fairly, um, it's got it's got some strength to it, so um, it's actually a very good metal for like making windows and cars and aircraft components and that sort of stuff. So iron, zinc, aluminium, and th this is steel, so it's iron with some carbon, so I don't want to call it a element because it's actually a mixture. Are there any other elements in here that are metallic? And I believe the spoon, I think the spoon could be coated in tin. I'm not 100% sure, but tin is actually a metallic element. Any other metallic elements? Hmm, thinking, thinking, looking, looking. Uh, I don't think so. So, although... We haven't got any other metallic elements. I do just want to point out that sodium chloride is made up of um, sodium and chlorine bonded together. And sodium, sodium is a metallic element. Now, table salt doesn't look anything like sodium metal. It doesn't have any of the same properties, but originally it is made up of the same um, atoms from sodium uh, that sodium metal is made up. So we can jot sodium down as well. Um, anything else that I can think of for now? Oh, what, 
No, I won't. No. Copper? Ooh, since I did mention um, sodium chloride, copper oxide, copper oxide, which is a black powder, although that's a compound, um, copper itself, the metal copper, is a metallic element. So we could write down copper. Okay, we could write down copper. That's cheating just a little tiny bit. Um, but while we're cheating just a little bit, we could actually say that stainless steel contains some vanadium. Vanadium and vanadium is an element. And chromium. Chromium is a metallic element as well. Anyway, that's a whole bunch. That's a whole bunch of metallic elements. Elements which are metals um, and elements are made up of the only one, only one type of atom. And you find them on the periodic table because there's about 126 naturally occurring elements from which everything is made. Now, what about non-metallic elements? Non-metallic elements. Ah, <sighs> so, well, classic ones, classic non-metallic elements are oxygen. And we've mentioned oxygen, I've mentioned oxygen quite a few times throughout this course. Now, oxygen's a clear colourless gas that makes up about 20% of the atmosphere. Um, and that should give you a hint to another um, non-metallic element or a non-metal element. And that is which gas makes up about 77% of the atmosphere. Now, don't say carbon dioxide. Say nitrogen. Nitrogen makes up about um, 77% of the atmosphere. Um, okay, so there are two elements that we've got around us in this room that are non-metallic. Um, what else do we have? Well, matches. I believe the red, the red part of the match, the red part of the match here, the redhead, is phosphorus. Okay, phosphorus. And so phosphorus is a uh, non-metallic element. So there we go, that's three. And now I'm going to have to cheat just a little bit. And so we've used a lot of water, and water contains, well, the formula for water is H2O, which is hydrogen and oxygen. Now, hydrogen by itself is a non-metallic element and oxygen by itself is a non-metallic element. And we've already mentioned oxygen, so hydrogen. Which brings me to copper sulfate, because copper sulfate is a compound that contains copper and sulfur. Okay, so sulfur is a non-metallic element, and, well, sulfate is sulfur and oxygen. We've already mentioned oxygen. <gasps> ah, I can, I can see a non-metallic element. The black part of a match that's been burnt. Carbon. Hey, <laughs> that's not cheating. Carbon is a non-metallic element. All right. Now, um, metalloids. Metalloids are elements that are, they're neither non-metallic and they're not metals. They're sort of in between. Now, I don't have any examples here, um, but the absolute classic ones are silicon and germanium. And they're actually used in computer chips because they've got properties that um, sometimes, uh, sometimes they conduct electricity under only certain properties. So they're, they're pretty similar to a metal, but not quite, not quite there. And then the other type of pure substance that can't be uh, broken down by physical means is compounds. Compounds. And we've got a lot of compounds. And so let's... Let's quickly go through the compounds. Water. Water is a compound, H2O. Okay. For every molecule of water, it's got two atoms of hydrogen bonded to one atom of oxygen. And when they bond together, they form this new substance called water. And it doesn't have the properties of hydrogen or oxygen. It's got its own unique properties, but H2O. And wherever you go in the world, water, pure water, is always H2O. Sodium chloride okay, is a compound, sodium chloride, composed of sodium atoms and chloride, chlorine atoms joined together to form a new substance, sodium chloride. It's got, it's got totally different properties, chemical and physical properties to sodium and chlorine. It's a new substance, it's a pure substance, it's a compound, it's sodium chloride. Now, what else do we have? Ah, butane. 
butane, C, um, C4H, I've got to get this right, <laughs> um, 10, C4H10. So it's four carbon atoms surrounded by, um, oh, I hope I'm right here, I'm probably, yeah, I think I'm right, 10 um, hydrogen atoms. And so it's a pure substance. In fact, this is so pure, it's ultra pure. Dun, 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 dun. It's nine times refined. So they really tried to get this as perfect butane as they possibly can get. Uh, another classic compound, I'm sure there's gonna copper oxide, copper oxide, CuO. Wherever you go in the world, copper oxide is CuO. That's one atom of copper and one atom of oxygen. Uh, well, it's the the substance is in that ratio anyway. So there'll be you know trillions of copper atoms and trillions of oxygen atoms, but they'll be like copper oxygen, copper oxide, and they're bonded together, chemically bonded together. You can't break them apart with physical means, and so that's why they're a pure substance. And again, that doesn't have the same properties as copper or oxygen. It's got its own unique properties. And here's another one. What's this one? This is the clear, transparent one. Sodium carbonate decahydrate. Sodium carbonate decahydrate, which also reminds me that sodium bicarbonate or bicarb of soda is a compound as well. So many compounds. In fact, glass, silicon dioxide, silicon dioxide. So we're not, we are not short. <laughs> we are not short of compounds in this equipment. Um, even the 3D printed um, pieces, they're made from a compound as well, a type of plastic. So that's enough, that's enough um, compounds. Now what about impure substances, okay? Impure substances, um, otherwise known as mixtures. Now, there's two types of mixtures. There's what's called a homogeneous mix, and a heterogeneous mix. Now, a homogeneous mix is a mixture that is of similar composition throughout. So if I make some salty water, okay, and we've made lots of salty water this, um, this session. Salty water is a mixture. It can be separated by physical means. Salty water can be separated by evaporation. Yeah, so it's a homogeneous mixture because it's the same throughout. When we made copper sulfate solution, when we dissolve copper sulfate in water, we got a homogeneous mixture called a solution, okay, which can be separated by evaporation, but it's a homogeneous um, mixture. What else is a homogeneous mixture? Ah, stainless steel. Stainless steel is a homogeneous mixture. The, the iron and the chromium and the vanadium are mixed together, okay, to form what's called an alloy, an alloy of metals. Uh, an alloy is a number of different metals bonded together. They're not chemically bonded together, so they're not a compound, okay, they're not a compound, they're not a new compound. It is a mixture, but it's a homogeneous mixture. And the, the rod, okay, stainless steel rod, again, that's iron and chromium and vanadium, mixed together in the molten form and then it hardens, but it's an alloy, it's a mixture. What else could be considered? Ah, a homogeneous mixture. This clay ceramic, okay, the clay ceramic, that would be a homogeneous mixture. It's quite similar composition throughout. Uh, another homogeneous mixture, uh, I think, I think that's probably about it for homogeneous mixtures. But what about heterogeneous mixtures? Now, heterogeneous mixtures are not, uh, they're mixtures that are not similar throughout. So for example, wood. This, this um, our tables are made from bamboo, and I can see different um, shades throughout the, the wood. It's, it's, it's heterogeneous, it's, it's uh, not similar, it's not a constant composition, it's not a uniform composition. Um, and so it's a heterogeneous mixture. The iron powder, the iron powder, uh, sand, um, iron, and sodium chloride. You know, I can see little bits of sand and bits of salt and bits of iron. This is a heterogeneous mixture. Man, oh, look at this. I found some magnesium. <laughs> magnesium is not a heterogeneous mixture. Magnesium is an element 
and it's a metallic element. So, yeah, don't add that to the heterogeneous list. What's this one? Manganese dioxide? No, that's a that's a um, uh, compound, of course. Um, oh, where else is a het? Oh, I'm a heterogeneous mixture. Okay, I've got two eyes up here and two toes down there and two arms in the middle. You know, um, I'm not a uniform uh, mixture. I am a mixture. Um, <laughs> I'm definitely not a hom homogeneous mixture. Uh, I'm a if I was Iceman, yeah, maybe then I'd be a homogeneous mix, but I'm not Iceman, I'm a heterogeneous mixture. Um, I think that might be... Oh, I remember the the clay the clay mixture that I had to stir for the um, centrifugation. A clay mixture of different levels and stuff. That is a heterogeneous mixture as well. Anyway, so that's pure substances and mixtures. And now you've got a really good idea of what a pure substance is, what a mixture is, what an element is, what are examples of metals, examples of non-metals, example of metalloids, um, what a mixture is, a homogeneous mixture, and heterogeneous mixtures. Okay, well, <laughs> what a big lesson of learning. I'll look forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye for now. Hey everybody, uh, welcome to this lesson on density and do I have something interesting to show you. So first, I'm going to get a beaker with 10 mil of water in it. 10 mil of water. And then I'm going to get a beaker and I'm going to put 10 mil of mercury into it. Now mercury is a element, it's a metallic element, and, oh, might come out there, so I'll take off the lid, and I'm going to try and get 10 mil of mercury into this beaker. So, let's see how we go. Whoop, whoop, there it comes, there it comes, here. Yep, is that 10 mil? No, I need a little bit more. It's a it's a silvery uh, liquid. There we go. There's only two liquid elements at room temperature. Mercury is one of them, and bromine is the other. There we go. Ten mil of mercury, and <laughs> um, water. Let me just put the lid on because um, you don't want to. You don't want to spill mercury, that's for sure. It's a bit of a disaster if you spill it. Um, water has got a meniscus like this, a concave, but mercury has actually got a convex, um, convex meniscus. That's not what was so exciting. What was so exciting was, I'm going to weigh them. Okay, I'm going to weigh them. All right, so I'm going to turn it on. I'm going to get my phone to film this so that you can actually see this in real life yourself, okay? Because otherwise you might not believe me. So let me get a little video happening here and I'm going to press play and I'm going to get the water and I'll put the water on and look at that. 10 mil of water is about 16.93 grams. That's about 10 grams for the water and 6.93 grams for the beaker. Now, what about the mercury? What do you think its mass is going to be? Are you ready? What do you think it might be? Oh, here goes. The mass is 131 grams. <laughs> that, makes, that makes mercury about 125 grams for 10 mil or 12.5. 5 grams, 12.5 grams for 1 mil. That's right. Mercury is actually 12 and a half times more dense than water. Like this is heavy. This is really heavy. Mercury is a very, very dense liquid. Well, <laughs> so oh, I'm not going to put it back into this container. I'm going to put the mercury back into its container here. 
and I will pour it. Whoop! And give it a bit of a shake. And I'll wipe that down later on. But basically, that beaker is now dry. Okay, and I'll close the lid on that and be very, very careful. I'm so careful with it because if you drop it, it breaks out into a billion tiny little particles and then it slowly vaporizes and fills the room with merc mercury vapor, which is very toxic. It's a heavy metal and when you breathe it in, it, end up, it ends up going to your brain and causing um, brain damage. So not nice to play around with. Now mercury is very dense, but woo, <laughs> this head is not very dense. Um, it's very light for its size. So density has got to do with two things, an object's size and its mass. And the more matter that is packed into a certain size, the denser a substance is. And so to determine density, you need to know an object's mass and you need to know an object's volume. So we're actually going to work out what the density of this piece of plasticine is. So I'm going to um, just sort of like use this ruler to form it into like a cube, or attempt to form it into a cube. So I'm sort of like squeezing down the sides and making it flat and that sort of stuff. So I want to get it as cubic as possible. All right, because the volume of a cube is the length times the breadth times the height. And so, now I can measure the length times the breadth times the height, but because it's a cube, those three values should be quite similar. And so it's about, what's that, 1.4, 1.4, 1.4, okay. And so how many a centimeter cubed is it? Let me get my calculator out. It's 1.4 times 1.4 times 1.4 is equal to 2.7, 2.7. So the volume is 2.7 centimeters cubed. Now the mass, the mass of it, I can find out the mass using my scales, of course. The mass is 3.2, 3.2. And so the density equals the mass over the volume which is 3.2 divided by 2.7 gives me 1.19. So about 1.2, about 1.2 grams per centimeter cubed. Whereas mercury was about 12 and a half grams per centimeter cubed. So this is about 10 times, the plasticine is about 10 times less dense than mercury. Now, what about something that you can't really measure the volume of. Now volume is how much space something takes up. That's what volume is. It's how much space something takes up. And there is a there is a good way to work out an object's volume if you can't like measure it. So let me show you. And I've got to double check something. And oh okay. This will just be okay. You need to get like a uh, like this is a, a screw, you could use a nail, but it's got to be a little bit shorter than the um, than the top, the top of that, that measurement there, the top of that five. And so I'm going to get a piece of string, okay? And let me get this string and I'm going to tie it to the screw. So I'll tie it to the bottom of the... <laughs> and let's tie him off. Absolutely perfect. And are you good at tying knots? I know I'm not particularly great at tying knots, but. That should be fairly straightforward. Okay, so what can we do to find the volume? We're going to find the volume by a process called, um, what's it called? Displacement. So if I put 
Mm, I'm going to put three mil of water now. Come down low to avoid parallax error. And measure to the bottom of the meniscus. Perfect. So it's at three mil at the moment. Now, I'll just put a drop of food colouring in that water so that you can see it. One drop. Zip. And now you can definitely see the water. And now, I'm going to put this screw in and let's see what happens to the height of that liquid. Oh, see how the height of the liquid goes up? Like that. In fact, in fact, I actually need to, I need the water to actually cover the whole screw. So I'm actually going to go to four mil, okay? For this to work, I actually have to, you have to make sure that the item that you submerge is fully covered. All right. So that's very, very close. And so if I go to 4.2, and pop that in. Excellent. That's now gone up to. Ooh, that's now gone up to five. And so that means it's gone from 4.2 to 5 mil. And so it's got a volume of 0 0.8 mil. Okay, so this nail, or it's a screw, okay, it's got a volume of 0 0.8 and it's got a mass of, let's work out what the mass is. It's got a mass of five grams. So density equals mass, five over volume, which is 0 0.8, which is equal to, get the calculator out, five divided by 0 0.8 equals 6.25. 6.25 grams per centimetre cube. So it's way more dense than water. Um, and that's one reason why it actually sinks in water. Now, what about a sinker? Okay, well, this is a sinker. And do you know what a sinker is made out of? A sinker is made out of lead. And uh, lead is actually a fairly dense uh, metal. Um, you can actually find lead in car batteries. 12 volt car batteries, although you should never pull part car battery because not only do they contain lead, which is toxic, they also contain acid, which is actually quite dangerous as well. So yeah, car batteries are not, not good to um, pull apart. Uh, I actually, um, not anymore, but I used to collect um, scrap metal and, re and get paid to recycle it. And car batteries are always a good find because the lead in them was actually worth a reasonable amount and usually you get about six or seven dollars from the recycler for a car battery which doesn't sound like a lot but then you you know you'd sometimes turn up with five car batteries and a whole heap of other stuff and look sometimes I've turned up to the scrap metal place with copper and aluminium and batteries and iron and I've actually been paid like four hundred dollars so yeah then then it starts adding up, doesn't it? So it's good to be able to recycle and it's even better when you get paid for it. <laughs> so uh, what is the mass of this sinker? Let's put it on the scales. The mass of this sinker, which is made out of, do you remember what I caught, said? Lead, pop it on. And 10.7 grams, 10.7 grams. And the volume is now, let me bring this back down to 4 mil. Okay, bring it down to 4 mil. And pop him in. That's gone up to 5 mil. So that's actually got a volume of 1. A volume of 1. 
and therefore the mass 10.7 over the volume 1 it's got a density of 10.7 grams per centimeter cube so it's more dense than the screw and about well according to this way more dense than um, water and speaking of water speaking of water we can find the density of water quite straightforward as well what I'll do is I'll tip out tip out the uh, measuring cylinder I'll pop it on pop it onto the scales and then I'll tear it so it reads zero and so let's get one mil of water in here okay one mil of water using the Okay, that's one mil of water. And one mil of water has got a mass of one gram. And so the density of water is one gram per centimeter cubed. No surprises there either. What about, what about oil? Now, putting oil into your glassware is not a great idea. I'll just tell you now, maybe, maybe don't you put, don't, you don't put oil into it it's a it's not very nice oil it's hard to it's hard to clean off so just maybe maybe trust me on this one and just let me do it as a demonstration because it's not good to um, get oil into your equipment i'm doing it for science all right so i'm doing it for you oh that was too much whoa let me Squeeze that one up. Back. Now I have to like try and withdraw it. Alright. Yep. One mil. And um, it's got a, gra a mass of 0 0.9 and a volume of 1. And so. Um, 0.9 divided by 1 is 0 0.9 gram. Its density is less than water. Its density is less than water. So what that means is this. Oh, you know what? I might do something that's very interesting. Okay. So it'd be a bit hard for me to clean up later, but I'll work out how to do it. So I'm doing this for you. All right, I'm not doing this for me because I know what this looks like. If I put some mercury here, you can see the mercury there in the beaker. Do you know what I'm going to add now? I'm going to add the water. Okay, so I'm going to add some water to it. What do you think will happen if I add the water to it? Woo! Look at this. Look at that. Hey, isn't that interesting? The water is less dense than the mercury, and so the water sits on the top. Now, what about the oil? What about the oil? Let's pour oil on. I'll get a bit more so that you can see it well. And let's add some oil bit more. I don't, I'm not too sure how I'm going to clean this up. I'll give it some thought. Maybe I won't clean it up. Maybe I'll just like store it. Anyway, look at that. Can you see the, the silver, the blue, and then the yellow oil on top? So in terms of density, okay, in terms of density, um, the layers, the most dense is at the bottom, then the next density, next dense and then and if I go like that and have a zoom in on it okay yeah how interesting is that hey right? <laughs> very very good and then an empty glass chemical bottle well you can actually work out the density of an empty glass chemical bottle yourself um, but one of my favorite scientific stories is how did a um, uh, it, his name's Archimedes. Now, I think he's Greek. I think he's Greek. He's like a Greek scientist. 
um, in the old, in the really, really olden days where they wore like white robes and talked around, sat around talking about, you know, philosophy and about uh, interesting things. And anyway, uh, the king at the time had um, asked a, a jeweler to make his crown and the king gave the jeweler um, a certain amount of gold to make this crown. And the jeweler made the crown, but when the king got it, it was a beautiful crown, but it didn't feel right. Um, the king sort of thought, mm, it's a bit, li bit lightweight. Um, and he, had, he thought maybe somehow the, the jeweler hadn't used up all the gold and maybe had put something inside the crown. But the king didn't want to destroy the crown. And so, you know, he could have like melted the crown down and, and weighed it and got the volume of it and found the density and found out that it was different to the density of the gold. But he didn't want to destroy the crown and so wasn't sure how to determine the volume. And it was Archimedes. It was Archimedes who found the way. And you need to do a little bit of research to find out how Archimedes um, found the gold and what led him to run down the street naked calling, Eureka! Anyway, that's a good story. <laughs> Man, hopefully you read a bit about it. All right, I look forward to seeing you again soon. Um, bye for now. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm a bit sad because we've reached the final lesson in our chemistry course. I really, really hope that you've been um, enjoying it, that you've enjoyed the equipment, that you've been learning lots, and I hope that you're a little bit sad that you've reached the end of it as well. But it's been quite a journey, hasn't it? We've been doing a lot of science together. And so congratulations on reaching it this far. And uh, let's finish with like a, a birthday candle and um, looking at the density of carbon dioxide gas. So um, I've got a birthday candle here. What else will you need today? Some uh, vinegar, a little bit of bicarb soda uh, or to do it. And so um, let's, let's maybe get out this beaker here. Okay, this beaker here, and it needs to be dry. Okay, it needs to be dry for this to work. And, um, well, you know what? You know what might even work a bit better? Um, what might work better is actually the mortar and pestle. So I'm actually gonna dry the mortar and pestle, not the mortar and pestle, just the mortar. So I'm gonna make sure that that's as dry as I can get it. And then, I actually want the candle sitting inside it. I sort of need a knife. That's what I need, I need a knife. Uh, I wonder if I can use this ruler. Not a good idea to cut on the wooden table because the wooden table is a bit soft. Oh no, that wasn't, oh. Okay, I can see what's happening here. I can actually break the candle off from the top. Actually, I only want a short little candle like that. And I actually want to try and put it into the um, mortar. So let's see if I can do this. Whoop. And let's get the candle, this candle here. Whoop. Blow that out. And what about if, whoop, ah! I'm trying to drip a little bit of wax in the bottom of that mortar. That's what I'm trying to do. Maybe I need to do it with the match burning. So I'll go, is it a good idea to drip wax into your mortar? Hmm, maybe, maybe not. Will it come off? I'm sure it will. I hope it will. If you're not too sure, and then I'm actually going to light this wick. And I do want the wick to burn down. I don't want the wick really high like this. Looks ridiculous, that wick up there like that. <laughs> that looks like a candle out of a Dr. Seuss book, don't you think? Yeah. Um, anyway, it will, it will burn down fairly quickly. And while it's burning down, I'm going to get some vinegar like this. I'm going to get the vinegar and put it into this beaker, well, that's probably a bit much, okay? Don't need that much. 
might might pour that out. All right, because we're going to make some carbon dioxide gas, and I want to see if I can pour the carbon dioxide gas into into that mortar. So where am I going to put my? There we go. That's happening now. This is what I want to see. Oh, actually, I quite like these little lumps that have come out. And I need the candle to burn down a little bit. Okay, I sort of want... I want the height of the flame to be lower than the top of that um, mortar. Okay? And so the candle is burning down. Now... Did you see how the wick just sort of like fully burnt? Some people think a, a candle, that the wax is there to support the wick, and that's the wick that burns really, really slowly. Well, they're wrong. The um, wick is there to actually um, absorb the hot wax, turn the hot wax into gas, and then it's actually the gaseous wax that burns. That's why it takes so long for a candle to burn. It's not because it takes a long time for the wick to burn. It takes a long time for the, the wax to burn. The wax itself is actually the fuel. Okay, the wax is the fuel, not the wick. Okay, not the wick. Oh, now we're getting, getting a bit closer. So I'm going to make some carbon dioxide gas by dropping a lump of um, bicarb soda into this beaker. Now I'm getting some bubbles. I don't want it really to bubble over. I'm actually going to just pour an invisible gas into there. Let's pour an invisible gas. I might boot it up a bit with a bit more vinegar. What do you think? Woo! Uh oh, that's not what I wanted because I want to pour the invisible gas. Oh, I can see the flame. Oop, flame flickering. Will that candle go out? Hmm. It's not working as well as I hoped, to be honest. So. Am I having success? No, I think maybe what I need is a larger glass a larger glass so i well not a glass but i've i've worked out a way i can do this <laughs> i'm going to get my water bottle now don't put anything but water in your water i'm maybe you can use a glass or something this is going to work here we go pop this in pop this in And the invisible gas just put out the candle. And just like the invisible gas just finished this course. <laughs> so that's it. Carbon dioxide is more dense than the air surrounding. And uh, we've just shown that by being able to pour the carbon dioxide gas into the candle, which then smothers the flame and stops it from getting oxygen. So thank you so much for doing this course with me. I really and sincerely hope that you've had a, a great learning experience. And um, now I'll get stuck into, if I haven't done it already, I don't know when you're doing this course, but hopefully I can do a year eight, a year nine, and a year 10 course, and then even a year 11 and 12 chemistry course. So we've got a long path ahead of us. Um, and I hope that you'll join me on this or continue on this journey with me. All right, bye for now. And I'm sure I'll see you again sometime in the future. Bye-bye.